Oh, I better put a row. Okay. Ah, after an attack, Dax. Get Εντάξει, πιστεύω θα κοιτάω εκεί. Για το μεγάλο πρόβλημα, δεν ξέρω αν το έχεις ακόμα, είναι η πρεσβειοποία. Η οποία, άμα θέλει να κοιτάξει κάτι κοντά, δεν σε αφήνει. Mm. Περιμένουμε κανένα δύο λεπτά ακόμα, Λία, όπως έρθει κάποιος και αρχίζουν. Mm. Να, ναι. Το μικρόφωνο, άμα θέλεις, είναι εκεί. Ε, λείπουν 6-7, οπότε, να. όχι τους μέτρησα, είναι 2-3-4-5-6-7-8-9-10-11-12-13-14-15-16-17-18-19-20-21-22-23-7 λείπουν. Στο 3, 24, 6, ναι. Α, α, σε πέντε λεπτά θα Τι πάνε, τι πάει καμιά φορά, μην χτυπήσει εδώ μέσα. Κάτι να το ξέρει, αλλά η θέκλα, ας πούμε, για παράδειγμα, παίρνει ότι ώρα να η γραμματέα σε ψηλή αυτή και αυτή όταν έχει κάτι θέλει, βέβαια, γιατί... Αλλά είναι δυνατό. Αλλά, ναι, θα περιμένει μέχρι να τελειώσει, ναι, να το βάλω στη θέση. Oh, να κατεβάσουμε και αυτό. Να, να το πεις να έρθει να κατεβάσει το story για να είμαστε πιο... Α, το καταξέζεις εσύ, εντάξει. Μόλι τελειώσω, θα έρθω μέσα. Να. 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 Να.
Εδώ. Κοιτάξτε να σημαίνω αυτό που με εκνευρίζει τρομερά είναι η πρεσβειοποία. Είναι να, να διαλύει, λέει. Yes, can you hear me? Welcome everybody, and particularly the brave ones who managed to get out of their beds, rolled to here, but the reason the theory and the structure of galactic disk. Thank you, Please. thank you. So welcome to the morning session. I hope you are sober. <laughs> you didn't have so much wine yesterday, so I guess those that are missing are those that they had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, uh, I hope they will join later. Let's start. Uh, you see the title, Orbital Theory and the Structure of uh, Galactic Disks. So the talk is about how uh, we associate uh, the observed morphologies with the stars that move, with the gas that flows, and how this combined can give uh, the morphological features on the sky. So, okay. Uh, actually, I'm speaking not about all kinds of uh, galaxies. I will speak about the grand design so that we have a clear picture that we try to understand. And then if we succeed, which is not that easy, then we can also think about how more complicated structures appear when in time, etc. And I give here some examples. To the left, you see a galaxy in the southern sky, a famous one since it was the galaxy in the cover of the Book of Fubine, and you recognize it, uh, which uh, has not, a, well, not a strong bar. Maybe it has an oval distortion that could be apparent in the 90s when the near infrared detectors uh, became possible and then uh, it appeared that uh, somewhere here in the middle there is something that you can call oval distortion but not it's, it's not a real bar like in the next case of uh, NGC 9086 whatever which has all the features the bar you can see the dust lanes here and the spirals that follow here it's in the optical all the time and here is in the near infrared. I want to do a particular mention to the third case because it is, uh, if you look in the atlases, etc., it is uh, classified as multi arm or flocculent. Already, this image here is in the near infrared. Things are a bit clearer, but we need to see the spiral we will try to model. And uh, the two basic uh, algorithms that we apply on the image is first of all to rectify the image, to project it, to have it face on, and then you divide by the axisymmetric background. 
that you calculate. You have the exponential disk. And then what appears is what you see here. And then here you do not have any sign of a bar, but you have a, a spiral, bisymmetric grand design. And uh, as in this case, all these grand design galaxies are very close to logarithmic spirals. They have this, uh, this property. OK, there are deviations, but it's a good approximation to see that these spirals are uh, logarithmic. And uh, the pitch angle is the key feature to characterize one of the key features. The key feature is certainly the pattern speed, but uh, uh, it is a, a very important uh, property uh, to understand the dynamics. As I will uh, uh, claim later, uh, in some transparencies later, it is, uh, there are, as I understand it, three kinds of dynamics. Very tightly wound spirals have their own system of rotation, of uh, resonances, etc. Then the more open, which are the most popular ones, we find them in books, etc. And then there are the barred spirals. So we have pitch angles less than five degrees, one, two degrees, SA galaxy in the Hubble uh, sequence. Then we have the SB, SC galaxies. We find them and they have uh, the more open of, the most open of them are around 30 degrees, 14 very uh, particular cases. And then we do not have any between, then we go to 90 degrees, which is the bar. So remember how this could be connected to the dynamics. This is, however, something that holds quite well for a physical object characterizes. They are logarithmic. It is not uh, evident immediately, but after a, a very simple image processing, these logarithmic spirals are revealed in the grand design. OK, uh, I will go, well, I have transparencies that will go fast. You know the, the, the point, uh, the key problem for understanding the uh, dynamics of the spirals is the winding dilemma. If uh, you uh, assume that uh, the stars of the, uh, of the, on the spirals remain the same all the time, then this does not uh, give much because after a uh, short for cosmological scales time, they wind up, but we find in the sky all kinds of pitch angles. So something else has to be there. And the idea that came in the 60s, 70s, with the density wave theory of Lean, et cetera, was, uh, as I said, the density wave. So the stars, let's say, remain. They move around the center of the galaxy, but they remain most of the time on the spiral region. And this is what it uh, that reinforces the pattern. So OK, here I have a famous uh, sketch by Kalnas that shows uh, here, uh, these are not really calculated orbits, a sketch, but this gives the idea if uh, these uh, ellipses are aligned and they have a common major axis, then you have the bar. If they start precessing, then you get uh, the spiral. So, uh, okay, here are recipes about how to, to build that. Uh, you can uh, make spiral waves if you want it to rotate the major axis according to the rule that we have uh, there, and there you have the spirals. And uh, sometimes you find it in the literature, I may use this term as a precess in ellipsis flow. It's not uh, maybe that uh, precise, but it's something that you can understand in terms of precess in ellipsis that you see in sketches like that. Okay. Uh, okay, and that's why there will be a systematic inward velocity as a density maximum of the arm. This inward is something that depends on the, uh, well, we're going to discuss about that. Okay, so here is an example about how, in terms of orbits, one can understand a density wave. Okay, uh, 
this blue particle has a period in this particular model that it is close to the period of the sun around the center of the galaxy, and you see how it goes. So you have equal time steps, so it goes fast in the interarm region. When it goes uh, in the arm region, it decelerates, and you can obviously see that it remains close to the arms for a longer time. So if you do that with all these orbs that you see, and you remove them and you see, find a density map, then you will see the spiral. Okay, this is the notion of the density wave in terms of the, uh, of the idea of the density wave theory, which however, I will repeat it several times, does not apply in very open spirals because it's a linear theory. And then if you have open spirals, then nonlinearity is there and then it is another realm. So, okay. Let's try to simplify things. Uh, let's consider that uh, the galaxies can be described as uh, Hamiltonian systems, okay? Uh, just uh, for helping us understand the basics and then we see, and here it is one case. Well, here in this case is in polar coordinates. It is not the uh, favor coordinate system uh, for calculating orbits, but uh, I will show you here is a Hamiltonian. And of course the key factor is this here that uh, tells us that we calculate in a rotating frame of reference. Uh, okay, let's have them also in, uh, polar, in uh, Cartesian coordinates if you want. And this is exactly the effective potential that uh, uh, since we're in the rotating frame, we take uh, care about non-inertial forces. And this is the effect potential. And as I have written it there in this uh, uh, autonomous Hamiltonian form formalism, uh, the, Jacobi uh, the Jacobian is an integral, uh, the analog of the energy in the rotating frame. That's why, uh, vaguely speaking, we can say the energy if we are in the rotating frame, of course, we mean the Jacobi constant. Okay, so uh, for us, what it is uh, the uh, interesting parameter are the potentials. And the potentials can be considered as uh, uh, perturbations to an axisymmetric background. The, uh, the axisymmetric potential, of course, has uh, it's uh, the main component and uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, is coming as the perturbation, phi one, as I have it there, it is something smaller. And especially for non barred galaxies, this is considerably smaller. Okay, and so what could, let's consider a little bit the axisymmetric case so that we can, can give some definitions and see how all these orbits are coming. Uh, are introduced in the system, the circular orbits can be very easily calculated from uh, uh, just uh, what you see here from this relation. So, uh, and uh, it is the main family of periodic orbits that consists the ba the backbone of the system and we will see uh, why it is so. Then always in the axisymmetric case, we have some other orbits that are not periodic uh, deviate a little bit from the circular orbits. You just displace the initial conditions, let's say from the initial conditions of the uh, periodic orbit. And then you have uh, small deviations that can be described by the epicyclic, epicyclic theory. We're gonna see there. And then we have the resonant orbits. We're gonna discuss this resonant orbits a lot later. So as regards the uh, axisymmetric part, if you have the rotation curve, exactly because uh, the square of the velocity divided by uh, the uh, distance from the center can be linked to the potential, then you can easily find uh, pot axisymmetric potentials. And this is something that we can measure. Here is a nice uh, plot that uh, it shows uh, how it is. You have seen, you have heard uh, the nice talk by Albert. And here it's also uh, uh, spectrum, uh, long slick spectrum from Calar Alto many years ago. It is for a galaxy NGC 50 to 48. It will come in the picture in some uh, inner transparency later. So you can, what I want to say is that you can have reliable guesses for the axisymmetric background, but then the point is 
what are we doing with uh, this term here? So we have bars, we have spirals, and we have cases where both bars and spirals coexist. So this will uh, hint, give us a hint of making assumptions. Okay, so, okay, this is just the transparency for understanding the epicyclic motion. So let's give some definitions. Uh, we can describe one of these orbits that are close to circular, like doing two kinds of motions. So one is around the center of the galaxy. We are always now, all what I'm saying here, as you have seen from the Hamiltonians, we are in 2D models on the equatorial plane of the galaxy. And simultaneously, as they rotate around the center of the galaxy, they perform also the radial oscillations. And this can be also uh, described uh, by having an epicycle in a guiding center that goes around the center of the galaxy. This is the epicyclic frequency. It is uh, an idea on which, let's say, a very a key idea in the density wave theory. I remember uh, a question I had once in, uh, it was not a, a pop, uh, for the broad public. It was, uh, I think, after my thesis, or it was for my thesis, I don't remember. But one question is, was, you know, many years ago, Ptolemy failed to explain the motion of all the planets around the sun with epicycles. So why are you so optimistic that this can explain the motion of the stars around the center of the galaxy? But okay, actually it is a primitive form of Fourier analysis that it is we're just analyzing two components. This is the epicyclic uh, theory. And here we have the resonances. I believe that uh, almost everybody here understands, knows this. Uh, uh, relations. So the most well, the, the one of the most important thing, of course, is the two to one, the Lindblad resonances, and then we're going to speak about uh, the fourth one uh, resonance very frequently during the talk. And you know that the most important, of course, of all of them is corrotation for reasons that have been mentioned in previous uh, uh, talks, and it's not here the time to repeat them. You know about angular momentum, etc. Okay, and what we have to to what I have to remind you is this one that we have, let's say, three cases with three different pattern speeds. And what should uh, uh, remain in your mind for the needs of the talk is that the slower a pattern, a bar, let's say, or a spiral, but the bar rotates, all these resonances, corrotations, and all the other resonances together are pushed away from the center of the galaxy. Also, the slower, the farther away is corrotation, and this takes with it all other resonances. As you can see here, for instance, here we are, the slowest, then the intermediate case. And here it's very nice uh, uh, because you have, in some cases, here's the one that corresponds to the inner the resonance in this particular model. You can see that in some cases, uh, it is very interesting because you can have more than one inner lead that resonance and sometimes more than two, but okay, it depends on the, on the model. Okay, let's go to the models because time passes by, and here is a general form, a bar potential. There are this uh, term that gives the amplitude is a, in general a function of the distance, and here this is that gives the several models we have, uh, and we can find in the literature some many years ago now, as I told you, in the middle 90s, we could have uh, near infrared observations, then we could trust them for dynamical models much more than the optical, because most of what we emit, uh, find there are K and M giants. The vast majority of uh, the stars in the galaxy carry the, uh, 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 it, they represent the most of the mass, and we have also other effects with dust, etc. It's much more reliable. So. Uh, in uh, several cases, uh, potentials could be written uh, in this general form where you can have an M equal two, four, six components. If you can, if you want, you can add also the odd terms, whatever. This kind of uh, potential are directly estimated from uh, near infrared observations, so they are more reliable. But actually, uh, the ma general mathematical formula is of A cosine to theta. Okay, okay. If we go to full potentials uh, that include also spirals, let's say forget for the timing the bar, then 
some uh, forms like that. This is the potential of, uh, that you see on the upper part of the transparency, which actually what they do here in the cosine two uh, theta term, they correct for this precession and then you have uh, the spiral pattern. So you can find in the literature several tries. And this is nice to have several uh, different uh, components as the potentials because in some cases you can understand if something is particular for a model you use, model dependent, or is a general property that you can find everywhere. Okay, and then it is of course the uh, Bart spiral case uh, where both of them exist. And I'm showing this one here for the left one of the three panels. And uh, uh, what uh, should one see is that uh, actually the bar dominates in these cases. It is uh, here the effective potential, sorry, the effective potential is very close to what you could see in a single bar potential. Okay, we're gonna see all this uh, stuff in detail and now, we move from, uh, as we move from the axisymmetric to the full potential, uh, we, in terms of orbits, we can say that what is the fate of the circular orbits? We had a family of periodic orbits, the family of circular orbits. Then if we go from phi zero to the full potential, then we have other families that are, uh, in which it is broken, let's say, in parts, and the most famous is X1. Okay, you can obviously see that reinforces a bar in the vertical axis, you know, the Y axis of, as I have it here. And then we have also the X2 family closer to the center associated with an inner little resonance. If we go beyond correlation, now still the family exists, but then uh, the shape reflects the shape of the, uh, of the outer lidal resonance. So we have things like what you see here. And then this, if you take into account such uh, orbits, then you can see that you can reinforce a, pa a pattern beyond the end of the bar. But we're gonna discuss a, a lot about exactly this case. Now I have the X1 prime, but X1 in parenthesis one is another very frequently uh, uh, not, notation of this part of the of the family. Okay, uh, here are this is a tool that helps us find the uh, interconnection between the families. Uh, if you can discern it, here we have this red uh, uh, line that goes all the way and then touches here the Lagrangian point, the stable Lagrangian point. This is uh, the uh, characteristic curve in the axisymmetric case. So as you can see here, let me uh, explain that. In this axis here, we have the energy and here we have the initial condition of the orbit. So each point of these curves corresponds to an orbit, to a periodic orbit of a family. The red one that I show you is the circular orbit in the axisymmetric potential. We introduce the full potential and then we get the, uh, the X1 family which is the child of the circular orbits at these energy levels. It goes somewhere up here, then it turns down, and then here we can see that uh, in an enlargement, it goes up to here, then continues downhills, and then it splits over there where we have another family, also a child of the circular orbits, the four to one family. And if we do that with all the kind of orbits we can find, we also see here that before it's in the fourth one, we have some other kind of families like branches bifurcating from the main one. That is, here are two, uh, two orbits uh, in each case, this one and that one have a tri each one of these two have a triangular shape is the three to one resonance. How all this is coming from, uh, where all this is coming from and how can we calculate this one? So uh, closer to car rotation, things can be uh, much more complicated. And uh, this is a very important result. You see something there that is a curly curves, et cetera, but this is an information that we will use for understanding the dynamics of the system. Okay, another thing that you have to have in mind is that, okay, you have a, a let's say two to one family, 
this uh, imagine the X1 orbits, and this exists in a range of energies. And in this range of energies, they exist also the, the resonances at a certain point. Then when a family passes through this uh, interval, then it changes its shape, and then it has a fingertip of the resonance that it is, it is crossing. Then at the three to one resonance, locally, the X1 or uh, family will have a triangular shape. When we reach the uh, four to one, it was a, will have four corners if you want. And uh, this is very important if we want to associate orbital shapes with morphological features. Okay. Uh, let's say a few words about normal spirals because usually we speak about bars. Uh, we have this uh, nice sketch of Kalnas that I have shown before. This is a sketch. If you go to a logarithm potential and then you try to find these orbits, to calculate the orbits, and to calculate orbits, it's the easiest thing. We have the equation of motions. Uh, we can do some guesses for the initial conditions and easily you can find also the periodic and of course any non-periodic orbit. Then uh, we came across this problem in the open spiral case. I underline that because in the next transparency you will see that things in other cases are different. So this uh, part here is similar to what you see until this point. And what happens in here is that we have to cross the four to one resonance in our way to corrotation. And then it was realized in 1986 already now, so many years, <laughs> 40 years almost ago, is the, uh, that here you have a problem to align the spirals of the central family nicely so that they reinforce the pattern to corrotation. And the point here is that you have at the point two families that there are of four to one uh, nature, four corners, but they are displaced by 90 degrees. So just from the morphology of the orbits, you have an obstacle to, in your way to corrotation. Uh, if we go to corrotation, another problem appears that we go to uh, a region where chaos dominates. And then we cannot find close to the periodic orbits. The periodic orbits are always there. There are nicely closed orbits, but remember, I will repeat it also many times, there are mathematical objects. Close by, you cannot find orbits that are resemble morphologically these periodic orbits. You have chaotic orbits, and then you have a problem to, to uh, go to from the corrotation, let's say from the L1 and L2 Lagrangian points farther out. Farther out, okay, you can have this kind of orbits, but what is uh, between the end of the bar, let's say it here and that point, what's gonna happen here? And altogether, uh, this, uh, if you have a, in mind uh, an open spiral, I underline open spiral, then you cannot think of ellipses, of elliptical orbits that reinforce a pattern nicely crossing corrotation and uh, just changing the sense of rotation in the rotating frame as they cross this resonance. This is not compatible with what, we, what it is found in orbits. In practice, if you see these nice figures that you find in the internet, etc., here already there is uh, in, such, a, such figures imply that we have not crossed corrotation. If we approach corrotation, then we have to start discussions if we can do that, in which cases, etc. cetera. Uh, okay. And, uh, okay, as I told you, uh, calculating orbits is something uh, very, that everybody can do. We have nicely behaving integrators, so we can find them everywhere. The other critical information is uh, the stability of these orbits. And this means that uh, practically, if they can attract easily material around them, or if you uh, 
go in all the available phase space by uh, applying a small deviation from the initial conditions. This is the key uh, notion behind stability. If you can stay close to the periodic orbit, or if, if you just step a little bit out, uh, outside of it, or if you can go in several uh, areas of the phase space. And this is a typical Poincare section. Certainly you have seen one. Oh, sorry. Uh, here is uh, in the center an X1 orbit. And if you are displaced to the initial condition over there, then you stay on this curve that is called an invariant curve and farther out and farther out. If you go to X2, you have a smaller stability island, as we say, but still uh, you have a range where you're going to stay there very close. Then there is X3 squeezed between the curve of zero velocity and the stability island of X2. Actually, uh, theoretically, if you uh, integrate for a little bit longer, then you will be able to visit all this area of scatter points. And uh, this is on a Poincare section what uh, uh, distinguishes a stable periodic orbit from an unstable periodic orbit. How important is this? Uh, so let's see what kind of orbits in terms of stability we have. We have always periodic and non-periodic orbits. Imagine, uh, let's say, the X1 family. This is a periodic orbit. It can be stable or unstable. A periodic orbit can be stable or, or unstable. The very uh, the, the, the mathematical object itself, it is a periodic, uh, a periodic orbit. It is uh, an ellipse, for instance, for the X1 family. Now, the non-periodic orbits can be either quasi-periodic, regular, like those that we have seen on the invariant curve, and can be also chaotic. Okay, both are non-periodic. So we have the initial condition of a periodic orbit, then we add a perturbation, like what we see here, and then we see Here's the displacement, when it will end up after a revolution, let's say several revolutions around the center of the galaxy, like in this case. And uh, an algorithm that is uh, used uh, all this year very frequently was proposed by Anon, you see, in 1965, and uh, half a century ago. And then uh, I have some transparencies from my Greek lectures. I will try just to sketch you the basic idea. So the displacement of the initial conditions of the blue periodic orbit, and then this can be, we have, we are in a two dimensional system, then you have uh, position and the velocity, right? Uh, we are, we say that we are in an autonomous Hamiltonian system, Hamiltonian is preserved, then we solve to find the third one of the four coordinates uh, that, uh, velocities, the two velocities and the two uh, positions. And then we can take also the Poincare section, let's say y equals zero. Then we can just describe these uh, initial conditions like a displacement on the Poincare section from one point to the other. And practically we can just write it uh, like uh, this, how it is uh, the nearby, the neighboring orbit related to the initial one, then we can expand in Taylor series and we keep orders uh, of uh, uh, the first order uh, terms. Then we have an, a system of linear equations and practically after that, you can come to me and you can have these transparencies, although it is in Greek, but the idea is what I'm uh, right now describing. Then you have practically uh, a transformation here over there, the final and the initial conditions. And here is the matrix of the transformation, the monodromy matrix, and that such a matrix from linear algebra, we know it can have, uh, it has uh, a characteristic equation. Now here it is just in terms of this uh, uh, roots of the characteristic uh, equation, we can define a known as defined an index that what tell us uh, is that, uh, let's say here, let's see the index is down here. Uh, if you follow the algebra behind, it is obvious that uh, the case where we have uh, uh, stability 
as I have it here, is when this uh, index is absolutely less than one, and if it's outside this range, then it is unstable. And this offers, uh, offers us another very important tool than the characteristic. You can see that here. To the left, it is the axisymmetric family, uh, the axisymmetric case, the circular family, and you see that we have something that uh, goes up and down between minus one and one, that means it is always stable, but sometimes it touches this axis. And at this point, these are the resonances. In the diagram I have shown you before of the axisymmetric case where we had the constant pattern speed that we could locate the, the location of the resonances on it, it was uh, exactly where this intersects, this curves, omega minus kappa half, we find the correlation, all that stuff. And you see that approaching correlation, we find more and more uh, touches with the upper, uh, with the equal one axis. There, that's why this is a tool, the stability diagram helps us to find the bifurcating families. And also the orbital theory tells us where it will be a pitchfork bifurcation or a tangent bifurcation, or all, all that stuff. But in order to go to the essential part, the essential information, which is the stability of the periodic orbits, we use this kind of tools. And as you have seen, the difference between the characteristics of the axisymmetric case and the case with the full potential, this is what happens in one of the many potentials when the full potential is introduced. Now, we have up and downs, but there are some uh, uh, notable differences, and there you can see, for instance, that the resonant family that is introduced in the three to one resonance, here we can find the bifurcating families. This is a pitch for bifurcation. Here we have a tangent bifurcation and so on. This is the tools we use to not only to find the orbits, but to get also the essential information, which is its stability. Okay. And, uh, I don't want to say more of that because we have to show many applications that will be also more interesting for you and your models. Uh, if we go very close to the unstable orbits, then we can find some uh, complicated but deterministic motion that uh, a test particles is doing in phase space. Don't confuse randomness with chaos. This is a deterministic motion, it is very complicated to be calculated. Poincaré was thinking that no one will ever calculate it. Now we can do that in a few <laughs> seconds. But by the time of Poincaré, he said that such a figure like the one we have in the uh, right-hand side wouldn't be uh, ever possible to be calculated. So this is a landscape. And now the first thing that one thinks is stability. If we can have stability, then we have something that supports chaos, and this is correct, of course. And this has explained many uh, morphological features. Let's come to our popular bars, for instance, the X1 family we have seen before. You can imagine, remember the elliptical shaped orbits. It was obvious that this one could uh, orbits that are trapped in the phase space in the neighborhood of these periodic orbits can reinforce a bar. For instance, this is the case. In some cases, it is associated also. You see that uh, it has loops here, and uh, this can be associated with, in some cases, with the answer of the bars we find, etc. So stability supports uh, structure, observed structure. Uh, and also, in some cases, uh, this can uh, resonances at the fourth one resonance can be can explain rings, like what you see here in an old paper we had with. Uh, Leah, and uh, in uh, it is not maybe this galaxy, I don't remember, but uh, we could find galaxies that they have this double character in the ring here. So this uh, rather horizontal and then this uh, feature like a corner. If you compare images with models, then you can find uh, similarities. You have to be always cautious not to overinterpret some things, but in some cases the comparison is straightforward. So, in general, what has to remain to, to remain your mind in that is that we have several, not only the bar, but several other features that are supported by stability. Uh, let's say, allow me to say a few words about normal, not bar galaxies, because this is also very interesting in several aspects. Uh, you remember the figure from the Contopoulos paper in back in 86, 
It was after that uh, several other papers in 88 and then my thesis, etc. And then we uh, have taken the better behaving potentials to study also the gaseous response and we have very good agreement. So just to show you how different can be uh, responses for the stars is very similar, responses of the same potential under different pattern speeds, this is the case. So we have a galaxy, we see that in this one, as well as many other cases, there is an inner symmetric part. There is always an inner bisymmetric part uh, with a, a grand design, of course, to, uh, with two arms. This, is the, this circle here indicates this uh, inner very symmetric part. Outside that, things change. And then here, these three models have three different assumptions. Here to the right, we say that this distance is the outer lunar resonance. Then here we say in the middle that it's correlation, and here is that is the fourth one resonance. And as in the 86 papers already, this also points to the slower rotating pattern, the fourth one for replicating the observed morphology. And this uh, one here, here is the better indicating the distance. Uh, and again, you see that here is an open spiral. Uh, the, uh, the other very important thing is the amplitude of the spiral. We could analyze um, images of uh, galaxies to see how much a, a good estimation for the amplitude would be. And it was consistent with orbital and gases model that in these cases, as soon as you have, let's say, a relative force perturbation with respect to axisymmetric background of the order of 5 to 10%, already the nonlinear effects that make the rectangular shaped orbits are present. And uh, there, this is consistent with what we were finding in, uh, an, by analyzing images of galaxies. So, okay, uh, we had some uh, response models by that time trying to see how which one of our assumptions behaves uh, closer to a self-consistent model. This is not really self-consistent model, but self-consistency test, let's say. And again, the one that passed for the open spirals was the slow rotating pattern with a strong amplitude. And uh, as I told you, five to 12% of the perturbing to the total force are typical values. Okay, this doesn't hold for the uh, SA, let's say galaxy, the tightly round spirals, which since exactly they didn't have the obvious problem with the four corners that are much more around the orbits in such a model, then they could pass corrotation. Then the question was open if it goes to the outer limit or not. But the critical stuff it was that they could reach corrotation. And this gives us the other thing that we have to have in mind. Due to the amplitude that it is imposed in the two different cases, in uh, tightly round spirals, we have low amplitude of the order of 1% of the axisymmetric background, then the Lin Shu theory can be described with these orbits we find, but these orbits are very close to circular, they are very round. As the amplitude is increased, then they become more elongated and more elongated, and then to have the ellipses that nicely precess and reinforce up to the 4 to 1 resonance the pattern, then we have quite elongated orbits. Here, for instance, in this case, we didn't have elongated orbits and we could uh, model orbits, uh, uh, objects like uh, the 488, NGC 488 that you see in the projected image there in the upper left corner. Okay, and uh, how close we could find uh, match the observed morphologies, it is, uh, let's see in uh, this example here where we have introduced also some odd terms in our potential, we make guesses. We say, let's see, let's we uh, assume that we have so much amplitude and that it rotates that fast, okay? Uh, and let's see what uh, we can get first with uh, our orbits and then uh, with the uh, gases response. And you see that this galaxy uh, up to here, up to this B1, B2 points, uh, the model, this is the galaxy that projected, this is the model, we have the main arms, but we have also some secondary features that appear by, 
by themselves in the model, like the bifurcation here of the arm at this B1 point, like the off phase with respect to the imposed spi spiral extension to corrotation that has this arm with a equal one component. Also, uh, this stuff over there, all that are uh, present. So I don't know really if we can say that, uh, okay, we found the solution, but it is the better matching that certainly the better matching one can get if one assumes that we are based on this precessing ellipsis flow thinking and this kind of density wave in terms of orbital theory, else we've come in problems. Uh, and we were not the only ones, just when I was in Heidelberg before leaving, there was a PhD thesis of uh, a colleague that did continue in uh, research in astronomy, uh, does other astronomy related jobs. But again, in this thesis, uh, they did some similar things, not with orbits, uh, with uh, gases responses. The additional um, uh, this data that they compared, they had from Colorado some long slits, spectroscopy, many slits uh, in the galaxy, and then they compared also the uh, kinematics of their models uh, with the galaxies they were trying to model. And again here, you can see their basic conclusion was that this is the images of the galaxies, and these uh, red uh, rings indicate the estimated corrotation region, the pattern speed, actually, then. And in all these cases, the inner symmetric part, I underline, not the whole galaxy. You have seen previously we had an off phase extension to corrotation, etc. But the inner symmetric part of the galaxy was inside this ring. You see here, here here and there, here and there, here maybe and there, all this stuff was inside the estimated corrotation in these cases. So you can find some there are other examples in the literature towards this direction. Okay. Okay, I'm skipping this one. Now, the point is, what can we say about spirals beyond corrotation? Because we have seen the obstacles that we have to overcome in order to uh, cross the four to one and come closer to corrotation. The point, first of all, to reach uh, the four to one, re beyond the four to one resonance, the first problem is the orientation of the orbits and their shape. You can already see that here, okay, up to there in this model, it's okay. Then we start having some elbows. In this case, I don't remember to be frankly, if it is a model for this galaxy, I have found the, but here there's also another elbow. And at larger distances, you can see some spiral structure in some cases that are more obvious. Ah, uh, in this, uh, independent of the model, this is one of the most famous cases uh, of the differences that was underlined in the 90s when they uh, could compare images of the optical and the near infrared. Uh, this is again uh, a deprojected image of NGC 2997, the one I have shown you in the. Uh, uh, almost in the first transparency. And the very interesting thing was that uh, this branch here was much weaker in the near infrared, almost was not there. That means that we're not the old orbital population in contradiction with the main spiral arms. In any case, so even uh, it is a, a nice plot from 1994, but even from that time, okay, and it has never been published. It was uh, always on my wall and uh, et cetera. But you see these nice extensions. And to understand what these extensions is, we have to go to BART galaxies because the forcing is stronger there, and then we can discuss things better. Uh, let's go to the BART galaxies. We see and try to understand what is the nature of the spirals now uh, beyond the end of the bar, you see that even in end body simulations, not only in response models, one can find all these features, like in this gaseous uh, component of an end body simulation, see how nicely the dust lane shocks are reproduced. Uh, so, and this came in the, in the decade of the 2000s. Leah is here. We in Athens did a lot of uh, work, and there's many, many papers you can find in the literature about what uh, uh, is the nature of the spirals that seem to start in the neighborhood of the unstable Lagrangian point, the L1 and L2. 
and you remember I have shown also the figure that uh, it is not random motion close to an unstable point, a periodic orbit or an equilibrium point. Everything is deterministic. And if it is deterministic, one calculate where the nearby particles will go. And here you see, for instance, that we have the L1, and here you can have two eigendirections, again, easily being calculated by analyzing the, the matrices there, the linear algebra stuff, and you can find two directions. One, that if you are close to the, uh, to, to the Lagrangian points, pushes them away from them, this and that direction, and the other one that brings them closer to that. And which one of those, uh, of which one of uh, the direction, each couple of them uh, will prevail has to do with the rotation curve, uh, with, uh, excuse me, with the rotation of the galaxy, the sense of rotation of the galaxy. And actually, if one uh, digs the literature, can find that this idea was already uh, presented as an idea in the 60s by Danby, where he said, okay, look, maybe the spirals are associated with particles that escape from the uh, neighborhood of the unstable Lagrangian points. So these are the chaotic spirals, as we say, the Lyapunov spirals, etc. Then as this is not that the Apunov orbit is a little bit inside of the fourth one region, but each time you have an unstable point, you can try to find out where the nearby initial conditions will lead if you start integrating the neighborhood of, of, uh, of, of the point. Okay. And here is one case. We have a Bart spiral galaxy, uh, an early type Bart spiral galaxy. And as I, uh, I don't remember which was the talk, but just to tell you, so the important thing is the energy, the Jacobi constant of the particle. You can take one and put it close to the center of the galaxy. It will find its way, if it has the right energy, to, oops, to cross the gate here and go, going out like this, it will reinforce the, uh, the spiral. And here is the galaxy again, and here's a response model of uh, uh, what orbits like this put all together will finally um, support as a structure. In some cases, it can be even much more complicated. I'm, I like all the time to give this example because it comes already, look, these uh, spirals, uh, just before I called them chaotic spirals, we coined this term chaotic spirals not because they, are, they support a chaotic structure, they support a very precise structure, the spiral arm associated to the uh, Lagrangian point, but the orbits that are, uh, uh, these particles follow are chaotic, right? Okay, and uh, in one case, uh, we had uh, uh, some models for a galaxy, a famous galaxy, NGC 1300. We have a potential estimated from near infrared observations, and then we were doing the same job, try to find the right uh, range of uh, pattern speeds that will give some something that will resemble the shape that we observe. And to our surprise, it was the pattern speed didn't scale uh, the same, a similar figure. So we do not have a, a let's say, uh, in the ISO, uh, this is the effective ISO uh, potential curves, let's say, were not the same all the time. There was a range where this, their shapes were very similar to the observed shape of the galaxy. And in other cases, we had an, a rounder or a more rectangular-like looking uh, shape of the, of the, of, uh, the bar, etc. But there was a range where we had this shape with many unstable Lagrangian points in one side, totally asymmetric. And if we did that, uh, if we have taken our response model, it was looking like that. And uh, uh, to the right, we have the isofolds of the uh, galaxy on top of the model. So you see that the bar of the model and uh, the isof of the galaxy match very nicely, not the spirals. And we didn't even, I think, if I remember correct, was not even the one that we proposed finally to combine with another pattern speed for the spirals, etc., to represent the galaxy. But I think the model is more important in this case because this tells us something, uh, oops, uh, tells us the following. 
we calculated the orbits in this particular model. And the X1 family was stable just very close to the center. The rest of the orbits were chaotic. But since they didn't have the energy, like in a fly in uh, a room, they were staying and they were reinforcing the shape of the bar that was observed in the galaxy. So that tells us that can be, in principle, in principle, there can be cases where chaotic motion can reproduce observed features on the sky. Okay, uh, the difference between the two, the, the, the two kind of orbits that uh, uh, spirals that we discuss. In uh, to the left, we have uh, the normal uh, spiral case where the flow of the material, stars and gas, is somehow across the spiral arms. They come into the neighborhood, then they change direction, they bend inwards, they reinforce the spiral, and it is, let's say, across, in any case, the spiral arms. To the left, the main flow is along the spiral arms, at least very close to the uh, Lagrangian points. Further out, you have seen one option, if one wants to consider it, that can be reinforced by uh, outer lindal resonance type orbits. And in a uh, paper, I have also proposed another family that it is uh, not intersecting any one of the two axes. That's why it was previously not found. It's down here, some uh, ellipses like that and could uh, reinforce this part of the spirals, but these are details. The point is that uh, we have two different kinds of flows for two different kinds of uh, spiral arms. Okay, here again, the same thing. Uh, you see that here it goes across the spiral, they come and they go all the way here, they reinforce and here they jump out of the Lagrangian, of uh, unstable Lagrangian point region and they reinforce the spiral. Okay, and then, okay, we can have uh, also cases like that where in uh, models, with a single pattern speed, both of them can coexist. And then here you can have some interesting results. Okay, the logarithm logarithmicity of the spirals cannot, uh, is not there in the bar spiral cases, but also these are details. Okay, but here it is uh, a kind of flow that uh, you think that you can find in, at least in some objects in, 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 in galaxies. So look here, here is a known object, 1566. And then you see, you have here the spiral. Here is uh, one or two bars, but let's forget uh, the very inner part. Let's discuss about the spirals that start here and there. Then you have these two spirals. These are embedded in a bar-like feature. And then you have another set of spirals, very faint, that are outwards. So you can have these kinds of models with a single pattern speed that can reproduce uh, these characteristics like what uh, you see in that model there. And 1566 is not the only object you can find in the sky. Here is uh, 5248, the one I have shown you before, this uh, rotation curve, uh, this long slit uh, spectrum at the beginning. So, okay, this kind of stuff. Good. And here, actually, coming back to this uh, figure, uh, the faint outer spirals are also of the same character like the one we find in barred uh, uh, spiral galaxies. So these uh, arcs here, these arms here, are again kind of chaotic spirals. Okay, uh, the inflow of gas is also very interesting. I will skip this transparency because Mattia will uh, say all of these details. Just again, since we are used to look at uh, secondary features all the time, I just point this, uh, uh, tails that we find in some cases coming uh, together with the main dust lane shocks in, in the bar that can be found in several uh, cases in galaxies. For instance, okay, oops, there are secondary features. One has to try to see them here and there, maybe here and there. Okay. Okay, this uh, we will discuss it uh, more in more details. And also it is what is always very interesting is to see under which conditions the very central uh, area, the inner kilo, innermost kiloparsec area uh, is, uh, uh, is structured, right? But okay, as I told you, uh, Mattia will say a lot of, about that, the dynamics in the innermost kiloparsec. 
I just uh, uh, having that in mind as a discussion, the presence in several cases, this uh, leading spiral feature that you see here, we have a galaxy rotating in this sense and in the very inner part, we have in some cases, uh, this uh, leading spiral, it was the master thesis of uh, Stavros Pastras. Uh, okay, okay. Let's continue over there to uh, say we have uh, uh, some time to speak also about three-dimensional systems. All of that, what we discussed until now, were on the equatorial plane of the galaxies, but uh, we know that uh, galaxies, even disk galaxies, have also a third dimension, very important in the central parts, where we find, uh, let's say, uh, this peanut-shaped structure. We see that in galaxies, we have them in models. Uh, I don't remember when was the, the early paper by Daniel uh, in the 90s, something where was, uh, the peanut was, uh, could be reproduced in body simulations. And uh, we have a very nice uh, also images the last year from the space telescopes uh, and all that stuff. Uh, since I have this diagram here, again, uh, look at the, the dust lane. Here is the gas of uh, the same model. Here are the stars. Look here, again, the dust lane shocks that are present on the, uh, how nicely, how the strong feature this is and how nicely it appears in body simulations. Okay, we have seen also in other talks this nice uh, object which uh, gives the peanut and embedded in the peanut, embedded in the peanut is the uh, X feature. There are several galaxies where the peanut is there, but the X is not at least that clearly uh, uh, described. Uh, so what can we say uh, since we play with orbits about with this uh, kind of objects? And also here it's a nice case also again that combines all the uh, morphological features that uh, we discuss. We have taken it with uh, our telescope, the Greek telescope on Helmos. It's a 2.3 meter telescope on Helmos. And then you have uh, the opportunity to ask to have uh, a galaxy to be observed overnight, just one galaxy, or let's say two, three galaxies, and then accumulate the, the observations and try to see very faint details. As in this particular case, uh, it is too much light in here, but uh, you can see that, maybe you can see that we have the bar, we have the peanut, has also a nix in here, over there, then we have the spiral arms nicely coming out. And then at the very center, we could find also uh, another spiral. This, in this case, it is trailing. It's not the leading feature we are looking for, but we can have uh, very deep observations uh, sometimes of objects like that. The formalism we follow to describe our findings, again, the same. Now we go to a six-dimensional uh, phase space. We reduce it to five. We take our the uh, our Poincaré sections. We get uh, finally four dimensions, four dimensions, four coordinates that we cannot easily visualize. Uh, and so, uh, let's show you some applications with uh, uh, the the Ferrer bar models with a Miyamoto disk and the Plummer sphere again going back to the work of Daniel in the 80s. Now, you see how uh, deep in the past we go. But this is a, a typical case where it can uh, teach us a lot about the basic dynamics of such systems. Uh, OK, here was the third bars, and here how the projected uh, thing is the, the equal potential or the density, I remember. OK, no, never mind. Now, uh, we apply the, the same procedure now we go to uh, this kind of uh, uh, characteristic equation uh, where we're going to find the eigenvalues, trying to associate the final with the initial conditions as we integrate a nearby to the periodic orbit orbit so that we see where it will go. But actually, it is not that easy to see where it goes in that case. And the corresponding to the unknown index was uh, this kind of two indices that, uh, okay, it was already here. 
uh, yes, these indices that have been introduced by Brook, 69, and actually it describes uh, the uh, location of these eigenvalues on the unit circle. And now the complication is the complexity is that we have two kinds of perturbations that we can apply. Either you displace the particle on the equatorial plane or you just put it away of it. So you have to deal with perturbations on the equatorial plane, as we say, radial perturbation or vertical perturbations. So this uh, location of the eigenvalues describe things like that. They can be both unstable. They can be one of the two unstable. They can be, of course, all of them uh, uh, on the unit circle, and then there you have a stability. But it was also the case where you had them all off like this, where it is the complex instability. And one wants to see what are all these differences in reality? What is the difference if we have a, a simple double or complex unstable uh, uh, periodic orbit? How does this structure the phase space? And I remember that in the 80s, we were saying that complex stability is an abrupt uh, way to go into the chaos. But then there was a paper by Daniel that uh, have shown some objects that are in the phase space. So uh, I can say that uh, probably we in Greece were the only one that continues speaking about that nowadays. So I think that uh, it is a very, still a very interesting uh, area of research, not just for galactic dynamics, here is Manthos Katsanikas, who does excellent work in chemical potentials. And, uh, they, okay, well, find him and uh, can tell you about uh, his findings. Uh, in any case, uh, now this kind of uh, a non-stability uh, diagrams become very complicated, but I can assure you that if you can read them, it is, again, a very helpful tool to find the bifurcating families and all that stuff. Okay, here we are at the inner lindal resonance of a model, and then we can find where the interesting orbits are bifurcated. And here I can give you an example, what is the, how a bifurcating, a bifurcated family is associated with a parent one. So this is the X1 family on the equatorial plane, and, uh, Allow me to turn it uh, 90 degrees. So here is our, and at a critical energy, then you have one, fam uh, one family, one, uh, the perturbation along one direction because unstable, and according to the rules of the game, then a new family will be bifurcated. And this is a vertical perturbation, so we'll get a vertical family. And uh, exactly at that point, Let's say, if we go exactly at this energy, then the two uh, mother and child families are identical, at least at uh, the projection on the, uh, not on the uh, direction where you act the perturbation. We have a vertical perturbation. However, at this point, look what happens. Uh, okay, now I, change the scale so that we understand it better, then if you return the, the magenta one, which is the bifurcated, you see that it has this kind of shape. And if you consider the symmetric one, we play with symmetric potentials. At this energy, you have this couple of bifurcated orbits that are in the game. So uh, according to the orbital theory, when you have such a transition, the children inherit the stability of the mother family, which is now unstable, but these are stable. And according to the first uh, way of thinking that stability supports structures, this should support some structure, at least in the model. And this one is the a family that was uh, from, as I told you, from the 80s, uh, associated with a peanut. We call them late, it later, it's a X1, V1, it's the vet, first vertical perturbation so that we could find. Uh, okay. And if we put many of them together, then 
we can look at the central part of the figure, then we have these objects. And then this is one way we propose that the X is supported. So the X, the peanut and the X, at least the X inside the peanut, if you want, it is not one orbit that it is integrated for a long time and makes the peanut. Thus, you have to consider several orbits, several energies. And after all, the spikes of the X, according to this modeling, it is just the uh, highest, uh, let's say, uh, the upper centers, if you want, uh, that uh, here we are, we look at the model edge on, side on. Here is the long axis, here is the bar. Here, this is the central part. We have several families. And uh, as they go up and down, they reinforce this kind of features. Here is how, in this kind of model, I say, how the, the spikes of the X are supported. And we have seen that, uh, as I told you, this thing, this family for a certain range in the energy is complex and stable. So can we consider it also, or what so can we do with that? We have seen that, yes, for some time you can consider it. And then you can build, uh, you can build peanuts with uh, uh, these orbits like what you see over there. Part of them is also in the complex and stable part. Okay, however, uh, stay tuned. There are other ways uh, that uh, will produce even sharper peanuts. I don't want to say more about that because, uh, okay, before sub submitting it, but okay, in any case. And here, okay, we are in the four dimensional phase space. It is difficult to deal with it, to visualize it. Here we have a ZPZ projection. And then here we can see very nicely how these families are interconnected. At zero, zero is the X1 family. And then we, if, we move, if we move toward to the right or to the left, then we approach the area where this uh, smile and frown uh, orbits the magenta one before uh, are located. This is a nice way of building a peanut. Uh, then uh, here, if you go all this way up and down, uh, then you approach some unstable parts. The funny thing is that the perturbed X1 orbits along this direction, then they start resembling the other kind of uh, uh, orbits you can find over there that are like the infinite shape, the fin of the infinite sign. Okay, there are several ways to, to build a peanut uh, using uh, material from the area. We had a paper with Mirella Harsula some years ago uh, showing this one. And just let me show some very uh, nice uh, figures. We tried several years now to visualize the four-dimensional space. And the way that we found, at least for us, it was practical, is to try to find what is the corresponding object of the invariant curve, let's say, of the uh, two-dimensional case. So what we did is that we could... Uh, keep the three, dimension, uh, the three dimensions that we have after the four of the, of the Poincaré section. We have now uh, tools that we can rotate them in space and visualize and uh, see how it looks in space. And the fourth dimension, we kept it uh, in the side and we have dyed the, every single uh, point according to its position in the fourth dimension. And we have established some rules. Now, the invariant curve was a torus in which there was a smooth transition of the color along its face. A smooth transition, not homogeneous or something. There are rules there, but it is not chaotic. Uh, okay, the, this uh, colored ob uh, torus on the right-hand side would be the corresponding object to an invariant curve you see in the Poincaré section. Okay, with the complex stability was also very nicely, nice figures that we could create. This is the, if we have a central complex and stable part, then there are these spirals that uh, start, uh, they don't go all around the phase space. They deviate in a very ordered way. They do these spirals. And at the end, I will, they bring uh, objects like that, this uh, confined tori, 
Daniel was you that gave the name confined torus in the paper. I don't remember an earlier one. But look how it looks like. And the, the, the nice thing here is that, okay, this is very close to the bifurcating point, very close, let's say, we have not a very large deviation in energy-wise from the point of bifurcation. But here, this points also to an order. And maybe this is, or it is, the reason why we can use some kind of these orbits to build structures. Okay, uh, we can discuss, uh, as the time finishes, I would be glad to discuss with you things like the inner boxiness of the bar that can be discussed in terms of three-dimensional orbits. Uh, you see that uh, in cases uh, where we have, this is also something that we have to have in mind, all the time we have spoken now about, have uh, told you about uh, how you can find the bifurcation of a family when it needs, when it uh, comes to a critical energy, etc. But it is not just this new family, the whole structure of the phase space uh, changes. And then there are also introduced other uh, families that are of uh, higher multiplicity. They are closing after more than one rotation over the center of the galaxy uh, after that. And this, in some cases, can be very important, uh, also in two and in three dimensions. Uh, here you see, speaking about inner boxiness, uh, it was a result from the thesis of uh, Leo Chavez some years ago uh, that uh, if you want to have boxiness, then you have to go to the edges of the stability regions and try to play with what we call sticky orbits, orbits that are behaving like regular for a long time before they start expressing their chaotic nature. So boxiness and outer edges of stability islands, either the uh, outermost, uh, the, the, the outer uh, invariant curves or sticky chaotic orbits in the area can give you boxy features. And with that, you can be, uh, build boxy uh, features. Also, let me show you this one. Uh, there are nice works uh, from several groups that they do, uh, 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 let's say, classification, uh, analysis of the orbits that they uh, find in n-body simulations, uh, mainly with frequency analysis. And then they appear new uh, objects, not looking like the X1 family or they, the, its known bifurcations. They are the so-called second generation bifurcations. I have shown you before in the two-dimensional case how they appear. The same can be done in the, in the in three-dimensional models. And then we have found these objects. Some of them are proposed as alternatives for building peanuts. And we had a paper with Leah showing how in models, in these nice uh, uh, fair bar models that we always work on, how they are introduced in the system, at which energy, what is the relation they have with the X1 family, etc. And here is uh, some uh, tables with such kind of orbits we have presented. Okay, I will skip this one because it is nice how to, to follow that in three dimensions using this tool of the, co of, of the color, uh, rotation and color method we have. Uh, all that we have in two dimensions, we can describe in three dimensions as well. And it is very interesting, and this, this, as a conclusion, this will be maybe the, as a result, the, the last one that I will show you. We can also think about time-dependent models, let's say a model that mass is increasing, and that it's a very nice, uh, again, tool that we came across, so that if we go to a model at a certain time, and we freeze the potential, and we see how it behaves, it is, has a good relation by displacing the initial condition of this frozen uh, potential, it has a get good relation with uh, the really evolved uh, potential in the for some quite long times over there. So, so I'm finished. I'm finished. Uh, I skip all that stuff. Stay with this uh, uh, information in mind. We have the periodic orbits. These are mathematical objects. Do not exist in galaxies uh, or in snapshots of embodied simulations but they are very important to know their morphology and stability because they structure the phase space, both stable and unstable periodic orbits. This is a key object that one has to understand its properties for understanding morphology and dynamics of galaxies. 
The non-periodic orbits can be either quasi-periodic or regular or chaotic. These are useful uh, if they are close to x1, x2 for explaining uh, bars, rings, etc. But the chaotic and especially the chaotic, sticky chaotic orbits uh, are those that can be used as building blocks for building structures. Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, I can stop here. Here I have the main conclusions and uh, many others that we can discuss. Thank you very much. Maybe there is time for some discussion. Uh, we have a second one here. Yes, thanks for the nice uh, review, um, you, you mentioned at some point about some of the uh, periodic orbits that can support the rings outside the bar, mm -hmm. the rings. Mm -hmm. um, but this is also something that you also talked about later that can be supported by the manifolds, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, which of these kinds of which of these explanations is, is is more likely i can tell you so we speak about the inner rings now right okay um as i told you you have to have in mind that periodic orbit is a mathematical object for us astronomers i can dare to say that we don't care if it is a regular or a sticky chaotic orbit what you have there if you have seen the orbits i presented for showing how they jump out of the l1 l2 so these are chaotic orbits that are trapped due to it, their, their displacement inside uh, the bar for a long time, and you can say that they support the bar, okay? So if they, have, if they support, as I, there was such an example, maybe I uh, can show you later, but maybe you remember, it was one that supported the ANSI, okay? So I don't care if I classify this as regular or chaotic. So the point is that Dynamically, since these are models and we speak with uh, uh, time dependent system uh, after all, then for the time that it behaves as regular, I would consider it as regular. Okay, if the Lyapun of, uh, of uh, exponent of this family for this time indicates regularity, let's call it regular. Who cares? The, I would say regular. So I believe that uh, the time interval in which uh, this uh, uh, quasi-periodic or chaotic orbit supports the ring, uh, I will say that it is regular. What I want to underline, this is in general what I said is correct, but if you want to see how sharp a feature is, then you have to go towards stability. If you see that something is very sharp, then it's most likely to be also a pure uh, quasi-periodic orbit that is trapped. Uh, uh, I hope that, uh, first of all, we have to submit a paper with Leah, but just after that, I have to finish something that I also write for two years now, how one can do uh, the peanut looking sharper. Okay, so let's say sharper features, regular, most, uh, uh, if they are less, uh, more vaguely described, this indicates that some ca chaoticity is introduced in the game. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Panos, for your talk uh, regarding the observation. So, as far as I understand, uh, most of the arguments that we, the model nicely describes the nature of the real objects comes from the similar appearance of. Yes. Uh, and some features in, in yeah. uh, the photometric images. But other, other uh, supporting evidence for this, maybe if we have like some portion of the regular orbits in the model and some portion of the chaotic orbits, mm -hmm. it will imply that on the like velocity maps, mm -hmm. we will have like some sort of the, I don't know, uh, features, yeah, or something else. Mm -hmm. What do you mean about that? Yeah, uh... The first thing is that you have a similarity. So then this is, if you have a similarity, then this a candidate to be true, okay? If, it, if you lose it, then uh, there is no... However, 
it was not, uh, at least in, uh, first of all, in the orbital models I have shown, now I'm speaking about the two-dimensional case with the spirals, it was also some self-consistent tests that we were doing. What uh, I mean uh, with this, you have, let's say, imagine a polar grid, and at each cell you can calculate the density due to the orbits, but you have also the density due to the potential you are imposing. And then you want to see that this is at least something that does not vary like this. And those that were to, in the models that we approved had also this better relation. And also this were had also the better similarity. There we were, were trying to do a kind of self-consistent in the sense that we followed this algorithm. But if we start with the response models, stellar or gaseous, which is the most of them, then uh, we start from uh, the circular orbits in the axisymmetric potential. We switch on the perturbation over two or three pattern rotations, and the system selects by itself what orbits will be populated in the model. And I think this is, uh, maybe it has also a physical background because, uh, okay, so the instability or whatever called the, uh, cause the spirals do not appear suddenly. It's something that grows. Okay, and there I have seen that if you look at the orbit of the stellar, uh, let's say, models, then you have also some portion of chaos, not much, but you do have also chaos. Now, as I said before, if this chaos is the kind of sticky chaos, you have the same behavior. And in any case, you cannot claim that this is for a Hubble time. I'm uh, very glad to see that it is for a couple of giga years in uh, N-body simulation, some special kind of N-body simulation. You have to fine tune this, you fine tune the other thing, and then you get a spiral that it is there for, let's say, two giga years. I think this kind of models refer to two or three giga years, else the potential will have changed, and then you have to see how it has changed. Again, the last, one of the last transparencies I have shown very, uh, uh, very short, it was, uh, it gave some indications that I want to look further. So if you have, if you freeze the potential, and then you displace the initial conditions, then with displaced initial conditions in a particular direction, you can see that it resembles very much the evolution of the orbit if the potential continues, let's say, to increase the mass of the bar, and it, you have the, the orbit. And then at a certain point, you freeze, you put one, uh, you displace the initial condition of the periodic orbit, and then you see a similar evolution. This is something that gives you a hint if you want to see how things change in a time dependent potential. All of them, what you have seen here, the vast majority was for autonomous Hamiltonian system. This was the approach that... Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, part of the <laughs> continue, continuation of the question, as you have said, it's kind of hard to produce the long-lived spiral arms in pure and body simulations, right? Yes. Yeah. Like one or two giga years. So does it imply that uh, the, the gas component is crucial to reproduce the spiral arms, right? The, which component? The, the gas, gas component. The gas, the gas, the gas. yes, yes, yes. Sure. It's yeah. crucial. Yeah. So did you think about it that probably in those kind of experiments you have done, you should include the gas potential, like not only uh, your stellar potential, yeah. but the gas potential, yeah. and check what orbits, yeah. what orbits will be there with yeah. the gas potential. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it will give well, more clear yeah. answer what orbits. Part of the uh, results I have uh, shown was gases responses to the potentials that we had satisfactory results with uh, the orbits. And there is a good relation. They are not the same, but they are similar. So for instance, there was not a case that we had a better response for a different pattern speed in the orbits than we had in the gas. So there was a kind of, uh, shift. yeah, a shift there is, but uh, the pattern speed, let's say, that gave the best results was the same. 
we couldn't we couldn't say that for instance this inner symmetric part i was speaking about was in one case uh, had the best results at the four to one and then in the gas it was for corrotation some something very important was happening also in the gas there in the gas we could have for instance some off phase extension Imagine that you have uh, imposed a spiral with 25 degrees pitch angle, and then you could find or reproduce this one. With the gas, you could have an ex extension, but with 10 degrees pitch angle. So it was uh, you couldn't build there a self-consistent model if we wanted to, to apply the self-consistent test we did with the orbits. Mm -hmm. Things like that. This is the relation. Now, in the n-body simulations, again, you have, uh, there you have also the gas, but also you have another very important fact is the distribution of the dark matter. So <laughs> that plays also an important role, yeah. It doesn't mean the fact that you're going to gas, so it doesn't mean If we manage to make it work without the gas, then we have a lot of information. It's not to throw away, honestly. Mm. Uh, yeah. Take one. One. Keep one. <laughs> we should stop. <laughs> but uh, we can continue during the coffee break and okay. whatever. Yeah. And I'm sure can do Yeah, sure, sure. Of course. That's why we're here. Okay. No. Stop So there is a request. Uh, please listen. Listen. Uh, uh, I have an announcement. There is some meeting of the academicians in the rare side. So we, let's try to keep closer to this gate here of the room so that we do not disturb them because they are already there meeting. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I would like to present today some of our recent results. Regarding, okay, one second. Uh, which one to point? The pointer is this one, the middle one. Oh, okay, nice. Okay. The recent results regarding the bar dynamics and specifically the bar dynamics in the action space. This work was done in collaboration with Victor Zazulia, the youngest of our team members, uh, Sasha Marchuk, who is sitting there, and Natalia Yakina Sotinkova, who is kind of like our principal investigator. So <laughs> I just start with some simple sketches. I probably shouldn't remind you that the studying of the bar, the studying the bars is an important thing because they appear in so many galaxies and participate in so many physical processes. The thing I would like to know is the build and composed of some kind of orbits, uh, like Panas discussed in previous talk. And since the bars are composed of the orbits, the formation and evolution of the bars is tied to the evolution of the orbits. Uh, here, just a simple sketch of the main family of the orbits that compose the bar. And important question is how do we characterize the orbits? Because uh, stars usually are mixed in a coordinate space, like you can have two stars that are close to each other, but they're actually moving along the two completely different orbits. And this can be done in many, many different ways, like upper centers and eccentricities, uh, frequencies from spectral analysis, and so on and so on. But some of these parameters have more physical meaning than the others, and that's from where action angle variables come. I 
probably should skip a bit here because all you heard a talk on Tuesday, I think, about the action variables. I just talk, I just tell you that if there is a periodic a good orbit, there exists a transformation that maps the motion of this orbit on the surface of the two-dimensional torus. And the coordinates of the particle on this torus will be the angles, which are linear functions with time, and the parameters of this torus would be the integrals of motion, specific, specifically the radius of the circles of its cross-sections. The uh, frequencies here will also be constant, on some constants of motions. Usually, actions are referred to as a radial action, JFE, uh, which, turn out, which turns out to be often the the angular momentum and vertical actions and the corresponding frequencies. The thing about action variables is that they are kind of like unreachable gold in galactic dynamics because the, this transformation is actually quite complicated one. An analytical solution, analytical solutions exist only for it's a few potentials and the very specific ones. And in realistic potential, one should either approximate the potential on carrying or carry out some integration. And I will return to this problem later. Here, I just uh, would like to briefly uh, talk about two works that inspired our work. And the recent work by uh, Will Matrick, where the authors translate their uh, the Gaia DR2 data into the action space. Here is the angular momentum and trade election. And what you see here is some stripes. This orders argue that these stripes are associated, are associated with different moving groups of stars, and they probably arise due to different resonance phenomena. And the second work is by De Victor De Batista. BPS pulses in action space as the other studied how the initial actions, the vertical one and the radial one, would smear if the, uh, if the model forms a bar in the BPS bulge. So, moving on to the actual problems we started, we wanted to solve in our work. The first one uh, being is that the actual bar formation mechanism, at least one of them, was formulated in action variables, specifically the one studied by Linden Bell in 1979. He studied the elongated orbits in the Isaac Ron disk model and found there are two distinct regions in this model, dynamically distinct. And these regions are defined by the following quantity, this, which is the partial derivative of the precession rate over angular momentum. If it's uh, uh, taken along the constant value of the adiabatic invariant, which is here, it's just the sum of functions. So, if this uh, partial derivative, which I call Lyndon Bell derivative or LB derivative for short, if it's a negative, has a negative sign, then the orbit, uh, then the bar perturbation, then when the bar tries to capture the orbit, the orbit will reduce its angular momentum, but at the same time, it will, it will increase its precession rate and it will result in the orbit running away from the bar. And here you can see the map, the map the well map. It's here that we have an angular momentum and here is the value of the adiabatic invariant. Here are the ill lines of the precession rate and this quantity is actually the inclination of the ill lines. So here we have the positive inclination here is about zero, and here is uh, the negative inclination in here. And this is the region where this quantity is negative, which Linden Bell called a normal region, where the orbits won't support the bar. And in the opposite case, when this quantity is a positive one, a bar tries to capture the orbit, and it will reduce its angular momentum and it will, and the orbit will reduce its precession rate, which will result in the orbit, uh, in the orbit, such an orbit will be captured by the bar. 
please remember the figure we will return to this later <laughs> in our study. And the thing which we try to do in our work uh, is the following. The model considered by Wind and Bell is actually quite old. Uh, it's a nice model, <laughs> but uh, he didn't consider the contribution of the Derek Halo, for example. And it's important, at least from the perspective <laughs> from the... Uh, uh, so the thing we try to do is to check whether some of his ideas can be applied to up-to-date simulations. And now, if we can calculate the action variables in, uh, in body simulations. The second question, which I uh, will try to address in my talk, is how the BPS bulges form. More specifically, not how they form, but how they grow. It's an open question. Uh, Selwood and Gerhardt recently showed that presented three different numerical models and stated that in each of them, the models are different in some physical parameters. In each of these models, the BPS bulge forms due to action of the different mechanisms, specifically backlink, uh, so the so-called resonance heating, and then the resonance capturing. But after that, some other authors published a paper where they doubted that the backlink is actually a separate entity and maybe can be connected with the vertical resonance. So what we try to do is to check uh, some of these ideas in embodied simulations and specifically check the value of the resonant angle and the potent characteristics and important parameter as I will, will see. This is our work. Uh, so what we have as our model is actually a rather, rather simple model. If you consider up-to-date cosmological simulations, it's just a pure stellar disk embedded into the dark halo. Here are some parameters of the models uh, and parameters of the halo. Initial equilibrium state was prepared via Mega Galaxy package by Macmillan, and the integration was carried out by Walter Den and, by Walter Den and Scott. Here are the snapshots of the simulations. I will talk only about initial time moment when the disk is axisymmetric, there are no BPS bulge, and about this interval uh, when the bar grows slowly and steadily, there are no some catastrophic events like backlink and so on, because at this time interval, uh, the evolution of the system proceeds rather fast and it's kind of hard numerically to calculate some things. So how could to calculate actions in body simulations? The general expressions are the following, and you can wonder why there is an integral sign for the angles now. The thing is the action variables of the particles which are influenced by inner lingual resonance are no longer conserved. Actually, they are changing their functions of time and the frequencies too. So to properly calculate the angle, one needs to take this integral. In practice, for example, we can consider radial action and its integral of radial velocity over the radial distance taken from pericenter to upper center. The frequency can be found in the following way. And the integral is the following, assuming the initial phase is zero. So one can carry just a direct integration along the orbit. The positive side of such an approach is there no need an approximation for the potential. And it's kind of cool because the potential, of course, is non axisymmetric The negative side is that we end up with a very sparse time series, like the values are updated only when the particle passes through the period center or upper center, or in case of the vertical actions, uh, at the minimum or maximum value of the vertical coordinate. The second approach uh, is the so-called stackel fudge, which is already implemented at Agama and actually was used by uh, the works I cited earlier. Here is an advantage of such an approach is that it can be applied to every snapshot of the simulations to obtain the so-called instantaneous sections. And of course, one should pay something for such luxury. And the payment is, that you need an axisymmetric approximation of the potential. It's kind of bad, 
but it still can work. <laughs> like it, I will show some examples. Uh, so in our work, we used both of this approach, and here an example. It's a rather confusing part, I think. I was myself confused several times when I was writing this part of the paper, but I will try my best to explain what is happening here. So here we have an orbit, just different projections, different colors mark different periods of time. Here is the radial action, and there are actually five curves, and each of them is a different way to calculate actions. Let's start with a thin blue line. It's almost invisible to you, I think, but here how it goes. There are sudden ups and downs here. There's no clear indication why they're happening. And it's the action we obtained by applying the stackle fudge method. So it's a gamma actions. We call this uh, short-term noise, like short-term evolution of the actions. The next one is a dashed curve. Here it is, dashed black curve. It's actually a piecewise function, this one, this one, this one. This is what we obtain from direct integration of the orbit. The vertical lines here are the time moments when the particle passes through the pericenter or upper center. Uh, the next thing we have done is to compare the actions obtained by gamma here and by our direct integration. And here you can see the corresponding blue attached line is just the value of gamma actions averaged among the same time periods in between the vertical lines. And you can see that they end up kind of close, which is good because we used here an independent approach, an independent from each other approach. The next thing which we have done, and this is probably the most confusing part, we tried to obtain the values of the action between the pericenters and apocenters obtained from direct integration. And for this, we applied a special kind of spline, the so-called the mean preserving spline. This spline, as it follows from its name, it preserves the average value over the interpolated time interval. And this is, you can see, it's dashed dotted line here and a thick blue line. This is just direct integration and this is from gamma. So what you see here is a nice smooth curve without some short nerve, short term noise. But, uh, and it shows the so-called medium term oscillations of the actions. These oscillations exist even the system doesn't evolve as a whole. But if the bar captures the particles, that means that the actions should evolve in a circular, circular. So there should be a circular evolution. And here it's shown. This plot here, we have every action like angular momentum, radial action, and vertical action. It's basically each color indicates each action. Thin lines are again my action short time evolution. The next one is the one supply uh, obtained by applying the mean preserving spline. You can see here nice oscillations. And then you can see that actually the average value of the action shift when we consider a long time period, like it's like one and some of in billion years. To obtain the circular evolution of the actions, we applied the mean preserving spline again to the values. Uh, to the time series of medium term values. So that's how it works. Basically, this is a gamma actions. This is obtained by applying the mean preserving spline. And this one's obtained by applying the mean preserving spline again. And now we can distinguish three different types of evolution. The short term one, the middle term, or medium term one, and the secular one. The frequencies was treated in the same way. So let me start. Let me return to physics. Uh, here is the Linden Bell maps. Here we have, oh, sorry, an angular momentum and at the value of adiabatic invariant. And the colors, the colors here indicate the value of the precession rate. This is the map for the initial state of the system. And all you can see here is actually the line of the circular orbits. It's the line, it's usually called this way because is for the circle orbits, the value of the diabetic invariant actually equal to the value of angular momentum and other actions are zero. 
it's not representative. This map is not representative because it does not allow one to check how the evolution of the actions will proceed. So to understand this, we artificially populated this place. It's done just by, you can take a probe particle, insert with the fixed values of friction variables, insert it in the system, calculate precession rate, and then just take it away. So this is the map we end up. And here you can nicely see now the abnormal and normal regions which Linden Bell has studied. And an interesting part and an immediate result we see here is that if you check where this border is, the border between the abnormal and normal regions, you found that the, it's near the disk end. If you, can, if you compare these two maps, this is where the regional system ends. And this is where the border between the regions pass. So <laughs> instead of the ideas, instead Linden Bell initially thought that this region where the, the corresponding partial derivative is positive should be located somewhere here in the center of the system. But it's not true. <laughs> in the actual system, this system embedded in the dark hollow, this abnormal region seems to cover the whole disk. In our defense, I can say that the, we are not the first to obtain this result. It was already obtained by Evgeny Polichenko, also he used another approach. We didn't think too deep about it, but st it's still kind of an interesting result. Now, as the, the system has evolved, evolved, you can see here, again, the distribution of uh, adiabatic invariance and angular momentum. And uh, be careful, there are different scales here. Now we have a nice border between abnormal and normal regions. The, here it is. And uh, what we see here, we can check what uh, structures are formed by particles that occupy the correspondent regions. And we immediately can see that the particles which are here compose, constitute the bar, actually. And the particles which are located to the right of the corresponding Linden Bell zero derivative line forms something close to disk. It's not actually disk because it's still not that axisymmetric. There are some density enchantments you can see here, but it's actually very close to the disk. And this figure gives a inside how, how they captured particles. Uh, the particles captured by the bar can be identified in the body simulations. So let us now consider one orbit, just an example. Here, here is an orbit, different colors again mark different periods of time. Uh, here is an evolution, the evolution of precession rate in black line, left y axis. And here is the evolution of angular momentum, orange color, right y axis. And what is happening with the particle? Initially, it's angular momentum and precession rate oscillate asynchronously, meaning precession rate increases, angular momentum decreases. Then at some point in time, they start to oscillate synchronously. This is marked by the red line here. And you can guess what this thin black line is. It's actually the pattern speed of the bar in our model. So at the same time, as, we, as our orbit experience change in the mode of oscillation, uh, the, but the precession rate of the particle becomes equal to the bar pattern speed. This is how you can call this figure the bar capturing online. This is actually how bar captures the particles. The next thing we were interested in is how uh, the actions evolve. Here you see medium term and circular evolution of the actions, and orange color is again angular momentum, and blue line is the line is the sum of radial and vertical actions. You can see that angular momentum decreases, which is what we expect, and the radial action and vertical action increase. But the thing is, and this is kind of what I uh, like, what I wanted to check at the start of this work is that is is that whether the adiabatic invariant really, con really conserved and it's turned to be true. <laughs> it turns to be true. This is the value of adiabatic invariant and you can see that it's nice <laughs> horizontal line. It's conserved for one particle. But what, will, but what happens for all particles? You can consider uh, a specific time interval from 300 to 400 hour units. It's like 
five uh, billion uh, five billion years in our model. Uh, not not five. It's from five to six billion years in our model. Here is the precession rates of the particles and the value of angular momentum. Uh, in green, in red and yellow, you can see the distribution for all particles in the system, and in green. We market the particles that change the mode of their oscillations in the way I described earlier. So here we have the particles that process slower than the bar, and at the end of our time interval, they end up at this line, which is actually the bar precession rate. Here you can see the evolution of the actions, its average, uh, its average value plotted here, and the dispersion to the sample. And again, you can see angular momentum decreases and the basic invariant is concerned. What are the structures formed by such, by such particles? They start initially, they form initially a circle-like structure, and then it slowly become a part of the bar, which you can see here, what you can see here. This is what about the evolution of the bar and plane, how it captures the particles in plane. Now, what we can see here is that particles that are dropped by the bar actually became a part of BP pulse. Actually, not all of them. You still can see here that there is a plane bar. So what we check is how the so-called resonant angle of this particle evolves. What is the resonant angle? It's the difference between the angle of vertical and radial oscillations. If this quantity is equal to zero or P, and a constant, then uh, you have a periodic orbit, like banana-like orbits that Pan has presented earlier. If uh, for regular orbit, this quantity should oscillate around the mentioned values. Here you, we have some examples of the orbits, different projections, again, type evolution of the resonant angle and uh, vertical action depending on the value of resonant angle. Studying our particles in the body model, we found that there are roughly, roughly four ways how the evolution of the resonant angle can proceed. And they are described here. The first two is a circulation mode when the angle just monotonically increases or decreases, marked here by yellow and green respectively. But the most interesting interval is marked here by blue. In this interval, what particle can do is to start oscillate around some values. And this is how the particle feels the presence of the resonance, actually. And it starts to oscillate around the mentioned values. But then it can diff. It can st stop to oscillate and change the mode again. Here, you can see different examples of how this is happening. Some particles just stuck in resonance. It's, you can see here, some particles just fly through the resonance. And this is what the resonance heating actually is. The particle doesn't feel the resonance. It acquires vertical extension and just moves through the resonance. We checked what are the structures formed by uh, particles that experience uh, that uh, have different modes of resonant angle oscillations. You can see it here. This is for all bar particles and the corresponding fraction of particles. Here is the plane bar. Uh, it's the mode of circulation when the, angle, uh, when the resonant angle increases. These are the particles that are in resonance. That are the particles that in the so-called passage when orbit is lifted, but it doesn't feel the resonance. And here, the most numerous one is the particles that actually passed the resonance. And we can see that it's the most numerous family. But actually, if we consider only trapped particles, and this is important, you can see here that the most dominating, the most dominating mode of oscillation are actually particles that are in reason in resonance. The most numerous one. So we can conclude that the resonance heating and the resonance capturing, we see the particles that are stuck in the resonance for a long period, for long periods of time are acting simultaneously in our model. And the next result we can conclude from this figure is that for recently trapped particles, the resonance the capturing seems to be the most important mechanism of BPS bulge growth. 
So here are the confusions. I just like to describe it in some general words. This work is a built old, old school one, as you can see, but it's kind of important <laughs> that the ideas pioneered by Linden well actually somehow are reflected in, in body simulations in general. We see that the partial derivative, Linden well partial derivative, seems to be an important characteristic that allows one to uh, identify particles captured by the bar and the dropped particles conserve the value of adiabatic invariant, which is important and I think is shown in the embodied simulations for the first time. The next thing about the vertical uh, evolution, we found that the resonant angle seemed to be an important uh, characteristic that allows one to distinguish between the resonant capturing and resonant heating mechanisms in the embodied simulations and both these mechanisms can operate simultaneously in just a typical in-body model. Comparing the fractions of orbits, of orbits, we found that the dominant mechanism for recently trapped orbits seem to be the resonance capturing. Thank you for your attention. And I would like to say, say a special thanks to Penos who invited me to this conference. And I will hope he won't eat me and leave in a few minutes after my talk. Is that better? Yes. We were told not to use it too much because otherwise we would destroy the time of these people. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any? Any? Yes. Daniel. Right. Well, a very nice talk. Uh, rather fundamental, I would say. Um, I didn't understand the. Uh, why you need to calculate the actions only at Z max or Z, why, why do you, you are- uh, Actions you, start to oscillate. Yes, because you could have a continuous integration and select by, by angle when the phase are the same. Uh, and, and so, I understand, and it's, uh, it's easier this way kind of because we, because to find, it's kind of easy to find Pericenters and upper sensors for a good orbit. We plan to do this, what you are saying, yeah. but. In principle, you could integrate. It's possible to integrate from some continuous specific function. And... Uh. Yes, probably. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that you will obtain a continuous curve there, honestly. <laughs> the body, and body, and body orbits are just such that you probably won't obtain a continuous curve there. I think you should have, you should smooth it, I think, in the end, to obtain the medium mm. term in circular evolution. I think there is no way around. And the, the other question is, um, uh, there should be a similar diagram as the, Linden Bell diagram in the plane for the for the the, the, G, the Z action. For the Z action, yeah, 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 the, yeah. there is. Let me show you. I, I <laughs> uh, uh, no, maybe it's not the same. It's not exactly what you mean, but here is the angular momentum. Uh, here is we have the angular momentum, and here is the radial action and how the trapped package Trapped particle, particles are actually cross the line of this of uh, Linden Bell's derivative lines. They cross it actually. They yeah. not they not there initially, and it's important distinction between uh, the Linden Bell uh, between the Linden Bell ideas. The particles seem to cross the line. Yes. Yes. Uh, the second thing they can ah here's <laughs> here are the colors the colors here mark actually the value of vertical actions. I remember now <laughs> the colors here mark the vertical actions. And you can see that initially uh, they all are black, means that vertical actions are close to zero. And then you see here that the colors become quite intensive. That means that the vertical action increases. It's just kind of hard to plot all three actions <laughs> on 
two-dimensional force. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's uh, really interesting. I have many questions, but uh, so just to clarify, so everything you, 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 I mean, in the beginning, you mentioned the different ways of getting the actions, but everything you showed us later is with the Stekelfage approximation. Uh, yes, yes. Major term actions obtained from, uh, by applying the, in preserving plane from direct integration. There were several steps of reviewing of our article. <laughs> like we started from Agava, and then after each step, we improved our approach at how it went. So it's from direct integration. The yeah, it's addition. direct integration. It's, and not, then... it's not using the shekel no. at each time step. Okay, yeah. I see. And what, can you explain a little bit? I missed, I think I missed it, why there were these very sudden jumps in the uh, shekel uh... type of potential. It's kind of hard to explain because at each step, what actually happens with stacker type of potential, what Agama is doing, it's approximating the potential at each point of time. And it's not like if you ever approximated the potential, it's not like a continuous function. <laughs> like it can, uh, the values at some point can vary discreetly. It's not a continuous. And that is what's happening. It's the first point. The second point is just the orbits and not like exactly regular at all points of, of time. It's not like we can have sticky orbit. Like if you, I can show this again. And I honestly, well, or not, <laughs> probably not. Well, oh, I can, uh, okay, this is the orbit. Uh, so what do you think? Is this a regular orbit or a sticky chaotic orbit? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a way to find, of course, it's just some additional work, but it's kind of the particles in embody simulations, even if you have like four millions of particles, they experience sudden change of trajectory sometimes, just, I don't know, if they interact with the bar or spiral arms or something, it's just not that continuous sometimes. Uh, I, I would like to continue. Francesca, just have you tried to have the same potential with two different um, different methods? Like, for example, uh, you would do a series expansion, which you would change the number of the terms you keep. You yes. do uh, yes, think, do, do you did, did you do any yeah. of those, and what yes. was the result? Here? Yes, yes. <laughs> if you if you consider. <laughs> The result was. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, it was kind of complicated, but uh, after I think the six uh, harmonics, the result, the results of at least stack refetch uh, stops to depend, uh, do not depend anymore on the number of harmonics you have. So after some point, you've got all the information you have, you want, yeah, and yeah. therefore consider that as yeah, a very good way of. Doing yeah, it. yeah. That's very. Good. Yes. Yeah, of course. Of course. Oh, somebody else? Oh. <laughs> I just don't know. Like. <laughs> okay. 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 No That's more it. questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Roman Kachenko and I, I would like to present you our research which was carried out in collaboration with Professor Giovanni Carrara and Vladimir Kalchagin. And it's dedicated to the study of galactic power influence on the position of global clusters in kinematic space and how does it relate to the current attempts of identification of global cluster groups with specific accretion event. So the layout of my talk is as follows. 
First, I would like to begin by giving you a brief introduction to the problem and explaining why we decided to study power influence. Uh, then I'm going to discuss which research has been done by us and which results we have obtained. And next, after our conclusion, I would like to make a concise review of one interesting paper which, um, which have great importance for our study also. So as we know, our according to modern cosmology, our HALA uh, was informed by and about through the continuous accretion of uh, satellite galaxies and destruction. And we can see some example of such accretion event as ongoing process of Sagittarius accretion. We can see examples of uh, echoes, echoes of past merger event like Gaia uh, sausage and salad, which happened more than or about 10 years ago. And then we can see also even the first fall beginning, beginnings of Magellanic streams. So, and we can also study our galactic color subs subsystems through the studying and investigating of debris of such a creation event like stellar streams, global clusters, stars, and satellites also, yeah. Second. So, and in the light of new research, in the light of new surveys like Gaia, Apogee, uh, Lamos, it becomes possible to have really accurate data of 6D space space position of objects. And it sparked great interest to study global, uh, I mean, to study uh, different dynamical substructure in our gala. And as a result, recently, uh, Malhan uh, conducted really extensive study of Mm. structure in our galactic halot, and they create a global dynamical atlas of Milky Way merger using ether tree based measurements of uh, streams which are indicated by points, global clusters, and satellite galaxies which are indicated by cubes. So I would like to leave in our consideration just uh, global clusters. So, and they wanted to find group that uh, have similar similar origin. And they used similar to Amina Helmi group approach to find, to find uh, clumps or over densities in the action space and in the role of motion space. And of course, taking into account chemistry. They used in link software. Uh, it's a density-based group finding algorithm, which detects uh, groups of any shapes in the multidimensional data sets. So in investigating action space and interval of motion space, uh, they found total of six group, which as they supposed have uh, specific origin or specific progenitor galaxy. Uh, they found six groups, but including two previously known groups, I mean, Sagittarius, Cetus, Gaia, Sausage, they found one U, which they called uh, Pontus. So, but all this approach assumes that galactic potential was setting during last billion year of evolution or evolved only adiabatically. It also means or assumes that uh, during accretion of satellites, uh, ang angles and angular momentum and energy are also conserved values. But we also know that our galactic is not static. Uh, during accretion, dynamical friction and uh, pedal interaction significantly change energy and momentum of satellites. It also affects on the global cluster which are es es escaping from uh, accreted uh, satellite galaxy. So, but even we don't consider what I have said just now. We also know that our uh, galactic halo is really radially biased. It means that a huge amount of objects have really big eccentricities close to one. And it also means that uh, such objects come close to the uh, galactic center, which is dominated by our galactic bar. So, and we assume that such object uh, will be significantly affected by power during their evolution. And 
And we just decided to check the idea that our bar can significantly change the angular momentum and energy of clusters. And it can be impossible to distinguish two separate accretion events if we uh, take into account bar. But we decided to study, I'm sorry, we decided to study, uh, to study combined influence of bar and observational errors to uh, test identification of just two uh, group of global cluster. I mean, Pontus and Gaia sausage, they have difference in the energy, but they have really similar metallicities, close apocentric and pericentric distances. So uh, here uh, you can see a list of our object. Pontus group consists of seven clusters, Gaia sausage 13. If we also include in our consideration uh, one tenth of the cluster, which was indicated by Malham like posi possible candidate for both two groups. And you can see here heliocentric parameters taking into account errors in parentheses. And to convert heliocentric distances to the galactocentric, we used uh, AstroPy potential, oh yeah, AstroPy software. So uh, to investigate power influence, influence uh, here you can see our coordinate system and uh, our orientation at the present time. So uh, uh, in our system, sun and bar rotates clockwise. And in our red, uh, right handed uh, frame, it means that sun velocity or angular momentum or angular momentum of progress motion have negative sign. And to approximate our bar, we used a rotating ellipsoid uh, model which can be, can be described by uh, equation one, which correspond to density distribution of ferro potential. Uh, in our study, we used only constant angular velocity of bar, and we take uh, bar semi-major and minor axis as five and two kiloparks from portal, and we also take bar mass from portal. And for comparison, we used two galactic models, first um, following by Mauhan, Axisymmetric potential of Macmillan. And second, for our study, we used Barrett potential, which is actually also uh, Macmillan potential, but we replaced vouch of Macmillan by our uh, previously described bar. And you can see here two, uh, you can see here rotation curves, red corresponds to Macmillan and series of our rotating mm, potential of this bar, uh, which correspond to different angle with respect to bar. And to build our potential models in the integrated orbit, we used GoPy software. OK, uh, here you can see initial position of clusters in, in the round of motion space, I mean, uh, angular momentum and energy space. Um, Asterix correspond to average position of cluster without taking into account the errors. And we have also 100 realization for each cluster, which I indicated by red points. Red color correspond to Gaia sausage group and Pontus color correspond to Pontus group. And the next step to integrate and to look uh, how bar effect on the position of angle, uh, angle, um, global cluster in the interval of motion space. By let's consider just uh, evolution of average position, I mean, which I indicated by asterisks. And you can hear, you can see here that mm, evolution of global clusters in the power potential, they, uh, during the evolution, all clusters moves along or slate along straight line with the same slope. It's connected with the fact that in the power potential, energy and momentum are not conserved, but instead of this, uh, conserved uh, interval, uh, interval of Jacobi. And it means if we assume constant uh, bar pattern speed, it means that our energy is linear function of uh, angular momentum. So, it, and that's why all clusters moves along or oscillate along a straight line with the same slope. But we can see here that some clusters from Pontus room can reach group of uh, Gaia sausage. And in some cases, it's also possible to change the direction of rotation and bar potential. So the next step 
Ah. Ah, to better understand what's going on exactly, let's consider evolution of just one cluster, in particular uh, cluster from uh, Gaia Sausage Group, M72. On the right side, we can see evolution of angular momentum and energy during four billion years, years of evolution forward in time. And we can see that this time energy is decreasing. Uh, angular momentum is also decreasing in absolute value. And the stepwise changes are connected to this time period when um, particle come close to the bar and pass through it, experiencing kicks in, in angular momentum and energy. And, but almost constant values correspond time periods when particles move far from bar and feels relative potential like something axisymmetric. Uh. So the next logical step to take into account uh, observational error, and let's look firstly taking into account observational error, but also for one uh, Goplo cluster. Uh, here you can see evolution of another Goplo cluster, which is which has a retrograde rotation and belongs to Pon uh, Pontus group. And here you can see evolution of angular momentum and energy, which have same to previous stepwise changes, but the nature looks like something another. Actually, this nature, oscillation nature, when uh, periods of increase in energy uh, are changed by periods of decrease, it can be also connected with uh, resonances. But in our study, we didn't consider possible periods of resonances, and we are going to make uh, extensive study further. But you can see that with the, during time, a uh, range, uh, range of energies and angular momentum for, if we take into account um, uh, observation error, the organization are indicated by gray color. We can see that uh, energy, spread of energies and angular momentum are going to be quite large. Uh, and the next, ah, ne in next look at, we can look at orbits of uh, this cluster, taking into account errors. Uh, average orbit are indicated by red and by red color and 100 polarization are indicated by gray color. First row, top row corresponds to Macmillan axisymmetric potential and bottom row correspond to power potential. And we can see that in the power potential, uh, bar significantly randomized orbit, destroy orbital boxes, and if you take into account errors, uh, it also lead to big increase of uh, apocentric distance. I mean, um, if you take into account uh, errors, apocentric reach to 70 kiloparsecs, 17 kiloparsecs instead of 12 kiloparsec in the Macmillan potential. So, and the next step to see joint effect of bar influence and observational errors for all object, I mean all realization, uh, taking into account errors. And to do this, we integrated all objects here during four billion, billion year forward in time. And we can see that uh, area which is indicated by red corris correspond, which correspond to all realization, which are till um, this area during the evolution overlaps or uh, area which correspond to Pontus group. And it becomes impossible to, to say that these two events or these two group have same history, different, different history. E to sum up our results, I would like to highlight uh, to highlight this, I mean, uh, it was shown that Milky Way bar is capable of uh, causing large changes in the angular momentum and energy. Uh, all parameters like apocentric distance, pericentric distance, and eccentricities, which are also used in the identification, identification analysis, are also uh, significantly changed by bar. Uh, if you take into account observational error uh, bar influence, uh, 
the position of closed groups becomes uh, indistinguishable for it becomes impossible to distinguish these two group like group that have a uh, different uh, origin and it also was shown by uh, was shown for couple of clusters which have really small enough uh, pericenter of distance and I also would like to mention one new paper in our paper we didn't consider different effects which can be connected with bar, I mean, bar decelerating and bar growth. And we don't consider also possible effects which can be connected with bar. But recently, you are more uh, conducted extensive study in which they, they, investigate, they investigated the bar decelerating bar influence on the uh, global cluster's dynamics. Uh, and they wanted to determine global cluster which is most likely to have been uh, affected by bar and how their orbit uh, has been changed by resonance trapping. And to search such global clusters, previously they developed analytical theory for isochron potential and in which all orbits frequencies can be written analytically. It's also a simple way to highlight resonances in angular momentum energy space. And you can see here all series of resonances which are correspond to equation six for different values L, integer number of LM. And then they simulated halo and halo and disk stars in the uh, ceremony Milky Way like potential to, found, to find the manifestation of some resonances. And in this paper, in this picture, you can see uh, all manifestation which can be connected with resonance. I mean, roughly horizontal reach. We can assay this reach with corrotation. Uh, next one corresponds to out of inference resonance. And there is also, there are also series of different resonance for both prograde and retrograde motion. Then they selected from observational data uh, global cluster, which are close to the, these ridges, and integrated their orbit in, in, the, in the bar potential with constant angular velocity. And we can see that all orbits are in consistence with uh, resonance ridges. In particular, you can see six orbit, one, two, three, four, five, six, which are clearly trapped in the bar resonance. So in the next step, uh, they integrated all these orbits in the decelerating bar. And you can see here two snapshots. Uh, this snapshot corresponds to present time when, uh, when bar pattern speed is about 35 uh, for two picture of angular momentum energy diagram and for pericentric and distance. And the second snapshot correspond to correspond to time after integration of clusters in decelerating, decelerating bar backward in the time. And as expected, there are more um, all their uh, clusters uh, was is transported from to the current position from position which have much lower energies, angular momentum and ready. And it also means, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, transported from places which have much lower energies and uh, ready, experiencing really huge changing in apocentric and pericentric distance. So, and their results also strengthen our results that are make really big importance if you try to study origin of cluster which have uh, same history. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, particularly important because now we go into cases where the um, bar changes. I mean, we've, we've done a lot, all of us in this room, uh, 
on bars which are have a, some properties and then we look at something else but the intention of what you're doing here is very important to see the evolution in the secular of course, I agree in particular yes. actually it was like foreground first land study it's actually my first paper in the dynamical area i mean yes i had a lot of project in, which was connected with chemical evolution I don't know, it, but it's yeah. yes. I have a plan to. I have a plan how to make extensive study. Yes. How to how to consider also action space and another space to make really good uh, paper. But it's like first brand study. Well, yes. I would say yes. Please do it, and I would say that you know whatever you do on secular revolution of this now is really very very useful. Thank, Thank you. you. Any, uh, yes. Uh, have you found wh where there is a distance? Okay. Uh, have you found if there is a distance that we can actually detect if they come from uh, the progenitors? Like now the ones that are close to the pericenter are become too chaotic because of the bar and the bulge. But is there some distance that we can actually search for them? I understand you. No, we didn't this analysis. I don't know in which pericenter distance bar influence is small. It's, it will be, uh, I'm going to do it, but it's, it's not done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anton, you have a question? No, you can change your mind. Yes, um, what is the smallest pericenter that you can have? I can say that our biggest spirit center was yes. like about four kilo the, small, smaller, the, the smallest. Really close to zero. Yeah. Because, you know, the inner Milky Way could have a secondary bar. So the perturbation, and it could, could be a probe of the inner part of the okay. Milky Way. Thank you. I, I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for this uh, nice work. I'm wondering if you explored for something like changing the pattern speed of the bar to see how this would affect, um, you know, th these kinds of results. Because of course, depending on where the the resonances are, this will these will be affected more. Have you did you check how this affects it, how it would be affected if you change the pattern speed of the bar? rather than having a decelerating bar, just checking different bar, ba bar uh, patterns. Uh, it can be described like it's connected to this law. I mean, this law. Wait. Actually, for, for possible pattern speed, I mean, from 30 to 50, uh, we can repeat this result that all group over, uh, this group overlaps each other. The main beauty was the secular part, and that's continuous. That's why I started with that here. Very nice talk, Roman. Uh, just a question. Those that are classified as retrograde are mainly those associated with the orbits around the Lagrangian point you have shown us at the end. The, the orbits that are classified as retrograde are mainly those that uh, are, are associated with the Lagrangian point uh, you have shown us at the end, or there are other kind of, what are the, the, these retrograde orbits that you say? You have several, how, how do you classify them as retrograde? Uh, which can be connected with uh, retrograde motion? Yes. Uh, we didn't consider right now, but I'm going to do it because it's, um, it's it looks like, out of limit resonance, but retrograde motion. I mean, it can be yeah. connected with, I'm sorry, one second. Yeah, I, exactly. I mean, it can be connected with something like this or this resonance. I'm not sure. Okay. They have uh, another coordinate system and their progress motion is positive and yeah. I have a re reverse position. But I mean, here it's a area of retrograde resonances. I suppose that it can be connected with this resonance or this. I don't really know now. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
thanks a lot for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I was curious if you checked, uh, so, so given that, let, considering our bar formed 8 billion years ago, did you check, uh, and then GSE uh, merged around, uh, I don't know, 9, 10 billion years ago, did, did you check uh, what would be the evolution of that system? Uh, because right now you're presenting here for 4 billion a year, but uh, would it be interesting to see that? Uh, yeah, I'm going what, to do it. Uh, yeah. What happens in 8 billion a year time? Uh, can we still identify these structures? Because we are identifying them now using this uh, uh, these machine learning methods that people are doing. But uh, but does your uh, your your idea that uh, they, uh, yeah, they are you mean affected I by... need to check this in link software to the bar simulation, yeah? I mean... No, no, I'm just saying that here you checked for 4 billion years of time. Yeah. But given, uh, considering that uh, GSE came along with these uh, globular clusters 19 billion years ago, our Milky Way had a bar formed at 8. Uh, how much would that affect, and then how does it match to what we are observing okay. now? Yeah, I understand. That. But uh, I didn't do it, but I'm going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, suggestions? No, if not, one more clap for everybody. Thank you. I know. Can I remove this? This thing shouldn't be here. It should be here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to how to eject this thing, but it's all written in Greek. <laughs> Okay. We're talking tomorrow. I think I can just remove this thing. <laughs> Did you guys go out <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
using the other ones? The, the Wait, the no, I'm so gonna use their. Okay. Okay. Ah, the mic, you mean? Uh, no, I'm gonna use the the ear one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Hello, hello. I have no idea how much time my talk will take. Uh, <laughs> when, when, is a, when is a long talk like this? Yeah, it's kind of wrecks the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So I have 81 slides. <laughs> if it's one minute per slide, one hour 20, then, yeah. then, then it's okay. Some slides are very good, some slides are not. Yeah. So. Twenty four. This one. I can give you this one. Are you the first one? Yeah. Okay. Let me open it. So. Can we move this thing maybe to the top? This one where this, this one is stays there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's okay. This is the main value. Okay, I think it's but working. They cannot see it on the PowerPoint. This is only this is your screen. You mean in Zoom? Yes. Yeah. Sorry? Sure. Albert. Albert, yeah. Okay, it's fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Your your USB stick. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank Panos and Mirella and all the local organizers and Andy and the Head House Foundation as well uh, for making this happen. Uh, I really love the format of the meeting, everybody giving talks, a small group of people. So it's a fantastic opportunity for us to learn with each other. So I think it's been really, uh, really great. Um, the title of my talk is, as you can read, State of the Art Observations of These Galaxies, which basically can mean everything and anything, right? But uh, I did my homework and I look at the poster. Uh, if I can change the slides. Yeah. So I look at the poster and I saw the title of the conference and it's the nature <laughs> and dynamics of structures observed in, galaxy, in galactic this, right? So it's the minimum I can do. So then I, I realize, okay, it's just about the nature and dynamics of structures in galactic this. So I'm not talking about everything that there is to know from observations of galaxies, but of course, I'm gonna try to give a, a broad overview on, the, on what observations tell us about the dynamics and the formation histories of the different stellar structures that we observe in, uh, in galactic disks. Uh, so this is more or less how this uh, talk is structured. I will have a, a 
short preamble, let's say, on, on the rich structure of these galaxies and with, with a few other important messages as well. Uh, then the, the main part of the talk is divided into two parts. So the first one is about the diversity of stellar structures again, but focusing on the central regions of this galaxy. So talking about bulges and, and bars. Um, and then towards the, the second part, I will be talking about uh, more recent work we've been doing uh, with Muse um, and JWST as well uh, on the bar driven evolution and, and building of uh, nuclear disks. Oops. <laughs> okay. Huh? No, it's all fine now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so about the rich structure in this galaxy. So I start by showing my favorite galaxy here, and you might be thinking that I'm crazy. Why is it picking this galaxy? There's nothing to see here. Um, but that, of course, depends on how you look at galaxies, right? So this is a two mass image, uh, which is great because it's a near infrared uh, wavelength. So you can see the bulk of the stellar population, you're not so much affected by dust effects, but the two mass is an all sky survey that is known for being very shallow. So actually what we are seeing here is just a brighter part of the galaxies. If you look at uh, other kinds of data, not even more modern data, but older data, you can see a little bit more uh, how the galaxy looks like. So this is in the optical, it's from the Carnegie Atlas of Galaxies, um, and is, is a photographic plate, but you can already make up the bar and the uh, inner ring surrounding the bar. You can even see the dust lanes uh, in, along the leading edges of the bar. And if you look carefully, you can see uh, some sort of spiral arms, it's structure uh, already outside um, uh, in the outer part of the galaxy. With more modern data, then you see um, this galaxy in, in full splendor and you can see um, again the bar and there is some Kind of kind of a separate structure uh, in the central region. You can you can make up the 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 spiral arms better. And this is a, this is again uh, optical, but from the Carnegie Galaxy Survey uh, of Louise Ho and collaborators. And you can also observe this galaxy uh, in the mid infrared. This is an S4G image, so 3.6 microns obtained with the Spitzer telescope. So this is really in the mid infrared. Uh, where you really see the bulk of the stellar population, and it's quite deep, and then you can start seeing um, that this region between the spiral arms and the, and the central region of the galaxy is not devoid of stars, but there, there is a faint underlying component there that is the disk that extends even beyond uh, the, the, the spiral arms. And of course, you can look at this galaxy with Hubble, and uh, if, you if you focus on this region and look at this, uh, image of Hubble, then you, it's like putting your glasses on uh, that we heard yesterday. Uh, you can see things a lot sharper um, and you can see the structure in the bar. You can see the dust lanes now very clear and you can see this, uh, this thing here that we will later on show that this is a, a rapidly rotating nuclear disk separate from the main stellar disk. So you, you, can, you can see a lot of different things um, using different data. So all of this, of course, um, it's just to say that the detecting this rich structure that we find in this galaxy depends strongly on, on the quality of the data, right? It depends on the depth of the data. So the sensitivity of your detector, the sensitivity of your instruments, the, the, the size of the, of the mirror of your telescope that's collecting all these photons, uh, and, and of course the total integration time, and ultimately this translates into the signal to noise ratio of your data, right? So that, that, that will make, um, the fainter parts of the galaxy more visible when you look at it. It depends, of course, on the wavelength range. So if you look in the UV and the optical, you're looking more at younger stellar populations, you have problems of dust absorption. Um, if you look in the near infrared, it's possibly the best uh, wavelength you, you can look at because you can see the older stellar populations. You're gonna miss the young stars. So if you're interested in young stars, you don't wanna look in the infrared, but you see the, the bulk of the galaxy uh, you can also look in the mid infrared where you have a, where I have a mixture of old stellar populations and, and heated dust. So the images of the S4G also have a lot of emission from dust that is processing the photons from stars and, and re-emitting uh, in, the, in the mid infrared. And of course, it will depend a lot on the spatial resolution and sampling of your data, right? So you, you, every, every image you, 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 you make uh, with astronomical observations, it has a point spread function. It's basically this Gaussian shape 
exact uh, way in which the light is spread from a point source. And, and of course, the, the, the full width half maximum of this uh, point spread function tells what's your spatial resolution. And there's another thing called spatial sampling, which is the pixel size of your data, right? So if you have um, small pixel sizes, you have a better spatial, spatial sampling uh, of the image, right? So all of this is very technical stuff and, and really does not, not related to the physics of galaxies, uh, but still, uh, the better the data, the deeper our understanding of galaxies, as I just show very schematically here with this uh, galaxy, right? So one important message here is to keep in mind how technological advances are key in astrophysics and how our understanding changes very fast when we uh, get better uh, facilities um, that can show the, the galaxies we, we love to work with. Uh, in a different light with much more information or in, and broader information as well, right? So as examples that I will show here is MUSE and JWST, which have been um, transformational in how we are uh, understanding. Um, uh, on the side of MUSE in particular, from the size I'm doing, nearby galaxies with very uh, wealth of data uh, and JWST, of course, looking at galaxies at the, at the high redshift. So, Astronomy is, is basically founded in, on, onto three pillars, right? Observation, theory, and instrumentation, right? So don't forget that instrumentation is very uh, important as well. So it's very important to um, keep track of what's coming up, uh, the new facilities, and be ready to use them as soon as they are online. Okay, uh, so still talking about the dive the rich structure in, in this galaxy. So this is uh, kind of a list of, of different stellar structures you can see um, in, in this galaxy. So you can see a disk, of course, and uh, normally you, you can see a thin and a thick disk depending on projection. Um, you often can have something that we can call a classical bulge. Um, you can also see uh, many galaxies are bar, as we have been discussing this week. Uh, part of the structure of the bar is the box peanut um, and, and the bar lens as well. So what is the bar lens? Um, so the bar lens is, uh, as I said, part of the bar. So this uh, has been a, a few works uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, where if you look in simulations, so for instance, this is a simulation where you have the bar face on and then uh, edge on, and you can see um, that you have a box peanut here in, uh, from, from the, out of the plane of the disk, uh, but also the, the bar is not super narrow. Uh, it has a narrow component, but in the center, it has a, a little bit like a broader component. Uh, this is what we call the bar lens, right? And this is basically part of the orbital structure uh, of, the bar, of the bar. So when the bar produces the box peanut growing out of the plane of the disk, it also grows out uh, in the plane of the disk, uh, it gets a little fatter in the center. And you can see this um, in, in real observations as well. Uh, and this is a schematic uh, of this, uh, what I'm talking about here. So if you have a galaxy edge on with a box peanut, uh, if you turn this galaxy face on, then the bar lens will be something like this, right? So it's this structure here. So the bar lens, the box peanut are part of the bar. And this is what I'm, what I'm highlighting here. You can have also spiral arms. You can have a nuclear disc. Uh, I'm gonna show later that this nuclear disc can develop its own nuclear bar, its own nuclear spiral arms. You can have also something called lenses that uh, not everyone here uh, will be familiar with. So just showing an example here, what, what is a lens? A lens is basically a thick ring and, 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 and this, is, this is one lens surrounding uh, the bar of uh, NGC 1291. So you can see the primary bar here. There's a nuclear bar here that I'm gonna show later on. Uh, and you have this fixed structure. Here's kind of a ring um, that, is, that is very thick. And, and, um, and yeah, is this structure here is called a lens. And some galaxies have this structure. In this galaxy also, you can see the outer ring, right? So this is uh, related to resonance, it's probably resonance is in the bar um, and, and is the outer ring, right? The inner ring will be um, surrounding the, the bar and the nuclear ring is within the bar, close to the nuclear disk. I'm gonna talk a lot about nuclear rings later. Right. 
and the nuclear ring already mentioned and the inner and the outer ring, there could be a stellar halo as well that is, of course, often difficult to, to find out because it is, um, it's faint, there's, there's not a lot of stars, and there could be a nuclear star cluster at the very center, right? So I might be forgetting something here, but I think this is pretty exhaustive list of all the things that um, we can um, find, all the different stellar structures that we can find in a disk galaxy. Uh, in red, I highlight those that are associated with the bar, and in blue, I'm, I'm highlighting those that are associating with the nuclear disk um, uh, in the center, and both the red and the blue ones were called at some point a pseudobulge, because they are in the center of the galaxy, but they are not kinematically hot, so they're kind of a different structure, and, and they were, so both of them are associated to pseudobulge, and in a minute, I will try to clarify a little bit the nomenclature and associate this to the physics of the different structures so, so that um, we have things clear in our minds. But the important point here also is that all these stellar structures hold clues to the physics of the formation and evolution of the galaxy. So we can learn from, from studying all these structures uh, about, um, we can learn something about the galaxies. So, we can have a look back at NGC 1433 and look at all these structures. If you just look at the image, I can clearly see that there is a disk. Um, is there a classical bulge? Well, I don't know, just by looking at the image, I, I don't know, right? So, you know, a classical bulge would be a kinematically hot uh, spheroid uh, in the center and without, uh, without kinematic information, I can tell. That's clearly a bar, for sure. That clearly spiral arms. A nuclear disk, well, someone could say, yes, there is a nuclear disk, I can see it here. Um, and fair enough, that's a, that's a good point. But, um, well, this question mark should be here, but okay. Um, to, to be absolutely sure that there is a nuclear disk, you want to measure the kinematics. You want to see if this thing is rotating uh, in, in the center, and you want to see if it's a nuclear disk that is separate somehow from the main disk, or is just the inner part of the main disk that you're seeing there, right? So you cannot really tell without kinematics. Um, a nuclear bar, well, I cannot see from this image, but we will, I will show another image where you can see it in the near infrared. Um, the nuclear spiral arms, not very clear. Lenses, I don't find any, but there are people who, 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 who said there is a lens here uh, in the outer parts. Uh, a nuclear ring, well, maybe. There is some kind of ring structure surrounding the, the nuclear disk, but it's also not very clear in this image alone. Uh, an inner ring for sure, this is the inner ring, right, surrounding the, um, the bar probably related to the co-rotation or other resonances in the bar. Uh, an outer ring, not really, there is a, what is called a pseudo outer ring because uh, the, the, this structure that you see um, in the outer part is basically the spiral arms that are almost closing and, and it's, then, then it's called a pseudo outer ring. I don't know if there's a stellar halo, but probably. And a nuclear star cluster, I cannot tell from this image, but I have data that shows otherwise that there is a nuclear star cluster right, right in, in, this, in this galaxy, right? So you can try to understand every galaxy you find by looking at this uh, stellar structures and try to uh, understand what's, what's the physics of, um, that lead to this uh, diverse uh, structure. So modern morphological classifications reflect this, uh, this complexity. This is the morphological classification of this galaxy. Uh, from, from Ron Buta et al. Uh, it's very detailed. Some people might say, well, this is like too much. Uh, but every, every code here has a, has a meaning that can be important depending on the, on the context that you're studying the galaxy. So this, this means that um, this is a pseudo outer ring with a specific shape that is elongated. It's not like circular ring. Uh, this, of course, means a barred spiral of morphological Hubble type A. So it's kind of uh, that the arms are not too, um, too um, unwound. Um, this R here means the inner ring. The P, which I realized when I was preparing the slides, is about this structure here, which Rombuta called a plume, which uh, is not really part of the spiral arm, um, but it's, it's a structure that is there um, for some reason, and 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 might might tell us 
something about this galaxy, but okay, we're not talking about plumes today. There is a bar lens, which is, you can see here, um, the, he says there is a nuclear lens. I don't know what he's talking about, but um, you know, there are things which you, you, you don't agree uh, completely, right? There's a nuclear bar, which I can see in another image as, as well, right? So this is just one example and it's not super important, but I just want to uh, illustrate uh, this uh, richness of structures and particularly because in some st studies, so for example, studies that are more of a statistical nature that you don't really look at the galaxies or studies at high redshift where the spatial resolution is poor and you cannot see all the structure. Um, this complexity is difficult to be incorporated in these studies, right? Because either you have too many galaxies that you cannot look in so much detail or you just don't have the detailed um, uh, data, right? But it must not be forgotten. Right. So when you when you look at galaxies at high redshift and you see mostly a blob with some other structures, don't forget that there can be a lot of different things uh, that, that is just you're not being able to see. And when you have statistical studies, it's also important to not uh, forget that um, there are many different aspects that that need to be considered that add to the complexity of galaxies. OK, so this was the preamble. Now let's talk about structures in the center regions of, of these galaxies. Um, so the classical picture of a disk galaxy is something like this galaxy here, which is M81. Uh, so you see uh, a disk with some spiral arms, and you see in the central region a kind of amorphous spheroid, maybe, uh, that uh, you know many, many people would call, uh, this is the bulge. I see a bulge and a disk and a spiral arms, that's it, right? So this is what people would call the, the, the classical bulge, right? What are the properties of the classical bulge? Um, well, in principle, it's called bulge because it grows out of the plane of the disk, which you cannot see in all uh, uh, galaxies because, of course, it depends on the inclination, but in principle, it's a spheroid, so it's, it's um, rounder in the vertical direction than the disk. It's, it's, it's not as flat as, as the disk. Um, it's more or less spheroidal. It's featureless, so it's just a ball of stars. There's no spiral arms or, or, or bars or rings. Uh, there's not a lot of, of dust or star formation, typically. And the key point here is that it's kinematically hot, right? So it's dynamically supported by the velocity dispersion of the stars rather than the, uh, the, the rotation of, of, the, of, the, of the star. But it does rotate. And this is a point that I'm going to stress uh, in, a, in a bit. And, how, how do you form this structure? So presumably you need violent events, right? Presumably you need uh, something that will be able to scramble the orbits, right? Because the orbits are a little bit scrambled. They are not very uh, circular and, and, and ordered. You need, you need some violent event that would do that. Uh, so it could be a merger or more recently, uh, the idea has come up that it could be what's called a, a coalescence of clumps. And this is another point that I'm going to stress uh, in a bit. So in the next few slides, I want to talk about the fact that bulges uh, are expected to rotate, even though they are dynamically hot, uh, but not as uh, not rotate as fast as this, but they have they have some rotation. And I'm going to talk about uh, also cl clump coalescence, because I think this these are concepts that um, we need to clarify uh, a little bit um, more. So to talk about the rotation, I need to talk about um, the shapes of spheroids. So stellar spheroids, which could be a classical bulge, can have three different types of shapes, can be oblate, prolate, or triaxial. So if you think about the three axes of, of space, uh, an oblate a spheroid would have A equals B larger than C, which would be this kind of structure here is more or less like a pumpkin uh, kind of thing, like. One, one kind of pumpkins, right? There are many different kinds of pumpkins, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so this would be called an oblate, sphere, ellipsoid, or spheroid. Um, and then you can have the prolate um, the spheroid, which will be uh, that the, the, the C axis, so this, in this direction here, it's, it's larger than A and B that are equal. So it will be something like a rugby ball 
which is this um, this figure here, right? And most of the cases, actually, you're gonna have something that is at least a little bit triaxial because, of course, it's very difficult to to do things in nature which are exactly equal. So if you if you if a different from b different from c, you have something uh, more or less triaxial, right? So an elliptical galaxy or a classical bulge can, in principle, have any one of these shapes, and um, it does not necessarily need to rotate to have any of these shapes, but I will show in a minute that they do rotate, uh, at least most of them. And when they do rotate, they basically rotate uh, in this direction. So the noblate rotator is rotating, uh, you know, the, the, the angular momentum vector is in, in this direction, right? Um, and in, in, uh, in the case of a prolate ellipsoid, it also rotates like this. Uh, there, the, there are some elliptical galaxies that rotate like this. Um, so there are prolate ellipsoids and triaxial would be something, something like that, right? So um, what, what some results have shown, so this is from Atlas 3D, this was done with the Saurum uh, integral field spectrograph, which, is, which was the state of the art before Muse came up. Um, and basically uh, they show that bulges um, and ellipticals, most of the ellipticals rotate, but the bulges rotate more than elliptical galaxies. And they do this by uh, employing this parameter here, which is lambda, uh, which is basically V over sigma, a little bit more fancy V over sigma. Uh, so V is the line of sight velocity of the star and sigma is the velocity dispersion of the stars. And they plot here uh, lambda as a function of the ellipticity of the galaxy. Uh, and then you have elliptical galaxies as solid points and uh, as zeros, which are disk galaxies, but with massive bulges uh, as, as the empty points. Um, and then basically, if you look only on this axis, you see that on average, uh, there is um, quite a bit of rotation in the, in the bulge dominated galaxies uh, and as compared to the elliptical galaxies that has less rotation, but many of them uh, rotate and some of them uh, show very little rotation, right? And uh, this magenta line here is uh, a, a theoretical construct, which basically where an edge-on oblate rotator will fall. So if you have an oblate rotator viewed edge-on, uh, this is the angular momentum it will show for a given ellipticity, okay? And um, in this plot, projection effects make a, a point move from this line to the left. So, for example, if you have a, an oblate rotator uh, that is uh, perfectly edge-on, it will follow on the line, but if it starts to become face-on, it will move in this direction. Uh, so, you to populate this area here. And the anisotropy, uh, which I'll explain in a minute what it is, move, moves points uh, towards this direction. So the anisotropy is basically the anisotropy on the velocity distribution of the stars. So you can have, uh, you have three axes, three orthogonal axes describing space. So you can have also three orthogonal axes describing um, velocities along this axis. And so the distribution of these velocities, uh, if they are all the same, uh, then you have a perfectly isotropic velocity ellipsoid. Uh, if they are different, then you have a degree of an isotropy. In essence, you can, you can look at the velocity dispersion in the different directions. It, if the velocity dispersion is different uh, in the different directions, then you have an isotropy. Uh, and you can measure this in these galaxies basically by measuring um, sigma z and sigma r. Um, and, and, and um, uh, putting them in this plot according to, to the anisotropy and, and the rotation that they show. So basically, uh, you can explain most of these points here by being oblate rotators that are seen in a face-on projection. So they move from this line and go towards this direction here. Okay, so let's see some examples of how they rotate really. So this, all these galaxies are sitting on the magenta line and they are um, growing in, 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 the, in the importance of the bulge. So this is like, a, these are disc dominated galaxies and these are more uh, bulge dominated galaxies. And so these maps are velocity maps. So th this, this is a stellar velocity in the middle column. This is velocity dispersion. And this is basically uh, the, the white light of the, of the galaxy. And um, what you can see is that there is rotation everywhere, even in the bulge dominated uh, systems. Right. 
you can see some ellipticals that rotate, but do rotate very slowly. So this is the uh, velocity field of the ellipticals. You can see uh, basically, uh, so yellow means they're rotating uh, in this direction and blue that the velocity is in this direction. So this means a rotation, right? So these are um, oblate rotators and these are ellipticals that are prolate rotators. So these um, ellipses here are the isophotes of, of the galaxy. So it's the shape of the galaxy. And you see that the galaxy is rotating uh, in this direction here, right? So this is red shifted, this is blue shifted because of Doppler shift. Uh, in the velocity, and this is this is how it rotates. So it's a prolate um, elliptical. So this is all of this is just uh, to make the point that um, um, bulges and ellipticals, most of them do rotate uh, nonetheless, but of course they are kinematically warmer, hotter than than a disk. And if you you might have noticed that I was putting bulges within. Uh, inverted commas everywhere here. And the reason is that because at, at, until this point, we are calling bulges basically everything that is not the disk. And is, this is not necessarily very useful, right? So if you plot radio profiles of uh, surface brightness or intensity of surface mass density of galaxies, if you have a disk, it's uh, normally uh, well described by an exponential. Uh, sometimes you need to have a, a broken exponential. So this is a type two uh, broken exponential where the, um, the outer part bends downward and then you can have the other way around the outer part bending upward. And um, this is a type three uh, disc. I won't have time to talk about uh, this kind of uh, structures why they show up, but the, basically um, at this point in these studies, everything that is above the inward extrapolation of the exponential profile of the disk towards the center is called a bulge. And basically this is the concept of, of the photometric bulge. So we don't know uh, if, it's a, if it's a box pinot or if it's a classical bulge or if it's a nuclear disk, right? Um, it's just basically the bulge there. And so it's the, it's the photometric bulge. So it, of course, if it's a box pinot is related to the bar, if it's a classical bulge is related to a different formation process. So, um, to understand this better, we need to, to classify these bulges in a more refined way. Uh, then about clump coalescence. Right? So what, what is this? How do you form a bulge without a merger, but with clump coalescence? So if you look at HST images already, um, we're showing uh, that galaxies at high redshift can, can often show a lot of clump structures in the disk. Um, and the idea came up that if the um, if these clumps lose angular momentum because of dynamical friction and, and and coalesce to the center, they can form a spheroid, a hot spheroid there, which would be the classical bulge. And even if they don't do this, just because they are there breaking the axisymmetric potential and because of dynamical friction and torques that they induce, they can induce the inflow of gas towards the center and build the structure there, right? Then there was a lot of discussion uh, in the groups that were working with this to try and understand if these uh, clumps are really very massive or are just like intense sites of star formation that appear very bright because they are in the rest frame UV or if they are really massive or they're really like made of stars that are not like just uh, very young stars. And JWST answered that. So these are, ah, by the way, this is a slide that's told from this conference here, which we organized a few years ago. And later on, you can see uh, all the talks um, are, are, are stored in this uh, website here. So you can find all the slides. There is a very rich uh, resource. So with the JWST, uh, this, this clumps uh, are shown as part of the disk again, uh, but they are shown, they are being observed now in the, in the rest frame infrared. So it means that they are really not just intense sites of star formation, but they are really made of, of um, uh, large amount of, of matter, right? A large amount of stellar matter. So they're, they, they are really important for the dynamics of the, of the galaxy. Okay, so 
Now let's talk about the second structure we can find in the center, right? We talked about the classical bulge. Now let's talk about the box peanut, which we already heard a lot uh, from Leah, from Paula Lopez, from others, from Panos as well. Um, and the box peanut is this structure in the center that you can see uh, often with, a, with an X shape, not always with an X shape, but often with an X shape. And we know, we, we talked about it already, but we know that this is basically the bar uh, seen um, at the projection. A definition of the box peanut, if you look at it, uh, if you think about it, it's also that it sticks out of the plane of the disc, shows a boxy or peanut-like morphology. It's usually featureless, uh, not a lot of substructure, uh, usually doesn't have um, sites of star formation, of dust obscuration. The dust that we see here is in the disc of the galaxy. Um, and it's kinematically colder than the classical bulge, right? It, it, has, uh, um, it is more supported by, by rotation than, than the velocity dispersion. And as I said, these are simply the inner parts of bars that, that buckle out of the disc plane. Um, Leah made a very nice demonstration of the buckling on, on um, one of us Monday. Uh, so basically the bar, the stars grow out from the plane of the disk in, into the box peanuts, right? And this was uh, shown by a number of studies um, in the early 2000s. And, and so this is from, uh, from a paper Lee and Martin Bureau. Basically these are n-body simulations and you can see the disk galaxy face on. And then you have two edge jump projections, right? Space has three dimension, so you can have two edge-on projections when you have a bar. Uh, you can have a bar seen side-on when you look from this direction, you look at the side of the bar, or you can look at the bar end-on when you look at this direction. Right? So these are the two different edge-on projections. This is side-on, and this is end-on when, you, when you're looking at the bar. And let's look at this intermediate bar case. You can see when the bar is here, if you have a side-on projection, you clearly see the formation of the box peanut. Compare this with a weak bar or just a single disc, um, it's clearly the, 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 the bar that buckles up uh, from the plane of the disc. And incidentally, if you look at the, at, at the bar end on, it looks a lot like a spheroid, right? It looks a lot like a classical bulge. And there could be many, many galaxies where um, morphologically, someone would say, yeah, there's a classical bulge in this galaxy and it's just like an end on bar, right? So this is the only way to, to differentiate uh, the two structures is, is, well, one of the ways that I can think of is, is with kinematics, right? And um, you, we can also try to figure out with kinematics if we can um, figure out if a face-on galaxy has a box peanut, right? Because a box peanut, I would only see in an edge-on projection, but maybe there is a way to figure out if I see a box peanut in a face-on projection. And in fact, you can do this with kinematics. And to talk about kinematics, I want to uh, briefly introduce uh, the main concepts because it's important, right? So to derive stellar kinematics, you need spectra, right? So you, you, you point your telescope with a spectrograph um, at the galaxy and you, you get a spectra, which is just these wiggly lines um, showing information on the, on, the, on, the, on the chemical abundance, for example, of of the stars, but also show information on the kinematics. Where is the kinematical information here? So basically every absorption line in a, in a spectrum is produced um, by um, an atom or a molecule in, in, this, in, the, in the atmosphere of the stars. Um, and if you have a single star, then, then you have a single velocity that you can measure with the Doppler shift for that, uh, for that line. And this will be a very single, very narrow line, right? But imagine that you have a collection of stars. Every star is moving at a different line of sight velocity. So every line of the different stars will follow a little bit uh, offset from the, from the central um, line of any other star and will create a broadening of the, of the absorption line. So you can see this happening in the uh, magnesium triplet uh, in the optical. And these are three spectra from the same galaxy, but um, at different radii. So this is uh, close to, to the outskirts of the galaxy in the disk region. And you can see three lines here, 
which is the magnesium triplet. And you can see that they are very narrow, but when you go towards the center where the velocity dispersion of the, of the stars uh, increase, this, these lines become broader and broader. You even don't see the two lines anymore when you are in the center of the galaxy. It's just because of the Doppler shift of the stars that are moving with much higher dispersion velocity, the lines get broader, right? And, and if you fit uh, um, these lines, you can measure the velocity dispersion by this broadening. You basically, if the stars are moving with a normal distribution, you have uh, a line of sight velocity distribution, which is more or less a Gaussian uh, that would um, fit the, um, the shapes of these uh, lines here and, and tell you uh, the velocity and the velocity dispersion of the of the stars, right? But uh, not always this um, distribution is is a perfect uh, Gaussian. So in fact, uh, there are uh, they never lo really look like a like a perfect Gaussian. So one common way to measure this difference from a Gaussian is using the Gauss-Hermit parameterization. So you basically uh, fit the line profile or the the distribution of velocities um, using this equation here, which is basically a Gaussian that depends on the velocity of the star, uh, the velocity dispersion of the of of the of all the stars as a, as a, as a set, and uh, the Gauss uh, the Hermit um, parameters that are higher order moments of the distribution. So basically. The first moment is the velocity, the second moment is uh, the velocity dispersion. And then there are two important moments that I want to highlight because I'm gonna talk about them later, which are H3 and H4. So H3 measures asymmetric deviations from a Gaussian. Uh, and, and you can see an example here, right? So this is a perfect Gaussian where, where H3 and H4 are zero. Uh, but if you go in this direction here or in the other direction here, in this direction you have negative values of H3 and you see that th this is a skewness of the distribution. So this is a um, asymmetric um, Gaussian but basically, right? And H4 means symmetric uh, deviation from the, from the, um, from a Gaussian. So uh, if you go towards the bottom here, you see uh, negative values of H4 mean uh, a, a flat topped distribution of velocities and um, a, a positive value of H4 means like a picky uh, Gaussian distribution. And why this is important? Well, first we, with regards to H3, when you see um, deviations like this, it can tell you uh, about the kind of orbits that you have in your system. So if you find a, a correlation between velocity and a H3, an anti-correlation between velocity and H3 is normally, uh, a, is, a, is, a, is consistent with circular orbits and I'll explain why. So think about this distribution here. So this is a negative value of H3. And if you have, if, you, if your stars are moving with a positive velocity, but you have a negative value of H3, it means that there is a, there is a there's a sharp drop after the maximum. And this will happen in case of circular orbits because the circular speed is the maximum speed that the star can have. So you're gonna have a lot of stars close to circular orbits, but you're not gonna have a, a tail towards larger velocities because they cannot get larger than the circular speed. So you have this big drop here, right? Uh, so this anti-correlation gives you a signature of uh, circular orbits. And H4 um, can mean different things as well, but um, an important aspect is when H4 is positive. If you look here, this is a positive H4, and it looks like you have actually two Gaussians sitting on top of each other. Um, so one Gaussian is broader than the other. So if you have two different structures sitting on top of each other, one with a large velocity dispersion, one with a with smaller velocity dispersion, then um, you, you see this kind of uh, profiles and it's gonna be a uh, positive H4. Okay, so all of this was to introduce uh, H3 and H4, but it's gonna be, it's going to be useful. So the first application we see here, remember I was asking, can we see a box peanut in a face on galaxy? Well, it turns out we can. Uh, so this is Muse data. Um, that we took as part of the timer project I will mention later, but I'm gonna show several plots like this. So uh, these are maps um, 
of, of kinematics, stellar kinematics that correspond to this region of the galaxy. So this is NGC 613, and this is the mu's field of view. So every pixel here, I can get one spectrum, and then I can get one velocity, one velocity dispersion, one H3, one H4, and this is what I am plotting here. So this is V, sigma, H3, and H4. We will talk about these maps later on, but just focus on H4 now. So you see that the bar is elongated in this direction here, and I see the minima of H4 um, uh, in, the, in the middle of the bar in the two directions from the center. And um, this is uh, a signature of, of the box peanut when you have uh, not an edge on galaxy. This was being shown with simulations, I think first by, by, by De Batista in 2005. Then uh, Jairo Mendes Abreu found uh, some, some um, observations where she found, he found the, the, the minima as well. And this we can see also clearly in this, uh, in this galaxy here. Okay, so now how about the nuclear disk? So this is the third component, right? Classical bulge, box peanut, uh, and nuclear disk. So the nuclear disk is basically this structure that is sitting here in the center. And um, let's go briefly to its properties. So it is as flat as, or almost as flat as the main galaxy disk. Uh, it normally may contain substructures such as nuclear bars, power arms, rings, etc. Uh, it can show signs of uh, dust obscuration, stellar populations, or ongoing star formation, but not always. So often nuclear disks will show younger population, dust, star formation, but not all of them do that. Uh, and cr crucially, they are kinematically uh, cold, right? So they're dynamically supported by rotation. And, and it's pretty clear now that they are built uh, via uh, gas inflow driven by the bar and Mattia, uh, who's sleeping now, uh, we'll, we'll, talk, <laughs> we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, so just very quickly, um, to not spoil too much the, the, the presentation from Mattia, but basically uh, we know that bars induce uh, tangential forces and shocks and remove angular momentum from the, from the gas. And, and this is the, uh, shown already uh, in 1992 from, from a paper from Leah where uh, you see this is the density of the gas and you see that the gas um, populates a region. So the bar is in this direction. The gas gets accumulated in the leading edges of the bar, loses angular momentum and funnels towards the center. And then this gas presumably will form uh, new stars there and, and form this rotating structure, stellar structure, which we call the nuclear disk. And I'm going back again to this image where you can clearly see uh, the dust lanes here along the leading edges of the bar linking to the nuclear disk where, you know, this gas is uh, forming uh, stars. And, and this is exactly as uh, producing the nuclear, nuclear disk. And this is very similar to what um, Leah found in, in her simulations in the 90s. The nuclear disk uh, is just a disk. So it can have its own bar, it can have its own rings, and it can have its own spiral arms. So in fact, we, we heard about nuclear bars already. So this is one of the nuclear bar galaxies in the timer sample. So you can see the main bar here. These are the isophoto contours from this 3.6 micron image. And then if I zoom in, uh, you can see that the nuclear bar is here, very clear within the nuclear disk. Uh, these are examples of nuclear disks with um, nuclear spiral arms and, and nuclear ring. So the nuclear ring we will see later is basically the outer edge of the nuclear disk where this gas is accumulating and forming stars. So normally the nuclear ring will be blue and start forming. Um, and they were actually um, discovered, let's say earlier than the nuclear disk because they are very bright because they are forming lots of stars. And a bit more about nuclear bars here. So uh, these are near infrared AO images of Hokai. Uh, and remember that NGC 1433, we couldn't see the nuclear bar in that optical image, but in this image here, uh, we can see the nuclear bar better. Uh, this is because it's really high resolution and in the near infrared. So we pierce through the dust and we can see the, the nuclear bar better. This is another uh, two, two examples. So as I said, the nuclear disk uh, is just another disk. It can have its own uh, bar and, and other structures. Uh, and in fact, the Milky Way also has a nuclear disk. It's unclear if it has a bar, 
um, but it clearly has a nuclear disk. And, and the dynamics of, nu of nuclear bars in nuclear disks seems to be self-similar to the dynamics of main bars uh, within main disks. And in fact, this is demonstrated by this um, paper here where we found a box peanut in a nuclear bar, right? It's not a main bar, it's a nuclear bar. So this is NGC 1291 again, you see the main bar is in this direction, the nuclear bar is here, and this is an H4 map. It's, very, it's a subtle effect, but it's very clear. So this is a profile of the H4, and you see these two minima here uh, that we claim are, uh, are the um, signature of the box peanut in, in that uh, nuclear bar. Okay, so just coming back to the photometric bulge concept a little bit, because, okay, now we have the three kinds of bulges, let's say. Uh, how do we differentiate them? The, the crucial um, information to differentiate them is really kinematics, right? Because um, the kinematics can tell you uh, about how, how hot or cold the, 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 the stellar system is. Uh, but a kind of a poor man's uh, technique is using the uh, photometry and basically when we fit the what is the, the photometric bulge using a CERSIC function it, I'm, sh I'm sure you you heard of it already uh, this is the CERSIC function and this uh, n here is the famous uh, CERSIC index the CERSIC index will dictate the, the the shape of the profile of the bulge and typically when you have a spheroid you have a, a high value of the CERSIC index and when you have a disk well, disks are exponential, right? So a nuclear disk will have uh, an exponential profile which corresponds to actually a CERSIC index of one. So if you have values of the CERSIC index close to one, uh, it's an exponential and call this um, a disk. The problem here is that the statistical and systematic errors are very significant when you fit the shapes of, of this profile. So, so using the CERSIC index can be very uncertain and it's better to use it in a statistical way rather than um, pinpointing galaxy by galaxy, really, uh, what, what, um, what, the, what kind of bulge you have there, that you, you really want inf kinematical information to, to be sure about what you're talking about there. And if you think this was complex, well, we are not over yet because galaxies can have composite bulges. So it means that all these kind of bulges can be together in the same galaxy. You can have a classical bulge, you can have a bar with a box peanut, and this bar can push gas through the center and you form a nuclear disk there, right? So this is an example from the Gecko survey. This is a, a survey with MUSE um, ongoing uh, of edge-on galaxies only. So this is a, a, an image in the infrared of, the, of this edge-on galaxy. You can already see in the image that, that appears to be, to be a nuclear disk here. Uh, and you can also see that it's quite a boxy structure in the center. So you can see the boxy uh, isophotes. And if I do a modeling of the galaxy and subtract the model, I can see the X shape also uh, in the center. So this clearly has a bar and has a box peanut. And if you don't believe this is a nuclear disk, when you take the, the map of stellar velocity, you see the nuclear disk very clear here. Uh, rapidly rotating uh, uh, in the center. So this galaxy has a bar, a box peanut, and a nuclear disk. No sign of a classical bulge, but uh, it has a nuclear disk there. And this is a bit more uh, intricate, so, but I'm not going to focus too much on this. It's another example where they claim to find a small classical bulge within a nuclear disk. So basically, uh, they they do a bulge this decomposition. This is the photometric bulge. However, they, they decompose the photometric bulge alone, and they, they find uh, another disk uh, and, an, and, and, uh, and a small classical bulge here. So the photometric bulge is consistent of, of two different kinds of bulges, the nuclear disk and the classical bulge. And of course, they go to kinematics again, and they find this V over sigma as a function of radius. They find that this, this structure in the center is hot, so it's consistent with this uh, profile here. The, the caveat uh, for this kind of, of work is, actually is, is that this, nucle this uh, classical bulges are very small. So we're talking about tens of parsecs. So it's unclear if they're really, uh, we should call them a classical bulge or it's just a big nuclear star cluster uh, in the center of the galaxy. Right? The Milky Way has a composite bulge, 
right? The Milky Way has a bar. We've seen this uh, already. It has a box peanut that, that sometimes we call the bulge, uh, but it's the box peanut. Uh, sometimes it's called the bar bulge, uh, but basically this is, uh, the, this is the Milky Way uh, box peanut that you can see in, a, in an enhanced image right here. And it also has a nuclear disk. This is the nuclear disk of the, of the Milky Way. So the Milky Way also has a, a composite bulge. Okay, so I said that, uh, that I was going to try to clarify this mass with the nomenclature and more importantly, bring back the physics into the, this, this story, right? So you can kind of think of all of this in, this, in the following way. So we, are, we, we started with classical bulge, classical bulge, the uh, concept of classical bulges um, that was the only thing or the prevalent thing until, I don't know, the 70s maybe. Uh, and then around the 80s, um, there has been papers talking about bulges that were structures that coming out of the plane of the disk, but they rotating a little bit too much. So let's call them pseudo bulges. So that's what, uh, what was done. Um, there's a lot of um, discussion on whether or not this was a clever thing to do, but it doesn't matter. This is what was done. And this was basically all this work from the 80s until the early 2000s were kind of like um, amalgamated in, in this famous review paper, Corman and Kennicutt. Uh, but there was an issue here, of course, because as we see, uh, there are three kinds of bulges, not just two kinds of bulges. So the pseudo bulges were associated to both box peanuts but also to the, um, the nuclear disks, right? So Leah has a paper in 2005 where she proposes the separation uh, into, a, into two more categories. So, so clearly separating the, phys the, di the different physical structures, right? One is the box peanut and the other is what uh, um, you call disk-like bulge, right? Um, and then, uh, this, this has been used uh, quite often and, 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 and astronomers are very creative. So they, they started talking uh, about variations of the nomenclature. So disky bulges, disk-like pseudo bulges, they created a lot of different nomenclature to add to the confusion. But what I think it's very clear now and, and, and um, uh, you know, after 20 years later, we can clearly see that basically what we are talking is about classical bulges, bars and nuclear disks, right? Um, we don't even have to use the word pseudo bulge anymore. Um, and and the, the clear aspect that separate them is the, is the kinematics, uh, uh, the classical bulge are kinematically hot, both nuclear disks and, and, and bars are, are kinematically colder. Of course, bars have elongated X1 orbits and nuclear disks have more close to circular um, uh, orbits, right? So the, the, one of the main messages here is that know what you're talking about when you're talking about the central regions of these galaxies, right? So uh, you can use different nomenclature, but I would suggest you stick to this, but it's fine. Everyone has the personal preferences, but at least know what you're talking about, right? Classical bulges are kinematically hot, probably formed by, by uh, violent processes. Box peanuts are just the bars seeing at a different projection and nuclear disks are formed via the gas inflow of bars um, towards the center and forming a, a new rotating stellar structure in the center of the galaxy. So it's important that this is very clear regardless of the, of the nomenclature you, you use. So just coming back very quickly to this list. So what we talked about uh, was the classical bulge, the bar plus box peanut plus bar lens and everything that can be associated to the nuclear disk, the nuclear disk, nuclear bar, nuclear spiral arms, that could be lenses in the nuclear disk and, and, and the nuclear ring, right? Okay, so I've been talking for one hour. <clears throat> it's been, uh, it's very hot and it's after lunch and it's the third day of the, of the conference. So we're gonna have a mini break now, one minute break. I want everyone to stand up. Right, so uh, Matia, are you awake? Yes. Okay, so take a deep breath. Exhale slowly, all right, good. Now we're gonna make a stretch, right? We're gonna do an X1 orbit, right? And now the bar buckles, so we're gonna do a banana orbit to the front. 
a banana orbit to the back. <laughs> and an X shape. All right, good. Now you can sit down. <laughs> I'm not over yet. I'm not done yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, another half an hour. Uh, bear with me. Um, no, probably less. Let's see. Let's talk a little bit about bar-driven evolution and the building of nuclear disks. Then we talked about, about this already, but um, just go a little bit in more detail. So this uh, we've done uh, with, the, with the timer project, which is a survey with MUSE on the VOT um, of uh, 20. We, we applied for 24 galaxies, but we got 21, 21 nearby barred galaxies. Um, and uh, the, the main idea was already described by Camila on Monday is basically, so this is one of the timer galaxies. And if you look on the left, uh, the isophoto contours show clearly a, a bar and, and, a, and a kind of a structure in the center here. When we look at the velocity, the, the view over sigma map of this uh, field here, we can clearly see a rapidly rotating structure um, in the center, right? So this is the nuclear disk. And this is a stellar age map of this uh, structure. And you see that it's very, very old. And if the nuclear disk is built by the bar, then the oldest star in the nuclear disks will tell us uh, a good estimate for the age of the bar, right? Because the bar forms, normally it quickly pushes gas towards the center. The, for, the first stars that are forming there will tell you the age of the bar. And this is what we've done in this pilot study for this galaxy, which, which was relatively easy to do because there's, there's almost no star formation. All the stars are very old in the center. So it's a, it, it, we dated this bar to be about 10 giga years old, which would be a, a bar formation epoch at, at around redshift two, right? Uh, so this is uh, what we've done in this paper. And then of course we wanted to get more bar ages and this is what we heard from Camila before. Um, so these are two examples of galaxies in our sample. These are reconstructed images from the Muse field of view. So if you look at the Muse field of view here and here, these are the reconstructed images. I can also create from the Muse data color maps, which is basically just uh, telling me um, in, in, this, in this representation, dark shades represent red colors and, and white shade represents blue, col blue colors. And uh, basically what we can see here are the dust lanes coming along the leading edges of the bar and connecting to a very blue structure uh, in the center, which is, uh, turns out to be the nuclear disk. Right. How do we know it's a nuclear disk? Well, we have spectra, so we produce uh, maps of V over sigma for the stars, so you can see clearly uh, a kinematically cold structure in the center, rotating very rapidly in this nuclear disk. Uh, and this we found for almost all of our galaxies, so you can see nuclear disks everywhere. Uh, and one thing that uh, struck us there was uh, oh, something happened with this uh, slide. Um, but anyway, so you can also look at the at the these nuclear disks, the properties of the nuclear disks as a, as a population. So this is to be seen uh, sideways. So this is a distribution of V over sigma for the for these structures, and uh, they all have um, V over sigma above one. Um, which means they are rotationally supported as expected, but they are not super, super cold. They are not as cold as the main galaxy disk, which have V over sigma around 10, right? Uh, but, but this is normal because of course, of course we are in the center of the galaxy, the center of the, of, the, of the gravitational potential. So the relaxation time is shorter. Everything is a little bit warmer there, right? Um, so they are kind of like thick disks, let's say. And this is the distribution of their sizes. So it goes from around 200 parsecs to, to a kiloparsec. Uh, this dashed line here is where the simulations from Cole et al. that simulated the formation of a nuclear disk. Uh, they have one case, uh, I believe, um, where they find a nuclear disk that is one kiloparsec long, uh, long uh, in radius and has this value of over sigma. So matching well the distributions of values that we, we got. Uh, whoa, all my slides are flipped for some reason. Um, okay, 
I'm going to have to describe what it is here. So basically, we found a correlation between the bar size and the nuclear disk size. And we found other correlations between the, the, the nuclear disk size and other bar properties. So all of this um, indicating that really the nuclear disk was formed by the bar. Because you can think of other ways of forming a nuclear disk, right? You can have um, an interaction between two galaxies removing angular momentum from the gas around these galaxies or in the, in, the, in the disk of these galaxies. And you can have transfer of gas um, towards the center that is completely disconnected with a bar. It's just that you form the nuclear disk because of this uh, in interaction. Uh, but at least for the timer galaxies, uh, we see this correlation between bar properties and nuclear disk properties that you wouldn't see uh, if they were formed via the interaction. So they're clearly formed uh, by the bar. So we also see that the nuclear disk extends to about 10% of the bar length. And then there was an interesting plot to show, but it's all messed up now. But basically, the simulation of Cole et al. produces a nuclear disk that is three times too large compared to our observations. Right. So we find that the nuclear disk is about 10% of the bar length, but they find a, a nuclear disk that is 30% of the bar length. So, uh, there is something that needs to be understood from, from a theoretical point of view, on, from the simulation point of view, how to produce these nuclear disks that match the, 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 the sizes that we measure. Um, okay. So just in this slide, what, I, what I'm trying to show is, uh, is coming back to the idea of the photometric bulge, right? So now I know that this this structures in the center are rapidly rotating nuclear disks. Do they have exponential profiles? And the answer is yes. So I, if you fit a Sarsic function to the luminosity profile of these uh, structures, you find that they have uh, exponential profiles uh, as, as you would expect, right? And, and here basically is a distribution of the ratio between the size of the nuclear disks that I measure with kinematics and the size of the nuclear disk that I measure with, with the photometric decomposition. And they basically they follow a normal distribution uh, where the, um, the sigma of the distribution is basically the same size of the uncertainty in the measurement. So, so this is just to show that they are the same thing, right? The, the exponential low Sarsic index photometric bulges that we find in the compositions are, are nuclear disks. Uh, so this is just to highlight again Camila's work and another important aspect that Zoe is going to talk about tomorrow, I think, uh, is that we are finding all these bars at, 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 um, that are old uh, archaeologically, right, in the, with timer with the nearby galaxies, and they, they match formation times that are the same as what we see with JWST bars that Zoe, are going to show, Zoe is going to show tomorrow. Okay, um, just very quickly about the stellar population properties of these nuclear disks. So these are maps from the MUSE data of uh, stellar age, metallicity, and uh, alpha over iron. So we see that these nuclear disks are young compared to the, to the surroundings. They are more metal rich compared to the surroundings, and they are more alpha poor compared to the surroundings. So this is all consistent with the idea that they are formed after the, the galaxy is there, the bar develops, pushes gas to the center, uh, and forms stars with enriched material, uh, and and of course it's going to be younger than than the stars in the bar. I'm going to go. We're going to skip this. This is basically the same information, but in in radio profiles. Yeah. So one thing that struck us uh, uh, about the results in the timer sample is that we didn't see any galaxy, perhaps one, uh, where we clearly see a classical bulge. All these galaxies have nuclear disks. Uh, so we didn't see any map which you show like a, lo a slow rotation, like the ellipticals, uh, and with a high velocity dispersion, resulting in V over sigma below one, for example. Right? So this was uh, a bit intriguing. And of course, the timer sample is a biased sample. Of course, we selected galaxies to be barred, uh, but we didn't select uh, galaxies to not have classical bulges. So it's not biased against classical bulges. And in principle, uh, nothing prevents a galaxy to have a bar and a classical bulge. So 
this this result is is uh, somewhat intriguing, right? Where where are all the classical bulbs? And other uh, surveys, ongoing surveys of nearby galaxies are are also not finding um, a lot of classical bulges in, in, in these massive galaxies where you expect uh, to find at least a few, right? Uh, so this is, um, this is a problem that uh, Camila, Francesca, myself, and others are, are working on and, and trying to get more MUSE data to, to answer this question, where, where are the classical bulges? And a, and a connected point to this may be related um, to the mass size relations of ellipticals and classical bulges. So one of the pictures of the classical bulges that we discuss is that they're kind of like a mini elliptical, right? In the center of these galaxies, right? But uh, if you plot <clears throat> the mass size relation for ellipticals in red and classical bulges in green, they are different, right? So as, as the elliptical galaxy grows in mass, they becomes bigger much faster than a classical bulge. And this is a five sigma result. This was done with a, 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 a sample of a thousand galaxies. Um, and so if you, take, if you take one of these ellipticals, so at least in the, in the, in the high mass end, that you see this discrepancy, maybe at the low mass end, they can uh, join, but at the high mass end, if you take an elliptical here and put a disc around it, you don't end up with a classical bulge that is realistic, right? Because the classical bulges are here. Okay, so there is, there is a, a, a size difference between the, the classical bulge and the, and the elliptical galaxy for the same mass, right? So they don't, say, they don't show the same size for the same mass. Um, so this could be related to the fact that maybe classical bulges are not mini ellipticals uh, and, and maybe the way we are trying to find classical bulges is a bit um, um, unfounded. Uh, so a few years after I published this result, which has been confirmed by, by, by others, then um, Victor de Batista tried to explain this uh, with a contraction of the bulge. So imagine that um, if, he, if the bulge is formed like an elliptical, when the disk grows around it, the potential becomes deeper, and then this contracts the, the bulge and make the bulge uh, smaller. And he finds, uh, so this is more or less the same plot I was showing before, but a, a different parameterization. So these are the uh, elliptical galaxies and these are the classical bulges. And he finds that with this contraction, he can move uh, points from this side to this side, but you require a, a disk that is 20 times more massive than the bulge. Uh, which is not what I have in, in, in the observation. So this contraction, at least in these simulations, uh, does not explain this uh, discrepancy. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part here. And I'm just gonna move to um, a little bit about the gas uh, that I haven't uh, talked about. Um, so, the nuclear disks, many of them are forming lots of stars, as I mentioned before. And um, we found two cases, this is NGC 1097, this is NGC 3351, where the, the, the star formation is so violent that you, you can see uh, effects of uh, stellar feedback. So if you look in this image here in red, this is age alpha um, emission, uh, which is produced by the star bursting uh, nuclear um, Ring, so it's basically bubbles of warm gas moving out from the star bursting nuclear ring, which is at the edge of the nuclear disk, uh, forming lots of stars. In blue is molecular uh, gas uh, from a ALMA data, um, and we can see something not as spectacular, but you can see also this is age alpha. You can see these bubbles of age alpha of warm gas being uh, pushed by, by hot stars in the nuclear ring. Um, and then we examine more carefully this case here because we also had ALMA data. And basically this is a velocity map of age alpha after we model the circular velocity of the galaxy. So basically we, we are removing the gravitational component of the velocity of the gas and just looking at what the gas is doing because of the stellar feedback. And what you are seeing is that it, it's expanding from the center where the nuclear ring is, which is this ellipse here, uh, at 70 kilometers per second. So this is being blown away by the, by the nuclear ring. And what we see also is that it is uh, clashing with the molecular gas 
there is um, in the in the bar. So this is a age alpha velocity map, and this is the velocity dispersion. So you see that the velocity dispersion of the gas, in, of the warm gas, increases in the interface when it's reaching the, the molecular gas. So it's clearly shocking with the molecular gas. And we see also that the molecular gas itself, uh, so there's a velocity field and velocity dispersion. The velocity dispersion is also increasing um, in, in, the, in, the, in the molecular gas that is being shocked with the warm gas. And this jumping velocity is also a, a signature of this. Um, right, yeah, so basically just to, to show the kind of, um, uh, of effects that you can have because of starbursting nuclear rings in, uh, in barred galaxies, and basically this is the stellar feedback that kind of controls a little bit the inflow of gas um, as, as, you know, we've been, that has been discussed in, in, in other works as well. Um, I'm just going to skip a little bit about um, these slides, but I'm almost there. So this is just to mention a work uh, by uh, Luisa Silva Lima in Brazil, who is looking at uh, NGC 613 again. Uh, and we are, um, he, he developed a very clever algorithm to study the emission lines of the, of the gas uh, in, in the timer galaxies, which can be very complex. So this is actually, this slide that I cannot skip. So if you look at emission lines of galaxies which, which, which have uh, stellar or, or AGN feedback, the emission lines will, you cannot fit them with a simple Gaussian, right? They have shapes that require multiple components. So basically this is what his algorithm does in a clever way, uh, to try to be as physically motivated as possible. And um, there are two main, two or three main results we have so far. The first is that we, you, you can look at lines uh, low ionization lines or lines that require less energy to be produced, uh, which would be, for example, this, this line here, which uh, this is the, the, the intensity map. So this is where this line is being produced and it show more or less the same morphology as the galaxy itself. But when you look at, at high ionization lines, you see the outflow from an AGN uh, very, very clear. Right. And when you look at age alpha, which is a bit intermediate, you see the sites of star formation, you see the the star bursting nuclear disk here and a star formation um, actually along the bar as, as it turns out. And um, he can plot the, uh, the intensity of the different components from the Gaussian decomposition. And we, the, the key aspect here is that we can separate the, the components that are of the kinematics that is produced by the AGN outflow from the rest of the, of the physics that is happening there. And the, the final interesting result is this one. So this is NGC 613 again. This is an extinction map. So the bar is elongated in this direction. And you can see here the leading edges of the bar where the dust lanes are. So this, this is a lot of dust. That's why it's yellow here. So this is the, where most of the dust is. And then when you look at the velocity of the gas, after you subtract a model for the circular velocity, you see uh, a big jump in velocity in the dust lane, uh, accompanied with uh, elevated velocity dispersion, which are exactly the shocks that were predicted in the hydrodynamical simulations that would happen where, when the gas is um, um, shocking in, in the dust lane, losing angular momentum and going towards the center. And in fact, if you see here, you have uh, red colors in this dust lane, and here you have blue colors in this dust lane. This is the blue shifted and red shifted um, velocity of the gas. It's basically the inflow of the gas along uh, the, the, the leading edges of the bar, along the bar lanes towards the, the central region of the galaxy. And one interesting thing we found is that if you look at the age alpha uh, image, we have star formation going on just after the shocks. Uh, so it looks like the gas, part of the gas will shock, look, lose angular momentum and go towards the central region where part of it will also form stars just after it, it, it crosses the shock region, which is interesting uh, to think in the context of um, gas kinematics in bars because there are two things that happens in bars 
concerning the gas kinematics is not only shocks, but also shear, um, which basically is the difference in the, velocity, the inflow velocity of the gas along the dust lane, right? So along the dust lane, you're gonna have gas that is moving at different speeds. And what we, this will do to the molecular clouds is to disrupt the molecular clouds. And, and then this will prevent star formation, right? So this is a process that in theory is well understood, but uh, the connection with observations is still a little bit um, um, well, not, not as strong as one would like, like it to have. And it will be interesting to understand, for example, in this case where we see star formation um, in the dust lane, why, why the shear is not enough to prevent star formation here, but why it is enough in other galaxies. So there is this paper uh, by Justus Neumann in 2019, where he looks at uh, uh, bars in the context of star formation. So he finds some bars that form stars along the bar, some farms that don't, that some bars that don't form stars along the bar. And, and we're trying to understand why uh, this is happening. And from a theoretical point of view, um, we understand the processes, but why sometimes they are important, sometimes they are not, is, is not well understood. Okay, <clears throat> we made it. Um, I have two slides of take home messages, just very quickly. The general one is, uh, know what you're talking about when you're talking about the center structures in these galaxies. Uh, remember the MUSE and JWST and other facilities that are coming uh, can be game changers in, in improving our understanding of galaxies. So keep, keep an eye on them. And more specifically, um, we are seeing bar driven evolution since Redshift 2 and beyond. This, this was shown archeologically uh, from the timer data and uh, from Zoe's paper that she'll show tomorrow and, and others that are working at JWST directly at bar galaxies at high redshifts. The bar built nuclear disks uh, show uh, negative age and metallicity gradients and are, seem to be built inside out from the gas driven uh, towards the center by the bar. And feedback from star forming nuclear rings impacts the code phase of the, of the ISM. And this is where I stop. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, question there. I think he needs a mic. Well, Dimitri, thank you for the stretching part. It was very revealing and it was a nice talk. So I have like two very simple questions. Do you observe uh, counter-rotating nuclear disks? Not in timer. Um, there are other studies that um, have looked at nuclear disks in elliptical galaxies, right? where they can find uh, counter-rotating or uh, even a case of a polar nuclear disk. So these nuclear disks are not built by bars, uh, right? You, you wouldn't expect them to be built by bars if they have this such, such a kinematical disturbance, right? They are probably built by accretion, yeah. Uh, and the second one, uh, maybe a little bit confused. So we you talk about uh, nuclear disks, but we see like a ring in the star formation. Is it the same? So what, what, um, what we have seen is that uh, in galaxies where you see the nuclear disk and the nuclear ring, the nuclear ring is just the outer edge of the nuclear disk where the, the stars are being formed right now. And in some galaxies, you don't see a nuclear ring because th there's no gas. You just see the nuclear disk, so there's no gas, there's no star formation, there's no nuclear ring. Thank you very much for all that you have shown us, Dimitri. Uh, somehow related to the previous question, uh, it would be very interesting if we could somehow compare the extent of the nuclear disk with what could be the extent of the H2 region of the main bar. If they are systematically smaller, so inside it, bigger or about that size, if there is such, such a trend. The, the H2? Which? The H, the, the X2. Ah, the X2. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the yeah, X2. yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Uh, this, yeah, I haven't done, I haven't, I don't know the X2 orbits of these galaxies uh, because we haven't done the modeling, but in one of the plots that I showed, but it was messed up, um, what we plotted was the size of the, the size of the nuclear disk as a function of the ellipticity of the bar. So, uh, 
basically we find that the nuclear disk is always confined within the, the, the lateral edges of the bar. Okay. So it, it, it doesn't extend beyond the bar. It's part of the... Yeah. <laughs> families. Let's forget X1. We go to X2 and X3. They are like a long thing, one side of which goes to the CD space. Okay, now this thing has too elongated for anything I've seen, and I've seen lots of them, because nuclear discs. And it is also bigger than what one expects. So I wouldn't bet a penny on for X3. For X3 X3 has the same, uh, well, uh, it's a little bit more elongated than uh, X2 usually, but the point is that when you look at the gas, this uh, setup is deformed, and then it takes smaller sizes, and the person hydrodynamical parameters, as we will hear tomorrow, but uh, so that's why it is a little bit tricky to define this X2 region. Yeah, 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 yeah. This we never encounter. We don't see a very elongated uh, to to have it uh, to be outside of the main bar. That's what I'm. Uh, no, 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 exactly. No. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Of the outer of the main bar. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. And what I'm saying is that in, if you look at the gas, always this area shrinks smaller radii. You never get a very elongated uh, 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 gases ring, let's say, of young uh, forming rings that is very elongated. Usually, always they become rounder and not rounder. So, so the nuclear disk that, instance, that I we have are... a very a specific example. If you look at 1097, a very typical example, well, whatever, it's one of the standard grand design. Yeah, okay. So if you find this kind of uh, orbits, if you try to run a response model under the same potential, you see it, which is deformed to smaller scales. And in the real galaxy, it is the area there you have a nuclear ring which is almost circular. So, so you, maybe, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But uh, actually it would be nice to look at the near infrared images so that we go closer to that. Yeah. So I, yeah. Um. Uh, sorry. Um, so Panos first said, no, 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 no. I uh, <laughs> regarding Panos' question, um, the the nuclear disk is uh, smaller than the X two orbits usually, exactly because of what you said, because of the gas. So the gas is smaller. And so the nuclear disk is born from the stars in the gas and is also smaller. And we can check this observation for the Milky Way, because for the Milky Way, we know the potential well enough to say the X2 orbit should extend at least to, you know, 400, 500 parsecs from the center, but the, uh, the nuclear disk is, uh, is smaller than that, is uh, 100, 150 parsecs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but just 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 to summarize a little bit, I I, think, I know you have another question, right? But just to summarize a little bit, in in timer, the the the, the nuclear disks are always within the perpendicular direction of the bar, right? So they are not they are not they are not wider than the bar ever. So they are they're confined in the region where the X two orbits are. Yeah. I just had two comments on your presentation. One, at some point you asked uh, while I was sleeping. Uh, <laughs> The simulations of uh, Cole et al. that they show the two big nuclear disks. I think I know why. It's because the resolution is too low. They don't resolve the waves uh, that make the nuclear disk shrink. So if, I think if you rerun the same simulations, but higher resolution, you would find uh, uh, smaller. Yeah, but there is also simulations from Kim also, I think, where higher resolution, and they also find uh, 
uh, not a Yum is a, is another Kim. Uh, they also have. Well, they they also find. Uh, I can I can point to the paper later. I don't know by heart, but they also find uh, this this offset. Um, okay. Well. So at at one point we discussed this last year, and you said maybe this is sound speed. Yes, maybe. Okay. But anyway, I think. And my last comment was about the, the shear, because when talking about bars, everybody mentions the shear, um, but I think there are two. So if you look at the stress shear tensor, it's called stress shear, because so shear is when you have two layers of gas, one that are moving parallel to each other at different velocities. Yeah. Okay. But then you have also, you can have also compression and, and the, the opposite of compression, like the stretching, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, when the gas is falling down the bar lane, it's experiencing both shear and decompression because it starts from the upper center where all the clouds are close together, and then it goes to the, uh, to the uh, uh, pericenter. In doing that, it, it kind of stretches out, stretches out. And so I think this also uh, is a factor that uh, prevents star prevents formation. Star formation. Right, right. But this factor is not present when you get very close, because once it enters the ring, then it's not being decompressed again. Actually, it's the opposite it's being mm -hmm. compressed. Mm -hmm. So, but, the, but then the question is, how do you explain in the industry 613 where you, you could see star formation just, just after the dust lane, almost on top of the dust lane? So, because maybe it's where the stars, the, the gas is starting being compressed. It's being, it starts yeah. to be slow down because it's a problem. So, even with shear, but because of the compression, will form stars. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the correct explanation, but right. I'm just saying. Could be. Uh, no, don't think on in terms of shear, think, think also in terms of yeah. compression and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other more questions? Yeah. So if uh, the, the, the nuclear bulge has more uh, young stars, doesn't this contradict how uh, quenching in galaxies happening from the inside towards out? So the nuclear disk, you mean, right? Yes. Let's not start another nomenclature. Um, uh, well, the, the, the quenching from inside out is normally when you're talking about the whole main disk, right? The whole main disk, then you can see if you go beyond the bar, you can see that the quenching happens first in the central regions and then outwards. The, the nuclear disk will do the opposite of it, but it will be very localized. It will be very in, in the center. So the, you, one thing doesn't contradict the other. The, both things can be happen at the same time. In fact, the quenching, uh, when, you, when you have a barred galaxy, is because the gas is being pushed to the center by the bar, and then you start having less gas to form stars in the main disk, right? The main disk gets devoid of gas because it's all going to the nuclear disk. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I would like, maybe I missed it. What is the ratio between the mass of the nuclear disk and the bar, for example? Like, how much we get in the center? I want to think in, the, in this question because we know from the simulation if we have some additional center of concentration, like even 5% or a bit less of the mass of the disk it will change the properties of the bar, which we get, what we get in the end. So what is the ratio of the mass? And do you think, I'm just interested in your opinion, do you think that the nuclear disk can somehow affect the bar itself? <laughs> like uh, like a feedback feedback connection. <laughs> do you understand what so I'm asking? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first question is uh, actually the nuclear disks are quite massive, uh, and they and, and in some cases they are as massive as the bar. Oh. Uh, uh, but of course, it's, yeah, yeah. But they are very concentrated. Oh. No, I didn't show this here, but I have a plot. Uh, that's that's interesting. No, in mass. mass. In mass. So it's actually quite concentrated. Whoa. Uh, but it means that it should affect the bar. There's like no way it can affect the bar. I'm telling what the observation, what I'm seeing in the observations. Uh, it's your problem to solve the theory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and if it, oh, I mean. One more probably naive question. 
Is it some, uh, can you check maybe there is some connection between the nuclear disks and bar lenses or is there no connection? Bar lenses, bar lenses. Could there, could there be some connection between them? Like you, we just see like the bar lens and then the nuclear disk and in every galaxy with the bar lens. But the, the, the bar lens is more extended than the nuclear no, disk. No, I, I understand, it's just not every bar uh, has a bar lens, no. Yeah, yeah. But not... It would be quite interesting if you have the bar, which is like penis, penis shaped, but in the plane, there are such bars. And then you have a nuclear disk uh, it's interesting so from the embody <laughs> simulation perspective because we know that if there is a central concentration there should be bar lens even if you have like five percent of central bar. Uh, in terms of disk total mass in, ter in terms of this total mass i mean okay. No, no, no. Okay, we can talk So uh, I, I think you know, we should uh, stop here. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And let's thank. Uh, thank you. Right. Uh, nice, nice. Uh, no. Okay, uh, we should start. So the uh, first talk. Uh, <coughs> uh, the break is by Mark Birmingham. Uh, he has uh, changed the title of his talk, which is form of instrumentation observational analysis using carbon three. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I feel like Britney Spears or something with this mic on. Um, so yeah, just a disclaimer. My talk has changed. Um, the title is form of instrumentation and observational analysis using carbon three. This doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, but for the next, yeah, it wasn't working there, but let me see. Yeah, but it's not working. Okay, it seems to be working on there. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so my, my title has changed slightly. So it's now foremost instrumentation and observational analysis using carbon three. But so, ho but hopefully this talk will give you a bit of an insight into some instrumentation. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about some realizations, maybe a slightly different topic to what you're used to. But I'll introduce myself first. So I'm Mark Cunningham. I'm currently at UCL. Um, I just finished my PhD. I'm originally from Northern Ireland though. Um, I live on a dairy farm usually milking cows um, growing up. I actually wanted to study art at university, but my mother said no, so I studied physics instead, and that's kind of how I got into astrophysics. Um, so when I had the opportunity to do some manual labor and get my hands dirty with instrumentation, I jumped at the chance. Um, so I was working on Foremost, which, if you don't know, um, is the four-meter multi-object spectroscopic telescope. Uh, as a second generation instrument that's going to be built for ESO's Vista telescope in Chile. So it's going to be based in Paranal. Um, it's built up of multiple subsystems, um, but what I was working on was the Whitefield Corrector, and that's what we built at UCL. The Whitefield Corrector itself is um, composed of four lenses, two of which are doublets that act as an EDC, an atmospheric dispersion corrector. Formos has a field of view, so a very wide field of view, 4.1 square degrees. It operates in the optical and it has um, a fiber optic system called SOP, which has 2,436 fibers. It also has three spectrographs, one high res and two low res. And at UCL, we were tasked to align the wide field corrector to very high, high accuracy of 50 microns. 
This is where foremost will be positioned in Parnell. Here's some of the consortium. I think it's grown now, but this is where it will be based. Oh, yeah, just some of the subsystems that you saw earlier. So we have the Wi-Fi corrector here. Um, we have fiber positioners behind it, and then the different spectrographs as well. But foremost is going to be revolutionary. Um, and it's going to be vital for spectroscopic follow-up in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it's going to complement and enhance many large sky area surveys for both space and ground-based facilities, especially Gaia e Rosita. So in the first five years, it's hoped to cover uh, the, 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 the Southern sky at least two to three times and gain more than 20 million spectra and has a wide range of scientific goals for most of the scientific community, ranging from galactic archaeology to um, an EGN survey with the Rosita of the high energy sky and then um, galaxy evolution and cosmology as well. So for the first five years, it's going to be the science is going to be split into two different sections. So science is based on the consortium um, and for thanks, basically for, for building the instruments. And then the other 30% uh, of the time will be from the community, from the ESO commu community. So there'll be 10 science cases for each, for the consortium and for the science commu community. For the consortium, um, these are the galactic and extra galactic science cases. So there's going to be five dedicated to galactic archaeology, which you can see here, a lot of Milky Way stuff. And then for the extra galactic stuff, there's an edge end survey, galaxy evolution survey, time domain survey. And I think Lara is going to talk about um, the survey nine, the Magellanic Cloud survey on Friday. So keep an eye out for that. So that's just some of the um, surveys. And again, just more about the galactic. It's, it's changed slightly. Uh, it's moved it around. But here are some of those um, consortium surveys here, which you can see. Um, so yeah, check out the Foremost website for more information on some of these surveys and see if you can get involved in them, because um, there's lots, lots to be done. Just looking at the Foremost spectral resolution for the low res, so for the low res, it's going to be around 5,000. And then for, that's for the two low res spectrographs, and then for the high res one, it's going to be around 18,000 to 20,000. And this is the foremost Wi-Fi corrector, which, which we built at UCL. Um, I'll just go through it. I'll not go into too much detail, but it con consists of these four lenses. So L1 here, L2 and L3, which act as this atmospheric dispersion corrector. And then we have an L1 cell at the bottom. So the lenses themselves, um, well, th this is a cut through version of it. We have these internal baffles, which get rid of any stray light that's coming through the system. Um, but I'll not spend too much time on that. Again, this is just the optical design for it. So the Wi-Fi corrector itself was one of the most expensive subsystems of foremost, coming in at around three million pound. So whenever I first started my PhD, I was literally handling these million pound lenses, which I had no qualifications to do. Um, it was very scary, but the L1 lens is about 0.95 meters in diameter. And then the rest of the lenses are all 0.65 in diameter. So why do we actually need a, um, an EDC or a wide field corrector? Well, we need a wide field corrector because we're viewing such a wide field of view. But the EDC um, corrects for this uh, refraction that happens because the atmosphere behaves like a prism, causing the incoming light to refract. So by rotating these two different lenses, these wedged lenses, we're able to correct for this distortion. Here is just some of the measurements that we would take um, in the lab while we're trying to, to align this very complex system to very high accuracy. So what we're doing here, these are called dial gauges, and we're taking one, two, three, four measurements here all at the same time. So here where these dial gauges measure how centered we are and if there's any tilts in the system. So we have to put the lenses into the lens cells themselves, which is a very complicated task. And each time we have to check to make sure that we were very centered to make sure that the side, because if something was off center or there's tilt, that affects the light getting to the optical fibers and then that, that destroys your science. So we had a very difficult task to try and align these very, very large optics. Again, just some more instrumentation methods that we would use, some of the opto uh, mechanical methods. So these lens cells, which you can see, are the lenses rest on these RTV pads. That's essentially the glass that so doesn't touch the metal itself. Because when you're up high at the telescope, um, there's expansion due, due, due to the temperatures, and we don't want um, the glass touching the metal for that reason. So these are just some of the other things that we would do. Here you can see some of the beautiful lenses. This is the L4 lens and the L1 lens. So you can see how thick they are. And then we would eventually raise these lens cells up to eventually meet the lens. And it was a very slow process to make sure that we were centered and everything. 
is the FEC working? Um, so this is the L2 rotating and the L3 rotating, these gears. And this is how it'll operate when it's not a telescope. So it will. Is the L1 lens finished? Again, I'll skip over this. Something that we had to do just to verify um, that we were centered and where we thought we were, we set up a laser displacement test here. So with the camera at the top, at the bottom, I would send a beam down through the wide field corrector, checking the reflected beam and the through beam. So we would spin this around and see how the beam moved to check that our tests were the same as what ZMAX, uh, an optical ray tracing tool, um, and it was the same as the, the as built as the design. So basically, just, just to finish this, um, we were able to align everything to well within 50 microns, which, well, a piece of hair is around 40 microns. So we we're able to align everything very, very accurately, which is good for the science cases and good for you. This is the wide field corrector finished. Before we shift it over to, to Potsdam, who are the main, um, the main members for, for, for this. So this is the less sexy side of things, or the more sexy side of, side of things, depending what you want to do. Um, so we had to take doors off hinges using hammers, screwdrivers, et cetera, uh, literally wrenching this out of the basement of UCL, um, which I didn't think I'd be doing to my PhD, but that's what we were doing. And I always thought this was some quite re renaissance like. Um, but yeah, so moving on to the transmission test that we did as well, just to verify things. Um, overall, the transmission for, for foremost and for the white field corrector sits around 88%. But if you take in, into consideration that each lens, each, each surface, has about a 2% um, reflectiveness taken off it, you should get around 80%. Interestingly though, we are getting this kind of dip in the middle, which we're still trying to understand why that is. Could we do, do, do with something with the coatings? Um, we're trying to, to figure that out at the minute. So this is the fiber optic system that Foremost will use. It's called ESOP. It's based on um, the echidna instrument where it was first used. And it's this tilting spine principle where these these spines kind of tilt towards the targets. So there's 2,436 of them, and you can see them backlit here in red. Um, it's called echidna because it kind of spikes look like an echidna. Um, but each fiber can be deployed anywhere within a fixed 11.5 uh, patrol radius. So these are very, very cool stuff. Um, here you can just see how close I can get in the shape of the letter four. The letter four, the number four. Um, and here again, it's just a video showing you how close you can get on the sky um, with, these, with these fiber optics positioners. This is the integration hall at AIP. Um, so this is where we work to verify more of these tasks that we're doing with the instruments. There's lots of different subsystems and they're all over at AIP. So this is the Cassegrain um, cable wrap. This is the Cassegrain test stand, different focal surface test tools. This is focal surface test tool. Again, there's so much goes into the instruments before you get any science fr from it. Um, so hopefully this gives you kind of an insight into that. This is us putting the wide field corrector into the Caspian test stand. This Caspian test stand is basically just a replica of what it would be like at the telescope. Um, so this is me in the little yellow hat down here, um, putting the wide field corrector in. And again, it's quite scary whenever you've got this 3 million pound object that you've aligned to 50 microns, and then you just tilting it on its side and raising it up and throwing it around the place. Um, but thankfully, nothing moves. And we do tests at every, at every stage to make sure that the optics haven't, haven't changed. So just an update on the current status of Foremost. Um, the first shipments have been made. So the Cassegrain test stand is at the telescope. Uh, the wide field corrector is being shipped next month. Um, and hopefully, I'll get to go out to Chile to help put that on as well. And commissioning will be finished, hopefully by the end of this year, with start of commissioning happening at the start of 2025. So this is the schedule, well, the current schedule is met change um, with delays and stuff, but for the first five year survey is meant to be starting 2025 and finished in 2029. There's a paper, if anyone's interested on the work that we did with the Wi-Fi corrector at UCL, um, you can check that out too. There's also YouTube videos of them shipping it from the lorry, if anybody cares about that. Um, but it's quite cool to see as well. And here's just some of the team over at, at Paranal um, putting on the, the cable wrap. And just a final bit to say, um, the future is quite bright for multi-object spectroscopy. Um, there's lots of new ones coming on. So we, we already have moons in the future. Um, we have these ones down here, which are going to come on. So MUST is a Chinese multi-object spectroscopic telescope, 6.5 meter. We also have Mosaic for the ELT. 
And then these two, again, not until 2030, but WST and the Monarchia Special Object Explorer as well. So there's lots to look forward to in the future for multi-object spectroscopy. Okay, so I'm gonna switch it up from building a MOS instrument to using a MOS instrument to enable science. So this is some work I did at UCL with, with Richard Ellis and Ayur Saxena at, at Oxford. See whether or not carbon-3 can help solve reionization. So reionization is expected to finish around a redshift of six. And this era um, was first started around 300 million years after the Big Bang, where UV radiation from ionizing sources reionized the neutral gas in the universe, which you can see here. But the main issue is that um, we don't know what a lot of these source, source, sources were. They were mainly star forming galaxies or edge N, who was the dominant perpetrator for reionizing the universe. And that's where Lyman Alpha comes in. So Lyman Alpha is 1250 nanotrims, is typically used as a tracer for star form forming galaxies, and as a means for exploring how ionizing radiation can, can escape. We use it for other things as well, um, for estimating Lyman continuum leak, leak, leakage. And above a redshift of six, Lyman alpha velocity offset is also a good tracer for ionized bubbles as well. Lyman velocity offset can also provide information on outflows and inflows of gas too. This is just Lyman alpha, which is the second transition from the M2 to the M1 level. The problem with Lyman alpha is that it gets absorbed by the increasing neutrality of the IGM above redshift of six. Um, which makes it, uh, renders it un an unreliable tool whenever we're trying to identify these star forming galaxies. So here you can just see in this, this schematic here, see Lyman alpha, if there's no clouds there, it can go straight through. If there's clouds there, um, it'll get absorbed by it. We can see it if it goes to the back of the galaxy and then gets scattered and then redshifted essentially to a longer wavelength and then it's able to pass through the neutral hydrogen gas. So that's one way we can see it. But ultimately, um, due to the increased neutrality above redshift of six, we shouldn't be able to see it. And that's why we're looking to see if we can use something as an alternative to infer these Lyman alpha properties. And that's where carbon-3 comes in. The several studies have suggested a correlation between these two, these two emission lines, um, between their two equivalent widths. Um, so that's something that we were trying to explore. But to be able to do this, we need to use lower analog galaxies at a redshift three and four um, as analogs for galaxies in the early universe because they have similar metallicities and similar star, star formation rates. Just to show you what this looks like, um, a typical spectra with Lyman alpha and carbon-3. So here's the very bright Lyman alpha line, this peak. And then we have the carbon-3 over here. So carbon-3 is a doublet, 1907, 1909. Um, it's a doubly ionized carbon. And it's actually a semi-forbidden line, so that's what this kind of weird bracket is. Um, but yeah, we, we can use the, 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 these lines to, to tell us lots of stuff about, about a galaxy. We can diagnose EGN diagnostics with the likes of helium-2 with carbon-3 um, as well. Okay, so as I was mentioning, to be able to, to, to learn more about this, we had to use um, lower redshift galaxies as analogs. So to do this, we used the Vandals data set, which used the VMOS instrument on the VLT. And it mainly targets star forming galaxies between the redshift of 2.5 and 5.5, mainly at around, at around three. The spectra is ultra deep, me, me, medium res, resolution, and had ultra long exposure times, and it was across the UDS and the CDFS fields. So breakdown of, of how we conducted our, our work. Um, initially, we would search for carbon-3 first and vi visually inspected it using uh, Pandora software. Then we would assign a confidence level based on how confidence we were that carbon-3 was there. Once we had done that, the carbon-3 search with signal to noise stuff, we then looked for Lyman alpha and other emission lines like, like, hel like helium-2. If we saw helium-2, then we, we removed any edge N from, from them to remove any biases. Then once we were happy with our final selection, we could then measure velocity offsets and equivalent widths as well. So we started with a sample of 70, 773 objects, and we were able to bring that down to 52 strong carbon-3 and Lyman alpha. So this is kind of what a spectra would look like. So we have a strong carbon-3 here, or a strong Lyman alpha, and then our carbon-3 here as well. And then we'd fit Gaussians to these using the continuum to measure equivalent widths. For the velocity offset, how we measure it as well. So as I mentioned, it's a very good tracer for um, the conditions that enable the escape of Lyman alpha photons from the galaxy. So here, um, this blue line is where we 
it detected the lamina alpha and the green line is where um, it should be. So we measure the difference in this to get, to get the velocity offset. This is obviously in rest frame. So does carbon-3 actually trace lamina alpha properties? So this is just a di distribution of um, the all carbon-3 emitters in the Vandal's data set compared to the carbon-3 emitters that had lamina alpha. And the sources that show lamina alpha do have higher on average equivalent widths compared to those without. But when we look at the carbon-3 equivalent width versus lamina alpha, um, we see kind of a lot, a, lot, a lot of scatter that doesn't normally follow the kind of trend that's been seen in the literature beforehand. Um, but we think we can explain why that, that is. So these ones here, these, these brighter ones, possibly uh, UV bright, well, they are UV bright, but they're possibly more evolved and so less star forming, so don't have as much um, lime alpha equivalent width coming out of them. But then these ones up here are the ones from JWST. Um, so like these ones at a reg of seven, they have very low, the high carbon three, but very low lime alpha equivalent width. Um, and the low lime alpha equivalent width because it's lime alpha is getting heavily attenuated by the by the neutrality of the IGM, so it's getting absorbed. We then compared lime alpha velocity offset to lime alpha equivalent width, um, and we get this anti-correlation, um, which has been seen. Um, oh, back. So we get getting this kind of anti-correlation here, um, and this is easily explained by the higher density leads to increased absorption and scattering of lime alpha photons along the line of sight. And this leads to a reduction in the observed equivalent width um, and an increase in the velocity offset from systematic. So if you, you're here, um, you've got very high uh, velocity offset, very low equivalent width. It means that you've been scattered loads and then you've got less equivalent width. So less lamina alpha is going to escape. And then finally, what we did is we looked at the lamina alpha velocity offset versus carbon three equivalent width. And uh, we saw a trend, but we then decided to, to put plot UV ma ma magnitude with this as well. And we came up with a multivariant fit that encompasses both the carbon-3 equivalent width prop prop properties and, the, and the, the MUV properties as well. So here we're getting a, an anti-correlation in between these. But essentially what this might be able to do is that you can infer properties, um, like you can infer line off of velocity offset if you see carbon-3 at high redshifts. What we do tend to see is that more of the UV bright, um, more of the UV luminous uh, galaxies fall below uh, the, the trend line. And that's possibly due to being bursty star formation rate, which potentially facilitate more efficient clearing um, of channels through which lime alpha can, can escape. And that's why um, they've got lower lime alpha velocity offset. Um, but this equation will, if you see lime alpha above redshift of six, if you see lime alpha above, if you don't detect lamina alpha above ratio of six, but you do detect carbon three, then you may be able to infer lots of these different properties. And lots of papers have shown carbon three to be at high redshift. So we've got the Tang paper from GNZ11. We also have um, the Tang paper as well using the Sears data set. This was using the GEADS data set on JWST. But essentially, we may, may be able to infer these different properties like lamina alpha, equivalent width, velocity offset lemon continuum leakage, and potentially ionized bubbles as well. And where this is really coming to its own is beyond a redshift of 9.5, where the prominent oxygen and hydrogen lines will move beyond the near spec um, range, and carbon-3 may emerge as the next best feature, as the next prominent emission line to be able to detect these galaxies. So just to summarize, um, foremost, we're able to align the optics to very high accuracy. Um, the subsystems are on the way to Chile, and survey operations should start in 2025. And for carbon-3, the positive correlation between um, the equivalent width of carbon, or the anti-correlation between carbon-3 equivalent width and lime alpha velocity offset, which has a strong dependence on MUV, may be able to um, unlock those sources above a redshift of six, which don't show lime alpha properties. So I'll leave it there. And thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you. That's the question. The next uh, talk is by Fabio Riccamonti, Dynamical Modeling of Belts and Discs.
such as the cross kinematic so mass star formation from manga. Then to over here. Yeah, that's the that message. Okay, there is the pointer. Does the previous speaker as the pointer? This is the laser. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, today I'm going to present basically the topic of my PhD thesis in which I developed a, a new approach to the bulge and disk decomposition problem, which encompasses and uses also information from the kinematics. So uh, let me start by defining a bit of nomenclature. Uh, we have already done it in the talk before. Uh, let me be a bit sloppy about that. Uh, so broadly speaking, in the universe, we have these galaxies and elliptical galaxies. Above a center threshold of mass, you can roughly speaking saying that these galaxies are two component system with a disk, which is almost, uh, which is rotationally supported and mainly shaped by in situ star formation and a central concentrated structure, which is called bulge. Uh, there are, as we already heard about, a conflicting nomenclature about bulge in the literature. In this, in this, in this talk, we use uh, the term photometric bulge to refer to the central light component, which is in access to an exponent. Is, is that? <laughs> Is there a mic? <laughs> okay. Should be better. So uh, I will refer to photometric bulges as uh, the central light component, which is in excess to an extrapolation of an exponential disk. What I mean is that if you take the light profile of your galaxy, you feed the external part with an exponential disk, the excess of light in the middle is the photometric bulge. Then we often find the term classical bulge and pseudo bulge. Um, with classical bulge, we would like to refer to structures that are almost dispersion supported and most importantly shaped by violent processes. Whereas pseudo bulges, we have already seen that they either be our uh, nuclear disk or bars and they are shaped by secular processes. In the literature, we also find the term spheroids. Uh, ideally, you would like to refer to spheroids to those galaxies or those galaxy components which are shaped by violent processes, what is typically done is to group together the class of photometric bulges and elliptical and say that those are spheroids. Uh, I don't have to remind you that the reality is far more complex than a simple bulge and disk system. For instance, the galaxy that you show here uh, shows the presence of different structure in it. And the thing that I want to highlight is that if you look at the region identified by the photometric bulge, in low resolution, you would be tempted to say it's close to a classical bulge since the isophotal contour are almost spherical. But then if you zoom in with high resolution observation, you actually discover that there is an inner bar and the classical bulge, if any, is only in the very center. This is to tell you that in this case, assuming that the photometric bulge is a classical bulge would have led to improper conclusion about 
the evolution and the bus budget of this galaxy. Now, uh, the composition of galaxy have been done uh, since long ago. The most popular method is photometric decomposition. I'm not gonna enter into the detail, but let me just quickly review one of the many results that we got from photometric decomposition, which says that basically the mass budget of galaxies is almost equally split between disks and spheroids, and spheroids dominate in the higher mass end. Let me stress already now that this result here is dependent on morphology. In the, in the work, the authors assumed something about morphology. We are gonna come back to this plot later on. Photometric decomposition has been extended to spectra to find the, spec the separate spectra of bulges and disks. And other decomposition approaches are based on a full dynamical model of the system. In these cases, what you typically do is to assume a gravitational potential, integrate a large number of orbits in the gravitational potential, hundreds of thousands of them, and then weight them for a free parameter, each orbit for a free parameter to reproduce the observables. The decomposition is done ex post the fit in the angular momentum galactocentric distance plane. And let me say that this has uh, other approaches that have been mentioned in the day before is an extremely flexible and powerful approach, although quite computationally expensive, uh, which means that for a single galaxy, you may end up more than a day, and that is only for a fixed gravitational potential. Then you have to change the parameter for the gravitational potential and find the best one. And usually you don't, do, you don't go after some hundreds of model. Now, the methodology that we proposed, we can say sits in between a pure bulge disk, photometric bulge disk decomposition and the full dynamical model of the system since we model together the photometry and the kinematic of galaxies. We do that with uh, a Bayesian parameter estimation algorithm, namely the nested sampling, and to keep everything on reasonable time scale, we parallelize the code on GPUs. Uh, the assumption behind any galaxy model um, are quite simple. I'm gonna pass through that uh, very quickly. So basically uh, we assume the presence of different components. Each component is described by analytical potential density pair. And we have a spherically symmetric isotropic bulge described by a Denham profile. Then we assume the presence of uh, two disks, an inner one and an outer one. They are both rather thin and exponential. And then in the gravitational potential, we also include the navarro franco white dark materialo. And we consider also a few more parameters for ge the geometry of the system. Let me stress on the role of few parameters that will be relevant later on. Uh, those are the mass to light ratio of the visible component. Those are constant, but are different for the three visible components. So. Uh, in the end, the average mass to light ratio of the galaxy has a radial gradient. And finally, we have two more parameters to characterize the dynamical state of the disk. We call them kinematic decomposition parameter and basically regulate if the disk is dispersion supported or rotationally supported. I'll go back to that later on. The parameter estimation is done with the nested sampling algorithm uh, for two main reasons. The first one is that it gives you the full posterior probability distribution of the parameter space. And the second one is that uh, the primary target of the nested sampling algorithm is the Bayesian evidence. And that number is what you, use, you usually use to compare different model, or in our case, model with different components. The drawback is that, especially if uh, the parameter space is large, you end up waiting uh, hours if not day for a single parameter estimation because you need millions of evaluation of your likelihood function of your model. So here you see the difference with Schwarzschild modeling. Our dynamical model is way more simple, but the parameter estimation is much more accurate. And to resolve that problem, we move the, uh, parallel, the, the evaluation of each galaxy model on GPUs and we reach the relevant speed up mainly because of the grid nature based of the model. 
I will now show a quick new movie to understand how the parameter estimation work. Uh, here we see some of the free parameter of the model. Here we have the data and the first random uh, model which doesn't fit the data at all. So as soon as I start, oh. okay. if I start the movie, uh, what you see is that the parameter estimation algorithm tries different model. Initially, they don't look like the data, but then little by little, the parameters start to get to the best fit uh, parameter and the best fit model is fine as well. Okay. This Galaxy here, NGC 7683, is also a good example to uh, start to understand why we need two disk components. And the reason is because uh, this galaxy has quite an high rotation also in the very center. And just with the classical badge with no rotation, uh, with, with no rotation, we cannot fit uh, the velocity curve well. And so we correct by including an inner disk component which has non-negligible non rotation. Uh, we moved to an application on the model to Manga. Manga is the integral field spectroscopy survey of the SDSS. Uh, we served more than 10,000 galaxies in the local universe. And we use uh, from uh, the Manga data, the stellar velocity and the stellar velocity dispersion to do our uh, models. Now I will quickly show a uh, few kinematic scaling relation also to prove that on a large sample, our model performed quite well. And then I will quickly move to the assessment of the mass budget of galaxies depending on kinematic and star formation. So first thing first, uh, this is uh, one of the most famous kinematic scaling relation, compare the stellar mass with a combination of the regular rotation and the dispersion support. As a matter of fact, galaxy of all kind of morphology lies on the same uh, relation. And compared to previous results on smaller subsample, we find exceptional agreement and also a reduction in the scatter, which means that if you do a proper model of your galaxy, you get a little bit more information than just using the data. Now, let me clarify about the role of the inner and the outer disk, okay. So those are the two parameters that I was referring before. Those are number between zero and one. And when they are close to zero, it means that the component is dispersion supported. Whereas when they are close to one, the component is rotationally supported. It is a bit counterintuitive to think of a disk which is dispersion supported. So I will now show a couple of examples to clarify that. Before doing that, let me define two more parameters. These are the luminosity weighted and the mass weighted kinematic. Uh, those are two numbers that quantify somehow the overall dynamical state of the galaxy. So if they are close to zero, the galaxy overall is this special supported. And let me also stress that the distribution of these two parameters is different just because we assume different mass to light ratio because between the different component. A constant mass light ratio would have led to the same definition of K-mass and K-loom and the same distribution. Okay, the first example is a galaxy with both the inner and the outer disk dispersion supported. This is something that I would call a pure elliptical galaxy. There is no clear rotation and it is a galaxy overall dispersion supported. The reason why our model includes an inner and the outer disk dispersion support, that is because our assumption about the bulge. The bulge is assumed to be spherical. And if you have non-zero ellipticity in the brightness distribution of your galaxy, the model is gonna correct by including a disk which is dispersion supported. So the interpretation is that that component is not actually a disk physically present in the galaxy, but is a correction to our assumption. Second example is a galaxy with an inner component dispersion support and the rotation and the rotationally supported outer disk. This is a galaxy with a well-defined uh, velocity pattern, also with some dispersion in the center. 
And the, the reason why we include an inner component, which is dispersion supported, is as before, due to the assumption of our bulge, which is assumed to be spherical. And so we include a correction to account for it. The last example is a galaxy for which both disks are rotationally supported. To some extent, this is an example look that, that is similar to the first galaxy that I showed you because the difference is that in the very center of the galaxy, there is much higher velocity or a steeper gradient in velocity compared to the case before. And we correct for it by accounting for an inner component, which is fast rotating. Now, uh, let me enter in the mass budget of galaxy. So here I'm showing the mass, the different mass being of galaxy as a function of the mass fraction within different threshold of the kinematic decomposition parameter. So what I'm doing is that if I take the galaxy here, I'm considering all galaxy with 10 to the 10 solar masses, and I'm summing up all the mass within the different threshold of the kinematic. So as I go up in the plot, I'm starting including more mass in rotationally supported structure. What, what we can see, especially if we focus below 10 to the 11 solar masses, is that there is quite a clear separation between a rotationally supported component and the dispersion supported component. This is not, to some extent, new. We expected that, but it is nice that it come out naturally from the approach because we didn't impose the disks to be rotationally supported. Also, you note that the amount of mass in mildly rotating or mildly dispersion supported structure is quite minimal. And finally, that at high masses, not all the mass is in dispersion supported structure. Uh, this is quite in contrast with the result from a purely photometric approach. This is not new. It was already known. And this is because uh, this result assumed that all galaxies that are morphologically classified as elliptical are their mass is in the spheroidal component. Whereas in our model, we, do, we don't do any assumption. In our analysis, we, do, we don't do any assumption on the morphology of galaxy because we have the kinematic. We can repeat the exercise considering the overall dynamical state of the galaxy. The picture changes and you see that fully dispersion supported galaxy at below 10 to the 11 solar masses are a small fraction. And also that the dichotomy that we saw before gives a variety of dynamical state of your system when you consider the whole galaxy. And this is because uh, different classes of bulges and different classes of disks uh, can combine in different way to give you the overall dynamical state of the system. Okay. Now let me move to the last. Uh, and okay, uh, this uh, is even better uh, clarified if you compare the luminosity weighted kinematic with the photometrically deduced bulge over total ratio. Indeed, there is some mild correlation, but the scatter is quite significant. And the, the point is that it is really difficult to infer purely from the photometric decomposition, the actual dynamical state of your system. Now, let me pass to the last point, which again is the mass budget. And we add another layer of complexity, which is uh, the distance from the star forming main sequence of galaxies. And we repeat the exercises before. And here, what you see that is that below 10 to the 11 solar masses, it seems that most of the mass in rotationally supported galaxy is on the main sequence. So there, in other terms, this, there seems to be a correlation between the luminosity weighted kinematic and the distance of a galaxy from the main sequence or not. Now, if you change parameter or diagnostic and you use the mass weighted kinematic, what I want to highlight is that there is no more such difference between main sequence and below main sequence galaxies, okay? So before driving any conclusion from that, can we quantify it somehow? The way we thought of doing that was 
Okay, we consider all galaxies below 10 to the 11, we sum the mass up, and we plot the mass fraction as a function of the thresholds, the luminosity weighted thresholds. We do that for main sequence galaxies, and we do that for below main sequence galaxies. And now the difference between the two lines here is exactly what we wanted to quantify because it's the difference of the mass fraction between main sequence and below main sequence galaxies. Okay. We do that also for the highest mass and we do that especially also for the mass weighted kinematic. Okay. Now, what I want to stress comparing these two plots here is that if you look at the blue lines, there is a much larger difference in the luminosity weighted kinematic than in the mass weighted kinematic. And the point is that as galaxies move away from the star forming main sequence, most of the star formation is happening in the disk. So as the galaxy move away, the light from the disk dims, but not necessarily change its dynamical state. So these two diagram here says that it is not necessarily that galaxy change the structure while they quench, okay? Or if you want, it's a kind of a proof of disk fading. Uh, still a limited and also somehow that whenever you use luminosity weighted quantities like V over sigma or lambda re, you have always to keep in mind that they do not only encapsulate the kinematic or the intrinsic kinematic of your galaxy, but also changing in the stellar population or in the mass to light ratio. Still, uh, a small margin of transformation is observed, and this might be uh, due to the, the, the thickening of uh, disks, maybe in lenticular galaxies, but we need to further investigate that. So I leave here my conclusion and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. This was very interesting. And I was a bit so I have a bit of a question I would like to clarify and then a question question. The inner disk um, would not be necessarily the nuclear disk. Right? No. No, no, no. Okay, so no. just something that you that you add to correct for some kinematics. Yeah, so the um, the resolution of the manga data actually doesn't allow to resolve nuclear disk. So the inner disk it, to some extent always providing a correction depending on galaxy to galaxy to the inner part of the galaxy. Yeah, that was my second question. What is your resolution more or less and if you would be able to resolve nuclear disks? That was the second question. Thank you. Thanks, uh, nice work, Fabio. Um, <clears throat> so in one of the galaxies you showed, you have to add the inner disk um, with some, I think it's the second case, uh, so with some dispersion support yeah. because yeah. you assume that the Bosch is, is a spheroid. Yeah. Right? So if you if you relax this assumption, I don't know if you, I, mean, I don't know how easy it is to this, but if you can have yes. bulges that are flattened somehow, would this dispersion support not be necessary? Basically, uh, um, I I mean maybe you still need an inner disk component. Uh, I'm not even necessarily sure about that. But the point is exactly that one. If you relax the condition on the, both in terms of the, the shape, not spherical, and the rotation, so letting it rotate, I think that you, in most of the cases, you will not need the inner disk component with those data. And, and another question is, is so if, if you have a pure disk, um, right, a, pu a pure disk of stars rotating, the V over sigma will always increase, uh, always decrease towards the center, right? 
uh, even if it's a rotating disk, is nothing else. There was always going to be more velocity dispersion in the same. Yeah. Um, would in a system like that, if you try to to model this with your tool, would would it recover a pure disk, or would it tell you, oh, actually, I have a dispersion supported system in the center, uh, which is actually not real. It's just because the disk becomes hotter at the same. Yeah. Uh, but are you are you referring to like the bin smearing fact or no no, no just just um, uh, regardless uh, that's a good point uh, I'm not actually sure I think it's gonna put a component with dispersion support due to how we 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 actually model the the disk if you start to include to relax the condition of the disk to be thin rather thin then you can account for that and. This is on the to-do list, right, actually. Any more questions? Very interesting speaker here. <laughs> and the, the next speaker is Marcel Bergamone about the multivariate kinematic substructure and the dynamics discovery tool. Okay. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. And the answer is ah, okay. Perfect, thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Marcel Bernet. I come from the University of Barcelona, and today I will try to uh, show you some examples of how we use the Gaia data, so the motion of the stars in the Milky Way to explain the structure and the history of our galaxy. Okay, so first, things that we've heard several times this week, uh, we know that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is far from being an uh, ideal uh, axisymmetrical galaxy. It has um, non-axisymmetrical components, such as the bar, there are, there, there are some kind of spiral arms around. So mm, there are things happening. And one of our best ways to test this structure is uh, the wonderful Gaia data that brings us literally uh, extra dimensions to, to explore. So the plan today is to start by explaining how we use this, um, the kinematic substructure of the Milky Way. And I will talk about moving groups and define them a bit better later. And in the end of that part, I will show some results that hint that uh, these moving groups might be signs of phase mixing. This is some structure that is still uh, yeah, mixing from uh, recent events. Okay. And from that hint, I will move to the second part where we will talk about uh, the kinematics uh, signals that the tidal spiral arm would produce and try to relate them back to the Milky Way. And maybe I will try to convince that there is something like this happening in our galaxy. So let's start from the beginning. What do I mean when saying moving groups? And let's take all the Gaia data forget about most of it, and select only the stars that are close to the sun. So a local bubble of 200 parsecs close to the sun, this small white circle. Then for each one of the stars in this circle, we can compute the radial uh, velocity and the azimuthal velocity, and then plot in this direction in the left for each star where it would be here, and we have the local velocity distribution uh, yeah, around the sun. And the nice thing about this plot, and this is something that has been known for a lot of years, and it's one of the first uh, dynamical tests in the Milky Way, is that in an ideal galaxy, this would be a smooth Gaussian. But every one of these blobs and voids and arches is giving us information on 
the dynamics that are happening in the galaxy. And all of these uh, blobs have names in the literature, but I will focus specifically in this large blob here that it's called Hercules. Okay? And back in the 2000s, uh, there was this consensus that um, if the bar of the Milky Way was rotating at a certain velocity, of 55 uh, this large unit, this uh, would place the outer limpid resonance around here. We've been talking about resonance uh, several times this week. It's just some fami family of orbits. And this would scatter these stars from here and create the blob down downwards and the blob upwards. So that uh, framework explains this local velocity distribution. And everyone was happy. Hercules was happy. Uh, all was working. But then uh, other observations said, OK, maybe the bar of the Milky Way is a bit slower. So we need a new framework. So uh, in the late 2010s, uh, there was this new uh, hypothesis that the bar was uh, rotating a bit slower, about 39. And that meant that Hercules was, uh, were, was form of stars trapped in corrotation. So there's this um, degeneracy here that different resonances would, would reproduce the same local distribution. But as Francesca was saying yesterday, we have even other uh, values for the rotation of the bar. So uh, there is a lot of degeneracy in this uh, local velocity distribution. So what can we do to try to uh, break this degeneracy? The nice thing of Gaia, uh, Oscar said yesterday that it allows us to put uh, glasses and see better, but it also allows us to move around the Milky Way and uh, like try to move the sun and see what would happen if the sun was in another place. And that's amazing. So if we are around the sun, we see this distribution, but if we go a bit outer, we see that this distribution is changing. And a bit outer, we have different configurations, and the same if we go inwards. So we cannot, we can just use not just our local first distribution, but this distribution in other places of the galaxy. Yeah? Okay. So that's what we do. What we do is we go to different neighborhoods of the galaxy, and at each neighborhood, we can detect the different uh, blocks over densities that are there. And that was supposed to be a GIF, but it transformed to images. So yeah, assume that there is continuity here. And in other neighborhoods, we can uh, trace how, one, how each of these blobs is moving in the velocity space as we move in space. Basically, we're, uh, we can do this in um, radial direction, but also in azimuth and in a vertical direction. So we are sampling the entire distribution of the Milky Way. And that's what we published back in 2022. And we are basically uh, giving the skeleton of the um, uh, phase space of the Milky Way. The nice thing is that we are not, so we have a um, continuous blob of structure, 6D structure, and we are returning uh, specific positions of the phase space, and we are grouping them in different, like, we have the skeleton group in different bones. So now I, I will present the update of that, that study. Now we had better data because we were using Kaya DR3. And here I'm showing these results. Let me summarize this. Um, each one of these lines corresponds to one of the blobs in the original graph. And now I'm showing the radius versus the vertical position of this blob for each one of the structures. And in the other uh, plot, the azimuth and the vertical position of this blob. So we see that there is a lot of complexity and a lot of different substructure. Here I'm showing about 10 or 20, but we have more than 500 uh, structures in total, so it's a very complete data set. Uh, just to highlight some features, we see a very linear uh, behavior of these ridges in azimuth, which is something that I'll show later it's not that expected. And for some of them, we are even reaching the direction of the bar major axis. So it's a pretty complete data set. And as I was saying, now we have this large uh, set of structures, about 500, but that's pretty hard to visualize and to understand. And to, so we had to find a way to uh, 
reformulate that problem. So what we did was to simplify everything, throw linear regressions, which is always good. And for each one of the ridges, we can compute the gradient of the, of the ridge. So for each group, we can compute the global gradient, and then we can project this global gradient back to the local distribution. So here we have the local information, where is the blob, but the color is giving us the global information. How does the group move, moves along the disk? So for instance, this green blob, if we move in radii, will stay uh, more close to its position, and then the orange one will uh, move farther away. Okay, so that's the intuition here. And <laughs> why? Good question. Now we can, uh, the good thing is that we now we have the data, the data, but we can compare it with some models. So the first thing that we wanted to test is, uh, can we say something about this degeneracy that I was talking uh, with the bar? We have different hypotheses for the bar pattern speed. Is there some of the hypotheses that matches better this local and global distributions? So this is a very simple model of Milky Way with a slow bar, and we let it evolve. It creates corrotation. We can detect it. The position, the local position of the of the over densities matches. That's what we are seeing before. We can reproduce that. But when we check the uh, gradient, so the global structure, there's a significant difference. So it's not matching. Maybe the fast bar model will match. Uh, the answer is no. So uh, at this point, we, we cannot find any model that matches the data. But we know that the part of Milky Way is slowing down. There are uh, a lot of things playing a role in there. So. Uh, I think we, what we are saying is that a simple bar model cannot explain our global distribution. So we are okay with that. And now I will focus back into Hercules and try to, uh, focusing in the blob, try to explain the, the origin, okay? So we've seen that the first hypothesis and the consensus right now is that Hercules corresponds to uh, stars trapped in corrotation of the bar. And the thing is that we are covering about 60% of the disk at this point. Okay, and now keep with me because I, that's maybe, that may be crazy. When we uh, study the shape of these orbits, so how do uh, corrotation orbits look like in the Milky Way, the stability islands will form closed regions. So if we have a structure that corresponds to one of these uh, uh, corrotation uh, orbits, it should close with, it, with itself if we cover 180 degrees. Yes. But what we see is that when we are covering this 60 degrees, this structure is uh, increasing steadily, and we, don't, we do not see it flattening. Okay? So it's possible that we are in a very specific part of the disk, and we cannot discard that. And probably with uh, new spectroscopic surveys, we can extend this and test this hypothesis. But it's also possible that we are not seeing a closed structure, but we are seeing something that it's opened. There are two of them. Are, I am not uh, <laughs> concluding in any of them, but that's a possibility. So what's another, another possible possibility of this um, linear shape? Another thing that could be happening is that this is not uh, something related with, re with resonances, but it's signs of phase mixing. And what we show in, in our paper is that this linear trend and also the linear trends of the other structures could be compatible with some phase mixing event happening around uh, six mega years ago. And that's uh, maybe a, a crazy number, but it does, it could correspond to uh, the last percentage of Sagittarius. So that's something that we were uh, testing. And that, that's, that brings me to the uh, second part of the talk, that it's when we have uh, encounters with other galaxies, we know that tidal spirals can be formed. 
And our question is, are there tracers of tidal interactions in the Milky Way that can we find? And the answer is yes. Uh, back in 2028, we saw that in the vertical uh, phase space, there, there are clear signs of phase mixing. So let me reformulate the question this. Can we find tracers in the in-plane orbits of this, tidal, of this tidal interaction? And that's uh, where this second part starts. Let me check the time. Yes. OK. So we'll start with a very, very, very simple model of a tidal interaction. Uh, we've all seen this in the Earth. And when we have a galaxy and then a, a satellite that comes very fast and very far away, this is like the ideal, ideal case, what happens is that there is time enough to produce a kick in velocity. So the stars feel this tidal impulse but the position remains uh, fixed. And that's like an ideal assumption. This is a very simple um, dust particle simulation, so there's no cell gravity here. And when we let this system evolve, there are some spirals that appear here, and also in density, but it's not that clear here. And these spirals are the so-called tidal spirals. So back in 2022, what we did, uh, the, the formula of how these spirals uh, wraps is very well known. But what we did is to take a, an analytical potential and then find closed formulas of these dashed lines, so the uh, locus of the spirals. And that worked very fine. We were able to do that. But uh, we were able to find just this, uh, the, the locus of the spiral. So all the inner structure, we are not able to find it. Why? Because in B5, we see that this so toothed wave appear. That was surprising. It's not surprising because it's, it's richest in the end, but it's difficult to reproduce mathematically. And in BR, we see that uh, triangular wave. OK, so that's what this, where this new project starts. That is, can we find some analytical um, tools to describe these tidal uh, spirals. And now uh, that's where magic happens, and I'm still surprised that this is work, so keep with me. What we did was we simulate this disk with a very high resolution, and then I will summarize it very fast. There's more work in here, but let me summarize it. What we did was fit all these observations into a symbolic regression uh, program that it's done, it's not ours. And the thing is that when doing this, what we recovered were these equations that explains us, us how the density, the B5 and the BR will evolve in time. So this is absolutely discovered, rediscovered, let's say, however, using the simulation as an input. And this, is, this looks very familiar to, uh, very similar to uh, continuity equation. There's a different coefficient, and this looks very similar, simi similar to Euler equation. So basically, this is some part of the collision, collisionless Boltzmann equation. And one way of work that we plan to do is, can we, starting from uh, first principles, can we recover these equations? So it's like doing an exam with, while well, knowing the answer, but you still have to uh, fill this path. I think that's a very interesting uh, way of proceeding. But the other nice thing is that now we have these analytical equations that allows us to um, integrate these orbits, but much faster. Okay, so now we see that with these equations, we recover this kind of wave. And that's not ideal uh, yet, because we have this secondary thing happening. But when we uh, look at the difference between the two of them, we see that there is this second wave also happening in the same time from the same interaction. So what we are seeing, let me summarize, is that uh, if we have a very smooth disk and this tidal impact, this tidal impact will generate one spiral that wraps as omega minus kappa halves, and then a second shorter uh, length spiral that would wrap faster. So one single uh, impulse is creating 
two different spirals wrapping. And now we are ready. We can do a, a very similar approach as before again. And now we have analytical, um, semi-analytical approach that allows us to reproduce the shape of a tidal impact very fast. If this in the left takes about two hours because you have to compute orbit by orbit, the part in the right is extremely fast. So that allows us to uh, compare the models with data much, much easier. And that's the last part of, the, of this project. Once we have this uh, fast model, can we uh, go back to the data and, and uh, reproduce it? And this is a very simple model, similar to the one that I was showing in the, in the beginning. And we see that with this first wave, we are able to reproduce the position of the over densities and also this uh, sawtooth wave that we were talking in the beginning and this uh, triangular wave. So yeah. Uh, this analytical model is doing what we were trying to do in the beginning. And now, finally, let's go back to the Gaia data. Can we see these signs of tidal uh, interaction in the disk? And this is an observable that uh, has been studied this last year. And this curve is basically taking all the Gaia data in the x-axis, uh, I'm showing the angular momentum. So radius times P5. And in the vertical axis, I'm showing the mean BR. And it's known that when you do this, there's this pattern appearing. That it's a long wave and then a short wave on top. And there's been some work in that saying, OK, maybe this is uh, the long wave belongs to the bar, and then the short wave belongs to the spirals. And can we use two components to study this? The thing is that our claim is that with just one tidal impact, now you have this long wave plus two short wave. And this is preliminary work. Um, so it's, this is not a proper fitting. It's just visual playing with the model. So more, more of that in the future. But we are able to reproduce this. And this curve does have physical meaning, meaning because it comes from the model and it contains information of the original impact. And the time scales of that curve are about half a giga, a giga year, which is, again, matching uh, what we were talking before. This can be extended, of course, to uh, the whole disk. So here we include the azimuth um, as a variable, and this is how that would look like. And if you notice, here we are seeing these diagonal ridges when we are seeing phi versus b phi. And this is somehow uh, compatible with the things that I was, I was talking in the beginning. We think that we are seeing uh, hints of something happening, and we are seeing it in different uh, projections. And finally, just to uh, conclude, that I, I feel that uh, there's two ways of, of uh, in research in our field. Some people are working very deeply in first principles and uh, things that are uh, paper and pen and so on. There's, a large, a, a huge progress in data and more and better data and more and better simulations. And somehow it feels that it's getting apart. Uh, I know that it's, there's a lot of push through the people of pen and pencil, but I think these techniques are, that are appearing that you can use the simulations to discover the analytical things behind can work as a bridge in this. Uh, yeah, as a bridge. So yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Any questions? Yes. Very nice work, Marcel. Um, what about uh, what do you? So you have, if you have this tidal impulse, can this also then possibly form a bar? And how would the how would these resonances with this kind of um, spiral, that tidally induced spiral, interact? Have you? Is that something that you've looked at all? Uh, at this moment, everything that we are doing is uh, test particles. So there is no self gravity. So there is no bar forming uh, at all. Uh, that's in the future work. Of course, we want to include 
We have some tests done with self gravity in uh, 1D simulations, but merging 1D plus uh, it's a whole new level. But yeah, I think that should be very interesting to look at. Uh, is it is it will, will it be possible that there is also tidal, tidal uh, spiral in the R coordinates? Or? Sorry, uh, this tidal wave. Yeah, while, while it's only in Z and uh, not uh, in R. No, the the waves that I'm talking about are uh, so the, the models that I'm using are only planar. There is no uh, Z but component in, in the observation. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, in the observations. Uh, the Z1 is easy to see. Yeah. Uh, what we think is that in the planar orbits, there are more things happening, and uh, maybe it's... So, so, so it's harder to see, because if we shake something, it should shake in all directions. Uh, that, that's the thing. It, it, for me, it should be there, because if it's in Z, it should be in the, also in the plane, but uh, yeah. I think it's not that easy to, to uh, prove directly. In the noise. Okay, uh, are there more questions? If not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Okay. Uh, this uh, talk by Louis uh, Lilly about the tailoring galaxies used along the level signals. How both grows shape the evolution. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's one. Yeah. yeah. Starts from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, so first, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting us all here and uh, allowing me to, to present my work. So my name is Louis Quillet. I'm a uh, CNAS fellow at uh, Centre de Recherche Physique de Lyon, or CRAL. But today, I will mostly present you the work that I've did during my uh, PhD at the Institute of Astrophysics of Paris uh, from 2020 to 2023. Uh, so uh, the title of my talk is uh, Tailoring Galaxies About the Earl Sequence, uh, because I will try to uh, analyze the morphology of galaxies and relate it to this uh, famous sequence. And uh, the main results that I underline it is that uh, the bulge growth we'll see is a very important parameter in the evolution of galaxies. So the outline of my talk will be first to uh, go quickly through the motivation of my work. Then I present the data and methodology used uh, to then get to the results, which are organized in three parts. The first one will be to look at uh, the famous color bimodality of galaxy population and to relate it to the Hubble sequence, which is based on uh, the work of two articles, one already published and the other one in preparation. Uh, then I'll go deeper into the, the details of uh, the bulges and the disk screw scaling relations. And I'll finish uh, by uh, looking at their color and color gradients to better understand how star formation uh, works in the different structure of galactic disk. So uh, the motivation of my work uh, to understand them, we have to go back to the, the beginning of uh, extragalactic science uh, with uh, the definition of the Hubble sequence uh, almost a century ago uh, by observing various shapes and features uh, Hubble put uh, forward this classification that you all know with uh, elliptical galaxies. Wait. Okay, uh, elliptical galaxies here on the left, which are a uh, smooth profile. The different types of spirals here that you can see, uh, I've picked some unbarred and or, or barred because I only look at the, at the sequence, not at the fork. And uh, this sequence uh, raises a challenge to any uh, theory of galaxy formation and evolution, which is to explain the emergence of such a variety 
of uh, shapes and features uh, through cosmic time. And uh, from this sequence of image already, you can guess a few elements that will come forward in my presentation. As you can see, we start from very blue galaxy at the end of the sequence with the regular and spiral galaxy to more redder. And there's an also, an also another parameter, which is the fact that we have no uh, central concentration of light, so no bulge uh, in the irregulars. The spirals are defined by the fact that you have a growing bulge between the different spiral types. It's even more important for ellipticals, uh, for lenticulars, and for ellipticals, some would say that they could be considered a pure bulge, but I would put big quotation marks uh, before using that kind of language, actually. Uh, so, to investigate such question, uh, I'm using the effigy morphological catalog, which is constituted of uh, more than 4,000 images of nearby galaxies, uh, of multiple images from the SDSS, so I have access to the five uh, optical bands. And uh, the gray thing, which is catalog, is, has been uh, visually examined by a team of astronomers, which provides uh, a lot of uh, additional details. So for each galaxy, we have access, most importantly, to its all type, but also to 16 attributes uh, that will describe in more detail uh, the structure within the galaxy, such as the bulge, the bar, the presence of arms, but also its texture through the presence of dust or flocculants. And each attribute, as I show you here with the example of the bar attribute, is classified on a scale from zero to four. For the example of bar in the zero column, you have no bar, and then you have increasing length of the bar compared to the size of the disk. Uh, this data is also complemented by Galax photometry to obtain uh, better colors. Uh, the first part of my PhD was to perform luminosity profile fitting on all these uh, galaxies. To do so, I used the new software Source Extractor Plus Plus, which was developed uh, for the Euclid mission. And uh, I perform first single Cersic fitting, but most importantly, and what I will show you here, uh, busk bulge and disk decomposition. So using a Cersic profile for the bulge and an exponential profile for the disk. So uh, we talked a lot about the different definition of bulge uh, by using such a method. Uh, by design, for me, a bulge will be uh, the extra uh, light above the exponential profile. And uh, here I show you an example of this uh, multiband fitting with a GRI data image and its model, which shows that we replicate very well uh, the bulge and the disk, uh, their sizes and their colors, while in the residual image remains the structure that we have chosen not to model uh, the spiral arms in this case. But to obtain such model, I had to iterate a lot and apply priors so uh, the priors that I've used in the end are of two kinds. The first one are band-to-band -band Gaussian priors that allows consistency between the parameters across various bands, while the other one uh, were found through uh, an iterative process where I automatically zoom in inside my galaxy image and try to do a first measure of the bulge only. Uh, and then reuse this first measure at the prior in the bulge and disk decomposition. And uh, this is very valuable because as you can see, uh, between without priors and with the addition of these priors, my results are very different. I show you here two examples uh, to show the benefits of the two kinds of priors. On the top line, you see for, that for a barred galaxy, when you do not apply prior, sometimes the Celsius model can fit the bar instead of the bulge while with the priors I fix uh, this issue and I do model the bulge and the disk while the bar remains in the residual. And uh, the bulge to bond to bond Gaussian prior allows uh, to have more consistent color and allow issues uh, such as in the bottom row. So uh, now that we have our model, we can uh, go look at the relation, as I said, between uh, the color bimodality of galaxy and the Hubble sequence. Uh, so we've known from uh, SDSS uh, earlier studies that galaxies show color bimodality uh, with galaxies being pretty predominantly either red or blue, and uh, which has been linked roughly to early and late type galaxy, which is just quite a, a rough picture. And uh, thanks to the, the FEG sample and the visual classification process, 
what I show you is that we can uh, reproduce the column, mass, uh, column magnitude diagram and localize every Hubble type uh, in it. And uh, as you can see, uh, here we have for, for all the sample, and then we have the average uh, color and magnitude per type. And what we see is that the Hubble sequence uh, continuously and monotonously spans this diagram. We start from the irregulars at the very uh, low mag end, and then as you go to brighter and brighter galaxy, you go through the Hubble sequence in the order of the spiral types. Then as you go up, you cross uh, the low density green valley uh, for the SA and S0 types, while the red sequence is formed by both uh, lenticulars and ellipticals at uh, higher masses. We can also look at this plot in terms of color and mass, so it gives you basically a mirrored version, but it allows for further interpretation, because in this, what you can see is that for all spiral types, you seem to obtain a mass limit here at roughly 11.7 uh, in log uh, stolen mass. And uh, this uh, limit also propagates within the red sequence as kind of the demarcation between the lenticular dominated part and the elliptical dominated part. And it's also in broad agreement uh, uh, with uh, Atlas 3D studies that have shown a dichotomy between slow and fast rotators at uh, 11.3 uh, in mass, so it's a close value. Moreover, the existence of these very massive ellipticals is an argument for uh, dry merger having for them, because as you can see in this sequence, there's no more star formation, you have very red galaxy. So to explain that such objects are formed, the only possibility is to have mergers of uh, lower mass red galaxy up until uh, these ones. Uh, we, can, we will now look at this diagram in many details thanks to the visually classified attributes of effigy. And uh, we'll start by the blue cloud. So this region uh, containing the irregulars and most of the spiral types. Uh, first, uh, I'm using here the perturbation attribute, which is a measure of uh, the difference with uh, the uh, symmetry in the isophotes. And we see that uh, in these two images uh, that are examples of very perturbed galaxy, uh, this can be a sign of a recent interaction, whether it's a flyby or a merger. And we have uh, two examples of very blue galaxy uh, with uh, some star forming features, whether it's flocculence along the spiral arms here or more uh, important uh, H2 region on the right. Uh, it's been known that merger can temporarily end in star formation through starburst. And it's in agreement with what we found in effigy because uh, the perturbation uh, attribute is more important on the bottom of the blue cloud. So galaxies uh, with more uh, signs of a recent merger also so enhance star formation. There are other uh, attributes that allow us to measure uh, this kind of uh, local star formation within the disk. Uh, the hotspots attribute measure the presence of large uh, star forming regions. Uh, the flocculence is for more scattered uh, age, uh, star forming region. And uh, the spiral arm strength is also linked uh, to star formation as a lot of stars are, are built along uh, spiral arms. And we see that in, uh, in a general case, uh, the bluer our galaxies, the more important these attributes is. So uh, it correlates well with uh, star formation. Uh, now, if we zoom back out and we look at uh, the wall sequence, if we inspect the disk color, which is now the color map here, uh, so what we can see is that the disk color follows a similar evolution to the Hubble type by spanning uh, the wall color mass diagram with the bluer disk at this end and then a gradual evolution up until the redder disk uh, on the red sequence. And we have uh, a 0 0.02 uh, mag evolution through the Green Valley. So it seems like during the crossing of the Green Valley, uh, this credit uh, significantly. But more importantly, we notice a sim um, similar trend with the Bolsch to total ratio. Uh, we can do it in uh, light ratio, but also in mass ratio. 
So here I show you the result in mass ratio. And uh, we see that uh, very small bulges are at the low mass end of the blue cloud. And there's again this monotonous increase all along the color mass diagram. So uh, as we go uh, towards uh, redder colors, we also go towards a larger uh, bulge to total ratio. And uh, this is significant across the Green Valley. As you can see, if we do cells of colors and mass, uh, we have a more than doubling of the bulge to total ratio when galaxies uh, cross the Green Valley. Uh, looking at other studies, uh, we can relate uh, the growth of the bulge to obtain some uh, constraints on the time scales to cross the Green Valley. It was shown by Sakdeva et al. that uh, such uh, factors of growth in the bulge is obtained for galaxies between redshift and of one to zero, so several giga years of evolution, which seems to rule out uh, scenarios of quick transition through the Green Valley. Uh, this point is important to really understand uh, how the bulge growth will have an impact in the quenching of galaxies, the transition from the star forming sequence to the uh, passive uh, lenticulars and ellipticals. Uh, many studies have already shown that bulge growth uh, play a key role in the prediction of quenching. Uh, for instance, uh, some studies uh, have a argued that the bulge mass is the best parameter to predict the quenching states of galaxy population, while other have advanced that it was the mean velocity dispersion that you can interpret as how much the spheroidal component uh, dominates uh, the disk component. Uh, and finally, uh, Dimoro's study uh, showed that there was a departure from the main sequence for galaxy when they reach a uh, bulge to total ratio of around 0 0.2, which is in uh, sharp agreement with our study. Uh, no, the question is to understand if these morphological transformations are concomitant to the quenching of galaxy or if one precedes the others, to really try to understand if the correlations that we obtained here, uh, how does it translate into a causation in terms of physical uh, processes? So the question is to understand which uh, physical mechanism can grow the bulge and can also induce quenching. So I've written him some uh, kind of proposition. So still based on the study of SACDEVA that I've used to, to, to put time scale constraints on the growth of the bulge, it was shown that secular evolution uh, was a good way to grow the bulge for pseudo bulges within the blue cloud. But for the high BT values obtained uh, through the Green Valley, uh, the addition of minor merger was needed. Uh, the link between the bulge growth and uh, quenching can also be made through uh, the process of morphological quenching, uh, which uh, explains that when the bulge is big enough, it's going to stabilize the disk against uh, gas fragmentation and therefore uh, quench the disk. Uh, other studies have made an indirect link uh, between the bulge growth and the AGN feedback, as there are some correlation between the mass of the bulge and the mass of the central black hole. And for instance, Brownstone uh, explained that the higher uh, energy, in uh, the energy injected by AGN feedback could be responsible for the higher mean velocity dispersion seen. But this doesn't explain uh, the time scales for the morphological transformation. And finally, as many of you are interested in bar, uh, maybe some phenomenon of bar quenching with material going towards the center of the galaxy could be uh, could explain this kind of behavior with both bar quenching and bar induced bulge growth. Uh, but this uh, raises another question uh, because the phenomenon that I've shown are valid for both barred and unbarred galaxy uh, uh, in a similar way. There's another kind of features that we haven't talked about much uh, this week, which are rings, and they are very important uh, within the Green Valley. Uh, indeed, it is shown here that when you look at the fraction of ring as uh, uh, so, yeah, the fraction of ring as a function of the the galaxy of all type as uh, visually classified in FEG, you see that there's a sharp increase and in a maximum values that are obtained within the Green Valley or for galaxy types. Uh, around it, uh, which is in agreement with previous studies based on both observation and simulation. Uh, so it seems that rings could be uh, 
a feature interesting to understand, to understand also the coefficient of the galaxy through the green valley. Uh, note that this is valid for both uh, inner and outer rings. So here I show you example of both inner and uh, outer rings. Uh, but uh, in a study, the interpretation that we made of this uh, higher fraction of the, uh, ring within the Green Valley galaxy is, uh, is a combination of two effects. In order for rings to be long-lived, you need the bulge to be massive enough to stabilize it while the creation of the rings has been shown uh, to be linked to compaction events with gas uh, falling down towards the center of the galaxy. And uh, Green Valley galaxies are at this stage where the bulge is uh, big enough compared to the other kind of spirals, but you still have residual gas compared to the more uh, uh, gas pool lenticular. So uh, both, both uh, conditions are only fulfilled uh, within the Green Valley. Uh, so no, we're going to move from uh, this question of uh, color bimodality to a more in-depth analysis of the bulges and the disks through their scaling relation. And I'll start with uh, the Coromandi relation. It was initially discovered uh, in a 1977 paper by Coromandi, which showed the correlation between uh, the surface brightness and the effective radius of elliptical galaxy. Uh, we remeasure it, so it appears uh, the historical relation appears in green. Uh, for elliptical galaxies modeled as a single Cersic fit, uh, it's uh, purple points that you see. While if you decompose uh, elliptical galaxy as the sum of a bulge and a disk, it gives you the red point uh, there and the black fit. So uh, we always find a relation, but with uh, different uh, slopes, but what's interesting to notice is that if we uh, reuse the relation obtained for elliptical galaxy, uh, the bulges of uh, lenticular or the spiral times seems to be along a similar slope, but they gradually fall off the relation. So you see that S0 are roughly on line uh, with the relation for ellipticals, while SB are clearly below it and SCD are uh, more further away. So you see that uh, when you go to later ultra types, you have a progressive departure from the relation towards uh, both fainter uh, and smaller. Uh, so in this direction is fainter and uh, no, in this direction is smaller and in this direction is uh, fainter bulges. Uh, why is uh, this relation interesting? Because it provides information to the very, very discussed during this week, uh, question of pseudo bulges and classical bulges. Uh, so it has already been said that the two are different uh, in their uh, processes of formation. So classical bulges are uh, kinematically hot uh, objects that were formed by violent uh, events, while pseudo bulges tend to be uh, kinematically cold and formed through secular evolution. Uh, I do not make here the different distinction between more disky and more poxy peanut pseudo bulges, simply because I do not have uh, the information uh, to separate them with just the photometric analysis. Uh, and uh, previous studies have proposed some photometric criterion to distinguish between the two kinds of bulges. Uh, one is based on uh, the value of the Cersic index, while the other, uh, by someone present here, uh, is, to know, is to say that uh, classical bulges tend to follow the common relation for elliptical galaxy, while the pseudo bulges are outliers to it. So if we go back to this common relation here, I plot for all kinds of bulges, and uh, I put at the color map two values. Here it's the bulge to total ratio in the G-band, and here it's the Cersic index of the bulge still in the G-band. And uh, we see that there are bulges that are in the continuity of the relation while others fall off. And clearly the bulge to total ratio dictates uh, the, the place of uh, the data points within this 2D plane. So we can roughly uh, do a separation between classical bulges in this region and pseudo bulges there. Uh, we add the information that pseudo bulges are also, uh, so they're fainter, they're smaller, but they also have a lower Cersic index, even though the correlation is not as clear with the Cersic index than for the bulge to total ratio. But we see also that 
this line doesn't really make sense. I've just drawn it here for a broad ID, but it seems that there's a more uh, continuous uh, evolution sequence here, uh, which could be explained uh, by the idea of composite bulges. So it has been shown in a dynamical study that the bulges can actually be uh, a composition of a dynamically hot and a dynamically cold component, so a classical and a pseudo bulges. And so uh, we can understand this transition as uh, the dynamically hot or dynamically cold component uh, being more dominant uh, within the central region of uh, the galaxy. Uh, and I propose here uh, a magnitude interval for which uh, this transition occurs. This is also seen in the size luminos luminosity relation, which I show for the bulges on the left and for the disk on the right. And you see again that the bulge to total ratio uh, is a great indicator of where your points are going and up to be uh, in the relation. Uh, if you make the assumptions that you have either uh, spheroids or disk components, you can infer through a back of the envelope uh, calculation the slopes that you expect. And uh, it's in agreement with the fact that this slope is closer to what you expect for disk heaps bulges, while this slope is uh, closer to what you expect for uh, spheroidal components. And the second degree curve relation uh, allows to parameterize the evolution for all bulges through the evolution sequence from the latest uh, spiral types to ellipticals. Uh, you also have a curved relation with the disk. Uh, the curve relation is interesting because it allows to understand the evolution uh, in size as well as the variation in surface brightness that happens that are linked to the variation in stellar density. For instance, for the disk, you see that going from the late spirals to the more uh, early spirals, uh, you increase in size, but you most, uh, most importantly, uh, move in terms of surface brightness. So here I put some ISO surface brightness line and you see that uh, you increase there while then the evolution is done at a constant surface brightness but with an increase in size. Uh, now I'll finish with uh, some explanation about the colors back again, but the colors separately for the bulges and, and the disk to better understand how these two components play a part in uh, star formation within galaxy. Uh, so here I show some uh, G minus R color and uh, you see the behavior for the bulge and the disk separately. But what I'm most interested in is the uh, comparison between these two. So you see that for the bulge, you have quite uh, a narrow interval of values with all bulge types having average bulge colors around 0 0.7, 0 0.8. While for the disk, there's a lot more uh, evolution with the late spirals having values close to 0 0.3. While for the lenticulars and ellipticals, you're closer to 0 0.67. So it seems that uh, bulges are uh, redder than uh, the disk. But as you go along the above sequence, this difference uh, gradually disappear and the bulges and disk ends up uh, as red as each other roughly. You can also go one step further and use the fact that my uh, modeling was done in multi-band uh, to look at the variation between the profiles, between the different bands. And this is here what I do uh, using the variation in the effective ra radii of bulges and disk uh, in two different bands, here's the G and the I band. Different bands will probe different uh, stellar population in terms of their uh, age and metallicity. Uh, so if you see variation in the effective ready, it tells you about how are localized these different stellar population uh, and how they spread around the bulges and the disk. And uh, here what we obtain is, uh, is a behavior very different for the lenticulars and elliptical galaxy, which show almost no gradients, whether it's for the bulge and the disk. While for the spiral galaxies, there's a clear uh, gradient. I mean, even this, this more dispersion, the average uh, is clearly a gradient. And uh, this trend means that the bulges are redder outwards, while uh, the disks are bluer outwards. And uh, we can interpret that. So regarding the disk, 
star formation seems to be most intense at uh, the outskirts of this. It could be due to gas accretion from the intergalactic medium star, circumgalactic medium, uh, first starting at the outskirts of this. And uh, it's also uh, in relation with the inside out scenario, uh, but with a thin disk and thick disk. So here in this picture, you see that you have your thin disk, which is made of uh, a large H1 gas reservoir and uh, young stars form from this reservoir, while uh, you have a thicker disk, which is more uh, contracted and which is made of older stars that have migrated inwards. Uh, regarding the bulges, uh, since they are redder, uh, this can be considered as a passive, like not forming star, but we still see gradients that indicate star formation concentrated at their center. So uh, there could be so low level residual formation, which is very centrally concentrated. Uh, it could be due to some structure uh, driving gas inwards to have this uh, formation event. And here I show you an example where you see that when you uh, erase the bulge model, you can still see some uh, variation in colors that seems to indicate matter flowing inwards, uh, notably due to the bar. And uh, finish. <laughs> okay, so I leave, you, I leave you here with my conclusion. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Louis. Um, I have a question about when you were talking about the physical drivers of um, the bulge curve. And I know this is low redshift, but can you say anything about Coulomb coalescence, as Dimitri was discussing before? Is that something you can do with this data? Uh, well, since this is nearby galaxy, it doesn't allow me to, to probe these effects. Uh, I really don't know what else to say. Uh, I know that it was proposed as uh, an explanation for, for uh, higher redshift galaxies, uh, but like this study doesn't really allow you any, I mean, to, do, to do anything related to that, so uh, I can't tell you. Okay, more questions? I'm not. Thank you. Uh, thank you very nice. A lot of a lot of work you've done there. Um, I I wanted to clarify one thing that I didn't understand. So when you show the cirrhotic index of the bulge and the bulge to total, these are based on the models that you fit. Yeah. They, yeah. This is the result of the bulge and this decomposition. Uh, the parameters uh, that I show. Okay. So my my question is, if you fit a bulge as a classical bulge, then you're retrieving let's say a cirrhotic index of a nuclear disk, a disky bulge, how, how reliable can you, can you trust this disky bulge results? Since you were fitting, do you know what I mean? Like how the resid residuals can affect this? Well, the fact that uh, when you do bulge in this decomposition, it's only the excess of light compared to exponential. So if you have a low cirrhotic index for your bulge, it's Basically, if it adds a second uh, disk to the profile, like it adds a second exponential profile, uh, or roughly so, if you have n like between one and two, and uh, but the effective ready is going to be much smaller. Uh, so that's oh, you know, like it's uh, a disky bulge and not just uh, uh, a failed fit. So I didn't have time to show you, but I also uh, have relation between the size of the bulge and the disk. And you see the same kind of continuity when you compare the, the ratio between the bulge and the disk size. Uh, it correlates well with the bulge and total ratio and with the cirrhotic index as well. So uh, it confirms uh, the validity of this bulge. And since it's like 4,000 galaxies, I've also inspected most of them to see what this uh, bulges were like. And it's indeed bulges that are model, I mean, bulges in the visual sense at least. So, um... When you were doing bar galaxies and you were adding a prior to avoid the bulge model to fit the bar, can you elaborate a little bit more on the prior? And, and the other thing is, 
did you check how well you're getting rid of the bar? Because, for example, you could make a test and look at the bulge, the lipticity of the bulges that you find between barred and unbarred galaxies. And if you have a difference there, it could be because the bulge is still trying to fit a little bit of the bar. Uh, it's not completely straightforward to get rid of the bar. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've uh, set up some limits during the iteration process. There are some limits that are imposed on the ellipticity of the bulge. And I also compare the value of the zoom in. So the zoom in is reused as a prior, but there's still some variation possible around this prior. So then I re uh, compute like the, the distance between the difference between the prior value and the end product. And I check that uh, in terms of the aspect, you do not go back to like the edge, to the lower edge, so the more extended uh, bulge value. Uh, but uh, so, it limits as much as possible the, the Bard galaxy. But it's true that I could check directly like the, just the distribution parameter for, for the bulges. But I guess you, cannot, you can never like perfectly erase uh, the bar component. I mean, except if you mask or if you model, if you model it. Uh, so I've tried to model it. It works, but not as well in automatic fashion. I mean, for this number of galaxies, it's hard to do. And also because the point is to model a larger study, uh, which is magnitude limited from which FEG is extracted. And uh, for that sample, I won't have the information of who's bad and who's not. And so I cannot like put a bar model by default, uh, but I'm already trying like on the subsample of all these bad galaxy to do a, a three component model to add the bar. So I will, uh, when I, this will be better, <laughs> uh, I will look at the, like if my B over T distribution, most importantly, uh, how is it affected by the presence of the bar? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we should thank our speaker again. So uh, we have uh, a talk uh, in uh, about half an hour about the anti mechanism. Professor Musa is already here. And so we make a break until we arrange here everything, the technicalities. And uh, well, there are some uh, coffees there and uh, just uh, uh, we convene at uh, 7.30 here. <laughs>